Section one of Among Typhoons and Pirate Craft. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. Among Typhoons and Pirate Craft by Lindsay Anderson. Section one, chapters one through three. Chapter one, first voyage in the Emont in a former work entitled a cruise in an opium clipper i promised the readers thereof that i would fill up the blank of several months that intervened between the time of my engagement as third officer on board the eamont and our arrival at hong kong to refit previous to sailing on our expedition to formosa those who have read the first cruise must hark back with me to shanghai and take up the threads of this narrative from the time of my first appearance on duty as an officer on board the eamont we were lying in the river moored with two anchors almost abreast of the english consulate and close to two of her majesty's corvettes that were stationed here at that time for the protection of british interests before i relate to the reader the admirable manner by which the captain brought our rather peculiar crew into disciplinary order i may as well state that the reason the eamont was in need of a hardy crew at that time was this she was going on a hazardous expedition and it was the middle of winter she had come up the coast from hong kong to shanghai with a mixed crew of malays and manila men and half her crew had caved in and died of the cold the remainder were put on board the receiving ship till a passage down the coast could be found for them therefore a crew of pale faces had to be found or the expedition abandoned money being very abundant men were found such as they were and on the whole we were lucky in picking up a very good crew as soon as four bells had struck in the forenoon watch of this my first day on board the eamont all hands were called aft round the mainmast and the captain delivered a short and very impressive address to the men who had been brought on board from bob allen's now my lads says captain gulliver while you sail with me you will be well fed and well paid what i require in return is obedience to all commands whether from me or my officers if any of you wish to back out now you are on board an armed ship that fights her way go at once for there will be no shilly-shallying afterwards no one replying the captain says you are all agreed to go yes sir came from the lips of all very good my lads says the captain then turning to mr jewel he adds give them a glass of grog all around and turn to and unmoor the ship very good sir replies mr jewel who gives the necessary order to the steward and the main brace is spliced for the first time by this motley crowd of ours as soon as the grogging is finished i go forward with the boatswain and we start the hands on to the capstan to heave the anchor up when the captain takes his departure for the shore mr jewel of course comes forward and takes principal charge of the work of unmooring at eight bells midday we have got one anchor up and the other hove in to a short stay peak then the crew are sent to dinner while we of the afterguard sit down to a well-spread luncheon when the bell strikes two all hands are again on the move boarding nettings are lowered down and stopped along the hammock rail the swinging booms are brought in alongside and all the boats hoisted up in the davits at two p m captain gulliver comes on board accompanied by several chinese gentlemen of note who are seemingly going as passengers with us having brought a goodly supply of luggage along with them the captain having seen his passengers to the saloon returns on deck and immediately the work of getting the eamont under way is proceeded with 
by the time the anchor is tripped the topsail and topgallant sail are set and the yards braced by to canter round then ere the anchor has reached the hawse-pipe the eamont has slewed round with her head down the river all sail is set upon her and the ensign is dipped to the two men of war as a token of farewell as well as good-bye to all friends on shore wind and tide being alike in our favour we made good progress down the river and in less than half an hour we are well away out of sight of h b m consulate or either of the corvettes as soon as the captain is satisfied of the foregoing fact he gives mr nealance a peculiar nod of intelligence mr nealance thereupon calls upon the boatswain to have some of the hatches taken off he then proceeds down into the hold and soon returns on deck followed by a dozen or more of her majesty's blue jackets who have retired from her service and are now entered on board the eamont for any service that may turn up as the days go by the blue jackets find their way forward and are soon as much at home with their new shipmates as if they had sailed with them all their lives the eamont makes rapid headway down the river and by eight p m we are safely anchored off the receiving ship at wu sung the boarding nettings are triced up all around an armed watch is set under one officer then all hands not on watch turn in for the night chapter two drilling the crew we do not keep watch and watch as they do in the navy but make as near an approximation to it as can be done with the number of hands we carry and having regard to the work that has to be done an armed watch consisting of an officer and four men is an indispensable necessity throughout the night for we are in the midst of robbers and pirates of a singularly clever and desperate kind who know that the opium clipper is always a rich prize for if she don't happen to have her cargo of opium on board she is almost sure to have the value of it and more in good mexican dollars however i have seldom found them brave enough to attempt a capture within gunshot of any receiving ship these receiving ships belonging to the different opium companies are all heavily armed and fully manned to meet almost any emergency being simply a kind of floating citadel for the protection of the merchant's interests and a convenient and safe place from which to trade with the surrounding inhabitants two bells in the morning watch and the boatswain's pipe is heard from stem to stern three bells all hands are on deck and the work of cleaning ship is proceeded with hollystones are manned by some swabs and scrubbers by others while the guns are given over to the blue jackets to be put in working order under the orders of the gunner and his mate by the time eight bells are struck the eamont presents a clean and smart appearance the flags are set and all hands save the regular armed watch are piped to breakfast breakfast over and two bells gone the captain comes on deck and desires mr jewel to send all hands aft as soon as all hands are mustered round the mainmast captain gulliver addresses to them a short category of their duties on board as fighting men my lads says the captain as it is possible we may some day be called upon to fight our way it is actually necessary that you must all learn how to handle a rifle and how to shoot with it to-day we will all go on shore targets will be erected each man will get a rifle and ammunition and a dollar will be the prize for every bull's-eye the best shots will also be made captains of the big guns which will be worth five dollars more a month in addition to their pay as able seamen turning aside with mr jewel he completed the general details of how he was to train his marksmen mr jewel nealance and i then distributed arms and ammunition with the accompanying requisite harness for each member of the crew as soon as we were all thoroughly equipped two cutters were put in the water into which we embarked to the number of forty captain gulliver following in his gig in command of the whole party himself mr nealance takes charge of one cutter the other cutter falling to me as mr jewel has to remain on board in charge of the eamont with the remainder of the crew 
starting away from the Emont, we pull right across the river to the north shore where the ground is somewhat level and what is more to our purpose there are no visible signs of any inhabitants a small narrow creek is found in the bank of the river up which we pull some hundred yards then after securing the boats we land and proceed through the brushwood till a convenient place is found for our practice the carpenter and his mate put together our targets which are erected at distances of five hundred seven hundred and nine hundred yards three of the blue jackets who are in no need of training take their stations as near the targets as prudent in order to signal the result of the firing three small flags are given to each signaller one red one white and one blue red denotes that the marksman has hit the center and made a bull's-eye white that he has hit between six inches and a foot of the center and the blue flag tells him that he is very wide of the mark all three flags held up together means that the target has never been touched beginning at the five hundred yards target each man is given two shots in succession the first being simply an experimental shot so that we may see whether they go any way near the line of the target the signallers being warned to keep well to the right and left when the novices are thus given their first shot the second shot goes towards the marking and very few of them actually miss the target while four or five of them cause the red flag to be displayed and so earn a dollar each twenty of the best shots are taken to the seven hundred yard target by the captain where under his own supervision they are given three shots apiece and instructed how to sight the rifle for distance depression of atmosphere and windage those who made the worst show at the five hundred yards remained firing at that distance under the tuition of mr nealance till such time as they could raise the white flag in detailed repetition then they were taken to the greater ranges and put through another course of instruction firing was carried on at these two targets till one p m when arms were piled and half an hour's rest given for light refreshment and of course the ever essential inhalation of the fragrant narcotic weed that jack has been so fond of from time immemorial the half hour soon passes away then we all take up our positions at the nine hundred yards target the wind has freshened a little in the interval and is blowing across the line of fire one shot apiece is all that is given here for the first round and no bull's-eye is made the captain looks rather disappointed and says my lads this will never do i would much rather you win my dollars and let me know that you can draw a bee-line on to the eye of the target you must allow for the freshening wind and a little for the heavier atmosphere see how the clouds are gathering above you and allow a couple of hair breasts more elevation on your sight line taking a rifle from one of the men the captain carefully loads it and marks the sight line for the necessary distance then raises the gun to his shoulder lets fly at the target and up goes the red there my lads says the captain you see it is easily done if you will only have a little judgment and take heed of the wind and weather mr nealance mr anderson says the captain just you two have a shot and let them see what steady hands and strong nerves are capable of very willingly we comply for i think we have been itching to have a shot at any rate i have for having been with the captain all the forenoon as a kind of aide-de-camp i have not had a chance of a shot nealance may have had several at the short range whilst instructing the backward rifleman and possibly has his hand in but as for me i had not had a rifle in my hands for several months i allow mr nealance the precedence of the first shot although he kindly offers me that position he fires and up goes the red and white intimating that he was just on the edge of the ring of the bull's-eye i then raise my rifle to my shoulder and take a deliberate aim at a point halfway between the upper right corner and the centre of the bull's-eye the wind is blowing across the line of fire from right to left and small rain is falling 
I pull the trigger, and up goes the red, which is waved three times in succession, intimating a dead center. The captain and Nealance both compliment me for my excellent shot, the captain remarking that he would not like to stand before me at thirty paces before breakfast of a morning. Two hours steady firing at the longer range, which gradually grows in excellence, is succeeded by two shots apiece at the shorter ranges, then we retire to the boats and proceed on board. The captain gave the result of the day's firing to Mr. Jewell, when we got on board, as very good indeed, and added, if it had not been for the wind freshening, I would have lost a good few more dollars. Some of them ought to be good shots, says Mr. Jewell, for they look to me as if they were well acquainted with shooting irons, and although perhaps they have never served in any regular service, it is possible they may have seen some work with Ward or Burgevine. Rough customers, says the captain, are what we require here. They only want keeping well in hand. Hoist the boats up and send all hands but the watch below for the day. Tomorrow we will have some cutlass and revolver drill. Then, when we get outside, some big gun drill, and then we will be a match for anything twice our size. So says the captain to Mr. Jewell as he retires to his cabin. Chapter 3. We Sail from Wusung and Have Some Big Gun Drill Outside the usual routine of scrubbing and polishing is proceeded with till eight bells the next morning then at two bells in the forenoon watch all hands are mustered on the deck at general quarters and placed in divisions of sixes single sticks with basket hilts are issued to each member of the crew then they are generally instructed in the tactics of attack and defence which in those consisted of seven cuts and seven guards the blue jackets, who had already been trained in the use of the cutlass, were placed in couples at the head of each division to begin the practice and so initiate the others into the best modes of attack and defense. The officer in charge of a division would also enter the fray and give and take some of the sharp knocks that are the invariable result of such exercise. The whole forenoon is employed at single stick exercise. Then, after dinner, two targets are fitted up on the taffrail, and revolver firing is carried on, with very varied success, ten dollars being the whole amount of the winnings, at one dollar for every bull's eye. However, on the whole, there were scarcely any shots went farther from the center than the breadth of a human body, so that it might be fairly supposed that every shot would tell somewhere in an actual fight at four o'clock in the afternoon the small arms are placed in the armory and the ammunition boxes in the magazine the private signal is made to the receiving ship and in a short time a large launch leaves that vessel for the emont with a goodly number of chests of opium the opium is quickly taken on board and stowed in the hold then the hatches are carefully secured and locked the usual armed watch is set for the night and the crew dismissed to their quarters. Dinner is served in the saloon, and afterwards we retire to our various cabins to court old Morpheus, or otherwise prepare for the doings of the morrow, for it is to be our sailing day. We are bound to a port in the Gulf of Pecheli, and we have to run the gauntlet of the many piratical craft that haunt the China Sea between here and our destined port. At daybreak the following morning we unmoor ship and proceed on our voyage to the northward, a portion of the China Sea then but little known to the European navigators. We cross the bar in safety, feeling the way by the lead, Nealance and I performing the duty of leadsmen, till we are out in deep water. The Emont is then run out in the direction of the Saddle Islands, till the village of Wusung is out of sight astern and the islands but dimly visible to the northeastward. The wind is light, and the sea is as smooth as a mill-pond. The Emont is brought to an anchor, and her sails furled. Then two cutters are put in the water and manned. Two large empty barrels are soon modelled into targets, and placed one in each boat. 
the boats pull away from the ship in opposite directions one proceeding right off to port and the other to starboard as soon as they have got away from the eamont a distance of half a mile by the judgment of the captain a signal is made the barrel targets are put in the water and anchored by means of a heavy piece of stone the boats return to the ship and are passed astern out of the line of fire all hands are piped to quarters and crews are selected for each of the broadside guns and the long eighteen pivot gun on the forecastle no regular crew is told off for the big sixty eight pivot gun amidships for when it is necessary to use this big ben the crews of the broadside guns that do not bear on the enemy attacked are drawn off to work it so big ben is left alone till the practice with the broadside guns is concluded we have eight broadside guns four on each side and five men are told off to each gun mr jule takes charge of one side and mr nealance the other the captain of course commanding the whole the pivot gun on the forecastle is my especial charge and as it is rather lengthy and takes some working mostly with hand spikes i am given six men as my gun's crew the guns are cast loose and run in then they are carefully sponged out a blank cartridge is rammed home in each of the guns now to be used and fired off to see that all are in fair working order as soon as the guns are again sponged out captain gulliver gives the order to load with shot and standing in a prominent position on the centre of the deck himself so that he can take note of all that is going on he says now my lads the first that hits the target gets five dollars and two dollars for every time you hit the target afterwards also the crew that works their gun the smartest gets ten dollars and the second best five dollars those of the crew who had won the prizes at rifle shooting were given the first shot at the target in order to test them so that if they were as successful in their practice with the big guns they would remain in charge as captains of their respective guns the guns after being loaded were each sighted to eight hundred yards then in breathless silence each captain of a gun kneels behind the breech and instructs the wedge and handspikemen how to train the gun then as soon as he has got a fair bee-line on the target the trigger is pulled the gun captain springs clear of the recoil and gazes towards the target to see the result of his shot one by one in succession the guns are thus fired the captain watch in hand and glass under arm watching the effects of his gunnery lessons some very fair shooting is the result of the first round as far as straightness but most of the shots hit the water at the other side of the targets very good for a beginning says the captain when the first round is concluded but none of you have made a dollar yet mr jule and you also mr nealance says the captain have your guns sighted to seven hundred yards mr anderson he calls out to me your gun is higher than the rest try a shot at six hundred yards and fire it yourself this time aye aye sir i reply eagerly for i have been itching to have a shot and only that i knew the captain was desirous of testing and training his men i would have fired the first shot mr jule and nealance i hear the captain say try your hands at a shot with number two gun but mind there are no prizes for your shooting as i expect my officers to hit the target every time this last is added with a broad smile are you ready anderson says the captain yes sir i reply fire away then says the captain and make a bull's-eye if you can i take another squint along my gun and after getting it fair upon the target i raise my hand the trigger is pulled and i jump up from my knees in time to see my ball take the water about five yards this side of the target then it ricochets straight over the target the next splash showing that the target was right on the line between the two splashes a capital shot says the captain now you have got the range or nearly so sight your gun for six hundred and fifty and let your gunner have a shot as soon as we have had another round from the main deck 
Mr. Jewell and Mr. Nealance, like myself, both fail in hitting the targets, although, as the captain said, they had fired straight enough, the shot from their guns just hitting the water the first time as far beyond the target as mine was inside of it. The guns are again loaded and sighted to 675 yards, then the captains of the guns are given a chance to earn the prizes. Numbers 1 and 3 on the port side, under the charge of Mr. Jewell, win $5 each, and numbers 1, 2, and 4 on Mr. Nielsen's side win the like amount, while my gun wins a first and second prize at the target. Four rounds have been fired with shot, and the captain evidently deems that a sufficient quantity to be expended at present, for he gives the order to cease firing and secure guns. These guns being secured, the men who work the port broadside are then brought by Mr. Jewell to get the large midship gun to position, and pointed towards the remains of the target, out on the port side. A blank cartridge is fired out of Big Ben, then it is well sponged and carefully loaded. Mr. Jewell then arranges the site for a distance of 670 yards, and as soon as he has trained the gun on to the remains of the target, the hammer-line is pulled, and we see the shot make an enormous splash right in amongst the debris of the target. The starboard broadside men, under Mr. Nealance, immediately seize the gun and swing it round on its pivots, the carriage being provided with rollers, running on a broad brass rim in the deck, towards the starboard side. Sponging and loading are the work of a moment now. The men have got into the way of it. Then Mr. Nealance trains the gun on to the remains of his target, and like, as Mr. Jewell did, he lands his shot right on to what remains of the target, and thus completes its demolishment. The gun is rounded to amidships and again secured. The captain expresses himself highly pleased with our gunnery practice, as he presents the prizes to each gun's crew who have won, and as a solace to the non-winners, all hands are piped to grog, and then dismissed to their quarters. End of Section 1 Section 2 of Among Typhoons and Pirate Craft by Lindsay Anderson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 2, Chapters 4 through 6. Chapter 4 The Passage Through the Saddle Islands. A little before sunset, all hands are called on deck to get the Eamont under way again. While we were at dinner, Captain Gulliver explained to Mr. Jewell, Nealance, and I his intention of running through a passage in the Saddle Islands that night, and so cutting off a goodly portion of our distance to Nishwang, as well as, perhaps, evading the piratical junks that might be lying in wait for us if we took the usual route. There is sure to be some of them on the lookout for us, says the captain, for although the mandarins at Shanghai keep on beheading them as fast as they can catch them, it seems to have no effect. Twenty-eight were beheaded that morning we left Shanghai, and their heads stuck up on the walls at the main entrance gate, close to English town, yet for all that I have no doubt that some of their emissaries in the city have given them information of our intended route, as well as full knowledge of all the cargo and specie we have on board. I wonder, says Mr. Jewell, they don't get some better gunboats than them two old Yankee craft, and make a clean sweep of them. That is exactly what is wanted, says the captain, but then, don't you see, today the imperialists are in possession at Shanghai. In a month or two hence the Taipings may have it. Then these fellows who are the pirates today, by siding with the rebels, will get the protection of the mandarins then in power. How do they get their information? asks Mr. Nealance from the chinese clerks in the various offices replies the captain who are open to do anything that will bring them dollars although they would sell their piratical friends at any time for an extra dollar and i dare say the reason the mandarins are so fond of beheading their prisoners without much trial is for the purpose of stopping their mouths for fear they should get implicated themselves 
dead men tell no tales and the mandarins stick to all the loot they find when a capture is made where were you living anderson when you were in shanghai asked the captain very near the centre of the city with an old chinaman named ah chung whom i had formerly met at ningpo and done him a little service there when the rebels attacked that city i replied did you explore much of the city asked the captain no sir not much i reply i was present at one of their beheading scenes and as some of the parties there looked rather askance at me i thought it safest to keep as near home as possible for though ah cheng had a good deal of influence in a certain quarter he did not know himself how long that influence would exist i have also a suspicion that he used me as a link between the authorities in the european quarter to make his fellow-citizens believe that he was in some wise connected with the different consuls and that if he was spirited away there would be trouble i see says the captain the soldiers at the gate seeing you go towards the consulate had an idea you were doing business for ah cheng by the by adds the captain when we get back to shanghai just remind me anderson about this same ah cheng and you will perhaps be able to introduce me to him that is if i have not already met him it strikes me that i have heard the name mixed up with the japanese treaty we are going about when we come back the conversation came to a close as we finished our dinner then when the stewards had cleared away the table the chart of the locality was placed upon it and the captain described to us the different points and bearings we would have to pass during the night before we could reach the open sea now gentlemen says the captain that's the track i am going to take this time the wind ought to lead us right through and when we are through we know what to do with the emont and the northeast monsoon if we meet any craft to dispute our right of way we are a match for any half dozen of them or more if there is plenty of wind mr jewel you will go and get the emont under way says the captain and mr nealance you and mr anderson will take a gun's crew each and go and load the guns big ben and all then cover them carefully up after you have secured them after you have finished with the gun loading place a fair amount of shot in the sacks especially grape then have all your small arms ready in the chest and secure it somewhere close to the mainmast as i have already related at the opening of this chapter it was close on sunset when the captain gave the order to get under way so that by the time the emont was under all plain sail and speeding away for the channel we were to pass through it was nearly dark as it was the captain's intention to slip through under cover of the darkness if possible he therefore as soon as all our carronades were loaded and the small arms ready and in a handy position gave orders to put out all lights and one watch to go below to their quarters the breeze is moderately fresh the water is smooth and the emont rushes along nine or ten knots an hour making as little noise as if she were sailing on a sea of oil the captain and mr nealance take the watch from eight to twelve both having been through this channel at various periods in the course of their career i had come through it once but in the opposite direction and it seems to me a very plucky resolve on our captain to tackle this passage by night when i came through it was in a vessel twelve times the weight of the emont and i imagine it was our great size that kept the many very suspicious-looking craft we met from attacking us having every confidence in captain gulliver that he would bring us meritoriously out of any danger by which we might be assailed i made no mention of having witnessed anything at all suspicious when coming through the channel nor had i any wish to throw any suggestion in the way that would tend to retard what might possibly turn out a very excitable adventure should any of these pilongs dare to attack us i was young and anything in the shape of adventurous excitement was like the breath of life to me 
and during my eventful career i had often observed that the person who was in the habit of throwing cold water on any enterprise by gloomy forebodings of what might happen was generally disliked and very much avoided by the honourable chivalrous and daring of his messmates besides the commander of the eamont mr jewel and mr nealance had inspired me with the highest confidence in their intrepidity daring and skilfulness therefore when the bell struck eight i retired below to the cabin and turned in to court old morpheus as i have often done before with the calm sereneness of a mind at perfect peace chapter five attacked by pirates afloat and ashore crash 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 i am suddenly aroused out of my calm repose by the noise of artillery firing and the crash of woodwork on the deck of the eamont to rush on deck harnessed for whatever fray might occur is only the work of a moment and as i reach the deck i hear the captain's stentorian voice calling out various orders in rapid succession put your helm up quartermaster and keep her right off before the wind is the first order i hear then as he spies mr jewel and me coming out of the companion he says now then mr jewel look alive and get all hands to quarters mr anderson look sharp with that long gun of yours on the forecastle and as soon as you make out where they are firing from pitch into them steady your helm my man says the captain now steady so all hands are soon on deck the guns are cast loose and we await with breathless impatience our enemy's next fire to reveal his whereabouts we are not left long in suspense three or four bright flashes appear simultaneously from a ridge halfway up on the face of this portion of the island and almost right astern of us as we are now heading our guns are useless at present and lucky for us the shot from our concealed antagonist this time falls short and drops into the water a few yards astern of the eamont hand the mainsail and gaff topsail mr nealance says the captain mr jewel get ready the big gun and we will give them a taste of it outside their range as soon as the mainsail is down and secured the eamont is wore round and headed back in the direction she has come with just the slightest inclination to draw in towards the land from whence the firing has proceeded while these necessary evolutions are being executed the captain mr jewel and i have been carefully endeavouring to determine the exact position of this battery as well as its surroundings the enemy keeps blazing away at the rate of one discharge for every ten minutes and as he lights up the scene with his now harmless flashes we are able to make out more the environments of our opponents there are three or four junks lying under this fort evidently waiting for the eamont's disablement by the loss of her spars before they come to effect her capture steady she goes now quartermaster says the captain when he has made up his mind what he intends doing for it won't do to run away without showing them the weight of our metal clew up the topsail and topgallant sail and haul the four bow lines to forward says the captain and we will keep right here till we silence that mud fort and give those junks a peppering now mr jewel you keep your glass steady on the shore and watch every movement of these junks while i go with nealance and anderson and direct the firing from our two pivot guns after thus instructing mr jewel the captain proceeds forward with nealance and i to begin operations big ben is trained right on to the battery on the hill the aim of the captain who trains the gun himself being greatly assisted by a kind of martello tower right in the rear of the fort the water is smooth as a mill-pond so that when captain gulliver gives the word fire a shot is landed in the fort or close to for we are replied to by an irregular discharge from the battery seemingly fired under circumstances of great excitement now mr nealance says the captain i think we have got a very good range so keep them awake by a shot every quarter of an hour till the moon gets up which will be in an hour then we will see better what to do 
having thus arranged for the practice of our largest piece of ordnance the captain comes forward to my gun on the forecastle after looking intently towards the shore with his night glasses he takes up his position in rear of the gun and trains it with the help of his glasses right on to the junks lying close in shore under the battery as soon as he has got it right on he gives the word fire and away speeds an eighteen-pounder to waken up those who are on board the junks and who are as we suppose waiting to pounce upon us as soon as the battery has disabled us no response comes from the junks in reply to our shot so i am instructed by the captain to favour the junks with a shot about every quarter of an hour for the space of an hour we continue this somewhat desultory style of warfare but when the moon makes its appearance over the island and we are better able to make out what we have to deal with the captain changes his tactics and adopts a stronger line of argument in order to give these marauders a taste of our power cease firing says the captain put her under all sail again mr jewel aye aye sir replies mr jewel and in less time almost than i write it the eamont is gliding along under all sail on a course that will take her almost within pistol shot of the junks man your port broadside guns mr jewel withdraw your shot and load with grape and pitch right into those junks when i call out fire nealance keeps on the captain as he rapidly issues his orders you load also with grape and canister and pass the word along for anderson to do the same forward we will all fire at the one signal right into the junks then we will go about and do the same on the other tack every one works with a will and we are ready in a twinkling the battery keeps on firing but as we are slipping through the water at a goodly rate they cannot get a range for us and we see their shot splashing in the water astern our captain standing close to the man at the wheel cons the eamont till he brings us within two hundred yards then i hear him calling out ready there all ready each of us reply as we keep our guns trained on the junks fire and as the word leaves the captain's mouth our guns belch forth their arguments and we are greeted from the junks with yells and roars accompanied by a futile discharge of their guns that is a sufficient answer to us that our shot has landed in the right place hard a lee shouts the captain so that i can hear him forward and slack up the head sheets topsail haul is the next order and the eamont is now round with her starboard broadside ready for the junks stand by your guns again shouts captain gulliver and let them have all you have got ready all again calls out the captain ready sir comes from each gun and as we again glide by the junks when the captain gives the word fire we pour in another broadside of grape and canister which is returned in a very lame and ineffective manner by those on board the junks helm up again quartermaster says the captain ease off the main sheet a bit and let her run off clear of their shot from the battery steady so now my man there that'll do let her go like that till i have another look at them then as he finishes his orders to the man at the wheel he brings his glass to bear upon the enemy the junks make no attempt to get under way and come after us but the battery on the hill keeps on firing although their shot fall very short of the eamont mr jewel calls out the captain lay the topsail to the mast and bring her to for a bit then pipe the hands to grog and come down below and bring nealance and anderson with you chapter six we destroy the pirate junks walking aft with nealance when informed by mr jewel of the captain's invitation i asked him how they had got into the engagement oh very simply says mr nealance the captain and i were walking the weather side of the quarter-deck the captain's cigar went out and he called for a light instead of a match 
one of the men misunderstanding him brought one of these big lanterns aft which no doubt let those fellows on shore know that we were coming for in less than ten minutes bang went their guns smashing in a lot of the starboard bulwarks and that was our first intimation for it was pretty dark then the rest you know yourself that is up till now for i don't think captain gulliver will leave them yet entering the cabin the captain says to us now then gentlemen help yourselves and while we are refreshing i will tell you what i mean to do there are three junks there and i think we can silence them effectively begins the captain then as soon as we have hunted the fellows out of them we will board them rummage them and then set fire to them they began the fight and so must take the consequences at any rate it will be a bit of a lesson to them to take care whom they attack in the future and besides had it been an unarmed merchantman coming along as soon as they had made sure of that these junks would have been off thrown their stink pots on board and by this time the crew would have been murdered and the vessel pillaged you are all agreed with me of course continues the captain yes sir we reply immediately very good says the captain now i will tell you how we will do it we will wear round again and sail towards them with our port broadside as before but instead of tacking we will heave to and keep on peppering at them till they are silenced then we will board them and set fire to them i don't think them old carronades on the hill fort can touch us for the shot went far astern of us when we fired our first broadside into the junks immediately the captain had finished his explanation we all proceeded on deck and took up our separate stations in readiness put your helm up says the captain to the quartermaster stand by your main sheet here mr nealance calls out the captain as the eamont pays off before the wind and brings the wind round on the other quarter brace round the headyards mr jule is the next order then comes the final order in this evolution haul aft your head sheets mr anderson now then my lads shouts the captain be handy with your guns we are going to take these junks and what you find on board of them will be divided amongst all of course as we were not the aggressors and having the power to punish these highway robbers upon the sea i myself saw no harm or illegality in our taking summary vengeance on these miscreants it was well known in those days that many of the missing craft in these seas were done to death by these marauders when they could get the chance and it was also known that there was no real government along the coast who could bring these pirates to justice or give any redress to the sufferers that escaped to tell the tale who were few and far between those piratical scourges believing firmly in the maxim that dead men tell no tales as we again approach the whereabouts of the junks the captain sings out ready all there fore and aft aye aye sir is the enthusiastic reply from every gun then just as we get abreast of the junks the captain calls out fire off goes the guns carrying enough grape and canister as would sweep the decks of a line of battleship there is no response from the junks this time not the faintest murmur but the guns on the shore endeavour to get at us by bringing them more round the hill towards us hard a lee shouts the captain and the eamont is again brought round on the starboard tack but this time her topsail is left aback and her fore bow lined to windward two boats are instantly put in the water and manned nealance taking charge of one boat and i of the other we pull rapidly away in the direction of the junks and are soon on board of them we find them entirely deserted therefore after taking out of them everything of value including their golden josses and sanctuary as well as arms and ammunition we set them on fire in various places to ensure their total destruction then we return on board the eamont the boats are hoisted in the topsail is filled open and we stand away again on our original course after a parting shot at the fort the destruction of which although very desirable the captain does not consider within the range of his duties the engagement has lasted about five hours and we have no casualties 
so after the guns are again secured and the decks are cleared the hands are piped to grog and the regular watch is set before daylight we are away out on the open ocean with the saddle islands nearly out of sight astern the Eamont is surging along like a mad thing, close hauled on a bowline, with every rag spread upon her, going along eleven and twelve knots across the northeast monsoon. The guns are all well covered up as they had need to be, for the Eamont leaves no dry spot about her when she is thus driven through the water. We have a dead beat before us, and it is only by carrying on that we can make decent headway towards our destination like the ranter pikes that used to ply between liverpool and glasgow before the days of steamers there was no taking in sail here so long as she would stand up to it you might be seen at sea with a broken spar but you would not need to be seen at any time under shortened sail with us then it was simply a question that is as far as comfort was concerned of going under water when we left the saddle islands and of emerging therefrom when we got into the northern part of the gulf of Pecheli. fourteen days are thus expended in battling against the northeast monsoon when we arrive at the port of nichuang and are again able to live somewhat like a human being and less like a fish we have no receiving ship here so have to be one's own protector as soon as we have run in and anchored the guns are carefully sponged and reloaded while the small arms are placed in readiness for any attack or any emergency that may arise the boarding nettings are triced up the regular armed watch is set and no person is allowed on board who cannot satisfy the shroff of his honourable intentions this port has scarcely come within the halo of western civilization yet and the junks belonging to the merchants here are quite capable of doing a little pirating on their own account and possibly if need be on that of their owners as well one vessel we find in the harbour pleases us very much for she will tend to keep things quiet as long as she is stationed there this vessel is the english gun brig acorn a style of vessel long out of date and i believe she was of that class that captain marriott styles in one of his most interesting books as bathing machines we gracefully dip our ensign as we pass under the stern of the acorn to take up our anchorage which is about half a mile inside of the brig and nearer the town it is near sunset when we anchor and too late for visitors so we spend a very pleasant and enjoyable evening amongst ourselves after we have got the salt water partially rubbed and washed off end of section two section three of among typhoons and pirate craft by lindsay anderson this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 3, Chapters 7 through 9. Chapter 7, Ni Shuang and its Opium Restaurants. By eight o'clock the next morning, the Eamont is once more in her usual harbor rig. The yards are squared by the lifts and braces to a hair's breadth. The booms are swung out so that any boats that call may lay off clear of our newly painted sides, for she has been painted round outside this morning, and looks altogether like a vessel just come out of the builder's hands, instead of having been ploughing her way up the coast the most of the time well under water. After breakfast we receive a visit from the commander of the acorn who sends his gig back to his brig and then accompanies our captain on shore in one of our boats the chinese shroffs likewise accompany the captain on shore to transact the necessary business attached to the selling of the opium as well as to examine any bills or quantities of specie that may be offered in exchange for this valuable commodity these shroffs of whom we carry four are considered specialists in this kind of business and know all the chops of the established traders they know what paper is of real value and detect a spurious mexican dollar at its first sound 
our forenoon on board is given up to overhauling the rigging aloft and repairing any small damage that may have been caused on our passage up the afternoon is spent in single stick and cutlass drill till four o'clock when all hands are dismissed to their quarters captain gulliver returns on board about five o'clock bringing with him the commander first lieutenant and doctor of the acorn who were extremely well pleased with the neatness and order of the eamont and probably still better pleased with the sumptuous dinner we all shortly sat down to and partook of while we laid in nishuang our dinner-table was well attended either by some of the few gentlemen that dared to live in the city or else some of the officers of the acorn and sometimes both parties combined which would necessitate the taking down of the bulkhead that divided the forward cabin from the captain's more private after cabin there was plenty of the good things of this life on board the eamont and it was dispensed by no niggardly hand which is a matter of great importance where sociable conviviality is desired nealance and i dined twice on board the acorn as a return compliment and we fared very well considering for she had been in commission for over three years captain gulliver and mr jule were likewise entertained on board the brig when her commander gave one of his special spreads to inculcate feelings of good fellowship with the authorities of the place we were of course invited on shore to visit the establishments of some of our city visitors mr jule not being much of a shore visiting man but rather inclined to always stay on board it fell to the lot of mr nealance and i to pay the complimentary return visit to the shore we have been in harbour eight or nine days our cargo is all delivered and we only await its return value in specie and whatever dispatches will be ready against our departure having received permission from captain gulliver to pay a visit to the shore nealance and i in company of two officers from the acorn gun brig accordingly take our departure immediately after breakfast and we are safely landed on the beach by one of our own boats which returns to the ship we are met on landing by our compadre who acts the part of pilot for us in our march through the city we are of course taken to the compadre's house first where we are refreshed with liquor and cigars then after a short stay there we proceed to the establishment of one of our friends and partake of a rather elaborate breakfast to which have been invited several of our acquaintances to meet us we spend a pleasant hour here then as business calls our host and his fellow residents away for an hour or two we in company of the comprador proceed on a voyage of exploration throughout the city first we visit one of their gambling establishments and come away thoroughly disgusted with the awfully hideous avariciousness that is displayed on the countenances of this villainous assembly we visit a chinese theatre and are much amused at the very grave grotesqueness of the acting as well as at the decorous seriousness of the audience we then visit what he called a higher-class opium den where the gambling was not seen in such vulgar forms as was seen in the place we visited earlier in the day opium smoking was carried on in it although we had not noticed it as all the villainous looking assembly looked at the time we were there so deeply intent on robbing their neighbours that it would not have been possible for them to have partaken of their favourite solace at that time our comprador has the open sesame into this other more palatial opium club we follow our conductor through a courtyard then up a few steps and then enter a rather spacious hall round the sides of this hall are ranged many divan couches made of strong wicker work at the head of each couch is a chinese pillow and in close proximity thereto is the inevitable spirit lamp the lamps are nearly all alight as we enter and the couches occupied by persons either in the act of inhaling this most alluring narcotic 
or having inhaled it to the full are now lying senseless enjoying those elysian dreams so very much raved of as being engendered on the mind and brain of the opium smoker some of the loungers are young and still ruddy with the hue of lusty health but the elder ones what a spectacle of poor humanity they represent their whole bodies shrivelled up like boiled parchment after it has dried a more miserable and degraded-looking spectacle could scarcely be imagined and yet those poor miserable wretches deem their horrible infatuation the very acme of enjoyment we do not stay long in this elysium but soon return to the street glad indeed to get out and breathe the purer air of the city which though not of the purest and cleanest for the city is rather neglected in its sanitary arrangements still it is better than the fumes that regaled our senses while within the walls of the opium smokers hostelry we call on a few more of our acquaintances then after another visit to our worthy comprador's place of business we return to the beach where a boat is in waiting to take us on board and i think we are all rather glad to be back on board the eamont again the officers of the acorn who have been on shore with us are invited by captain gulliver to stay to dinner an invitation they are very pleased to accept we spend a pleasant hour or two then nealance and i see our visitors on board their ship and after returning the boat is hoisted up the booms swung in the boarding netting secured all round the armed sentries posted round the decks then after our captain has said good night we also dive below to dream of opium smokers and chinese theatricals chapter eight we leave nishuang and are attacked by pirates outside all our opium having by this time been landed and successfully disposed of we are only waiting for its value in specie to come on board before we again weigh anchor and return down the coast we are likewise to have the honour of conveying two japanese of exalted rank as far as shanghai who have been to pekin on diplomatic business no doubt in connection with the opening up of their country to the benign influences of open trading with the outside world while we lay waiting for our passengers and specie we do not pass the time uselessly away for each day as soon as the regular clearings is got through all hands are exercised at big guns and small arms and before we sailed from this port our practice was not far short of that on board a regular man-of-war during the forenoon of the third day subsequent to our visiting the shore our specie and passengers arrive alongside the ambassadors are received with all due solemnity and conducted by captain gulliver to the state-room set apart for their accommodation the specie which consists of numerous cases containing mexican dollars and bars of silver is carefully taken on board and stowed away in the treasure room which is carefully barred and locked the keys being delivered one to the captain one to the chief officer and one to the principal schroff or comprador serving on board the value of the specie we have taken on board is somewhere about one million dollars so that the eamont would now be a very good prize to any of the buccaneering lorcas as soon as the specie is thus safely disposed of the blue peter is hoisted at the fore and in reply to that well-known signal the mails and dispatches are promptly brought on board the captain not considering it safe to lie here any longer with such an amount of valuables on board gives the order to mr jewell to heave short as soon as the last packet of letters is received on board while mr jewell and i attend to the heaving up of the anchor mr nealance is busy with another portion of the crew setting all necessary sail and by the time the anchor is at the house-pipe the eamont is gliding away out of the harbour in her usual stately shipshape style passing close to h m brig acorn 
we gracefully salute the flag and with many a wave of our caps we bid good-bye to our pleasant acquaintances who cordially return our greetings the wind is from the northeastward and moderately fresh so the town and the brig are soon out of sight astern we have the wind a couple of points on the port quarter steering out somewhat to the eastward to keep clear of the south shore of the gulf as well as to be out of the way of any piratical lorchas who rarely come out into the open it is getting towards sunset when we lose sight of the acorn and the other vessels in the harbour i have been busy securing the anchors and stowing the cables and have not had much time to look around me since we passed the acorn so that i am rather surprised when i hear the captain shouting in no uncertain sound stations there fore and aft haul in your starboard braces mr jewel and let your yards go forward to sharp up calls out the captain haul in your main sheet nealance and flatten in your head sheets anderson says the captain all in the same breath these orders are executed in as little time as i take to record them the eamont is brought to the wind on the port tack and soon flying through the water like a wild stag before the hounds as soon as i have trimmed the head sheets i take the opportunity of glancing around the watery domain just about two miles dead to leeward of us are three heavy-looking lorchas and all three are heading in the same direction as ourselves uncover the guns and cast off all the extra sea lashings is the next order i hear from the quarter-deck and in a trice i have got the long eighteen to bear on the headmost lorca when i hear my name called out with the intimation to proceed aft when i arrive at the quarter-deck i find the captain mr jewel and nealance in consultation on the present state of affairs the captain although rather annoyed at being thus stopped when he expected to make a fast run down is not at all dismayed but calmly discusses the position with us and explains by what means he intends to circumvent the lorchas and so get out of their clutches the guns are all ready for instant use suggests the captain yes sir replies mr jewel the broadside guns with grape and the pivot guns with round shot very good says captain gulliver now as we must do at once what we are to do just pipe the hands to grog for they will get no supper till we are out of this and then prepare for action as soon as all hands have been refreshed they are armed for the coming fray and stationed at their positions for either fighting or working ship as the case might be hard a lee shouts the captain and in a moment the eamont is all in the wind topsail hall again shouts the captain and ere the sound of his voice has died away the eamont is racing away in the opposite direction like some wild thing fleeing for very life the three lorchas follow our example and go about on the other tack also they take a much longer time to execute this manoeuvre than we have done therefore by the time they have got round we are nearly a mile ahead of the foremost one as they now lie keep her off four points quartermaster says captain gulliver and faster away flies the eamont ready with your big gun mr jewel and try and knock a spar or two away shouts the captain now anderson shouts the captain from the quarter-deck try that long gun of yours on that headmost lorca and bring down some of his top hampers both guns are fired as soon as we have got within a possible range but although we have evidently caused some consternation on board we have failed in touching his top hampers the lorca lets drive his whole broadside at us but all his missiles be they stones or shot fail to reach within one hundred yards of us very few of these craft have any very far-reaching ordnance they depend most on getting to close quarters and after suffocating you with their stink-pots dispatching you to worlds unknown while you are insensible from the effects of that noxious compound of which these engines of war are composed are you ready with your guns asked the captain all is ready is our reply fire then and bring something down shouts the captain 
both guns are fired almost simultaneously this time but with little more success as far as we can make out for it is just getting dark and there is no moon ready about shouts the captain when we have finished reloading the guns hard a lee comes the next order from the captain and the eamont is once more whirled round with her head in the opposite direction the lorchas follow suit in putting their heads the other way and go careering away to the eastward luff all you can says the captain to our helmsman and deaden her way a bit the lorca which is now sternmost in their line seems to us to be behaving in a somewhat erratic manner to that of her consorts and as if there was something the matter with her steering gear as soon as captain gulliver observes this lagging movement in the lorca we had been firing at he changes his tactics and instead of endeavouring to outsail them on a long stretch to the eastward as he had intended now that the night was setting in he gives the order ready about hard a lee shouts the captain and round comes the eamont quickly obedient to her helm topsail haul is the next order from the captain then as soon as she has filled away upon the starboard tack he orders her to be kept four points off the wind and every rag to be made to draw its very best twice we have tacked the eamont in the last quarter of an hour and so we have not had much time to look round us to see what our antagonists are up to when i do get a squint at them with my night-glass i can make out that the two farthest off are in stays and coming round on the same tack as we are on but they are a mile or two to the eastward the lorca we had been firing at is seemingly disabled one of her sails being down and she looks as if she were hove to keep her off a couple of points more i hear our captain say then he adds ease off the main sheet a bit and square in your headyards as soon as these orders are executed he shouts out in his loudest tone ready with your port broadside and both pivot guns and fire right into that lorca as we pass her steady your helm says the captain to the man at the wheel when he has got the disabled lorca about three points on our port bow and we are tearing up towards her at a tremendous pace when we get to within one hundred yards of our antagonist and right abreast of him we let drive the whole of our battery right into him and as we speed away on our course into the darkness of the night we hear the discharge of their guns mingled with shouts of wildest rage come floating on the wind to leeward we having left to them our would-be captors the weather gauge in the contest should they care to try any further result with us the two lorcas that were farthest off get no nearer the eamont than half a mile when we have them on our port quarter as soon as it is well apparent that we can outsail them the main boom is jibbed and the eamont set upon her course for the saddle islands guns are again carefully secured and covered up the watch is set and all hands go below to enjoy their well-earned dinner and supper as soon as the engagement was over our two japanese who had stayed on deck all the time walked up to captain gulliver and in their rather amusing way paid him their highest compliments for the successful manner in which he had carried the eamont through the blockading lorchas chapter nine scudding across the front of a typhoon the principal topic at dinner that night was of course the exciting engagement we had come through and the temerity of the lorchas in daring to attack us almost within gunshot sound of the harbour how do they get to know that we are so much worth trying for and so long before it is shipped as they must have done i asked the captain well to us europeans all chinamen are so very much alike you never know much difference in them and so the agents of these lorca men get into offices and warehouses as well as on board of ships and find out all that is going on replies the captain i came across a vessel that was pirated between hong kong and swato says the captain and was just in time to save the crew who had taken refuge up aloft the pirates cleared out when we bore down upon them or else they would have killed the whole crew after they had taken out of the ship 
all that was of value now in this ship there happened to have been put on board at hong kong several cases of arms these cases of arms were stowed away in a separate portion of the vessel's hold and afterwards covered up with other cargo when the pirate lorca got alongside and chased the crew overboard and into the rigging they the pirate crew took off the particular hatches that led towards these cases of arms and then went to work and cleared out the cargo that lay between them and the cases of arms as if they had been present at the stowing of them there in hong kong which no doubt some of them were then there are the lightermen and sampan men explains the captain who bring the cargo off to the ship they are always open to making a dollar or two by giving information to the agents of these piratical chiefs and if the truth were known there is no doubt that many of our compradors are in league with these lorca people i suppose there will be some of them looking out for us as we get towards the islands again says mr nealance you may be sure of that says the captain and they will be wanting their revenge for that mauling we gave them on the way up by the by adds the captain i have just been thinking when i shaped the course whether or not to go back the same route for it is possible they may look for us more to the eastward what do you think gentlemen asks the captain it is the shortest out says mr jewel and as we are a good match for half a dozen of them i don't see why we should take a long sweep round to get out of their way i think that is our best plan too replies mr nealance for the lorca men are sure to look out for us almost anywhere else than where we have had trouble with them already at any rate i have never been attacked by them twice in the same place they seem to be eternally moving their rendezvous so that it would be rather difficult for any cruiser to find out their whereabouts i expect they are welcome anywhere says the captain between hainan and the korea and are well known to the inhabitants of every creek along the coast the fact of the matter is every junk or lorca that is built is fitted out so that she can fight her way against the pirates then when they meet with a junk or lorca of inferior size and worth capturing the trading junk does a little pirating on its own account the weakest as usual goes to the wall and the strongest and fittest survive to carry on the work very well then gentlemen says the captain as we rise from the table if the weather holds steady we will carry her through that same passage but watch the weather for the glass is on the droop i proceeded on deck and took charge of the eamont from the boatswain the captain and my fellow officers retiring to their cabin when i reached the deck i find the wind has freshened somewhat and the eamont has nearly as much wind as she can carry her enormous fore and aft mainsail to the wind is well aft and her steering has to be carefully attended for i have been informed that one of these vessels when running down the coast in a strong gale with the wind right aft jibbed her main boom the consequence of which was that she capsized and drowned all her crew as well as taking with her to the bottom of the china sea the very respectable sum of one million and a half of mexican dollars as the night advances the wind keeps on increasing and it is only by the utmost care on the steersman's part that we are kept from jibbing and so following the example of the ill-fated mazappa at midnight when i am relieved by mr nealance i call the captain and inform him of the state of the weather as well as the falling of the barometer he is not long before he is on deck and before i can get to sleep i have the satisfaction of hearing the watch lowering away and securing our enormous mainsail the wind increased rapidly as the morning advanced and ere the sun arose from out of his watery bed we were scudding along under a close reefed topsail and forced a sail at the rate of sixteen to eighteen knots per hour the wind was coming in heavy gusts and there was no doubt we were running on the inner or western side of a typhoon 
the wind was varying between north by west and north by east as far as we could make it out and although the eamont was making good weather of it as she flew along the foam-covered water rather than sailed through it it was an amazing spectacle to behold the elements roused up in all their mighty rage when i came on deck that morning at seven bells howling and shrieking as if all the wind channels of the heavens were opened and bent on our destruction this devastating wind tore through the masts and cordage with a noise no pen can describe that would at all bring to the mind of the reader the faintest idea of the noise that prevailed on and around the eamont we manage to get our breakfast after a fashion then the captain and i take charge of the eamont to guide her along in her race over the foam-crested waves it is about four bells in the forenoon watch when we hear a yell from the man on the lookout who is rushing aft to the quarter-deck the better to make us hear what he is yelling for land ahead he roars into the captain's ear when he gets close up to where we are standing on the quarter-deck land impossible says the captain bring her out southeast anderson till we see what it is ay ay sir i reply as i proceed to assist the man at the wheel as the eamont comes up to her new course the noise increases to an appalling extent so much so that all hands are soon on deck to see what means this altered state of affairs as she comes up to southeast the topsail gives one shake and flies away to parts unknown in the upper air the captain having instructed me previously not to touch a brace the topsail having taken itself entirely off by the close reef band gives us no further trouble the captain mr jewel and nealance are gazing intently towards the object on the starboard bow which called for the man on the lookout's exclamation land ahead that's no land says the captain it is a dismantled ship and look there did you see that flash they are firing for help put your helm up anderson and keep her down towards her there now steady so says the captain let her go right close round her stern now then mr jewel nealance rapidly shouted the captain get all your life buoys with lines and heave them over on the starboard side when we round two under her lee quarter that is the only chance left them for no boat could live a moment in this hurricane his orders are quickly and willingly obeyed and right along our starboard side twenty or more eager hands are standing ready to heave their life buoys out on the foaming deep in the hope of rescuing some of these seafarers in their dire distress we are flying through the water at a tremendous pace and in less than a quarter of an hour from the time we first sighted the distressed vessel we pass within twelve feet of her taffrail and beckon and shout upon them to jump as loud as we can roar then each man throws his life-buoy into the sea and the eamont is brought to under a couple of hammocks in the fore-rigging right under the lee of the dismasted and apparently water-logged vessel end of section three section four of among typhoons and pirate craft by lindsay anderson this librivox recording is in the public domain section four chapters ten through twelve chapter ten we witness a grand and noble deed of heroism we can make out but four people at the most on the quarter-deck of this disabled vessel and they seem to be parleying about what they are to do all at once in a moment through the blinding spray we see one of the parties on the ill-fated ship take a leap into the foamy abyss and strike out in our direction the eamont drifts but slowly having a very deep keel and a much deeper after keel therefore the swimmer makes headway towards us surely but slowly we are ready with our life buoys and lines while i see nealance and two or three of our hands securing lines around their waists should it be necessary to go over into the water to assist this courageous swimmer when he gets within reach of human help 
i am stationed at the wheel therefore i can only look on however much i may wish to be with nealance in the work of rescue will he be able to reach us is the breathless question in many a heart he must be a powerful swimmer says our captain to get along through that raging water he's got something on his back i hear the captain say as he walks along to where nealance and mr jewel are standing nearer and nearer comes this daring swimmer till he is within reach of one of our floating life buoys which he clutches with a firm grasp while at the same time he casts an appealing look towards the eager hands who are gently drawing in the line that brings him safely towards the Emont. before he touches the side nealance and one of our men are over the side with lines in their hands and round their waists in a moment the brave fellow has a rope passed round him and is carefully hoisted to the deck by many willing hands the carefully wrapped bundle upon his back is taken off as he himself lies in a somewhat faint condition on the deck the bundle being opened what is our astonishment when we gaze upon the form and lineaments of a young and lively girl of some two or three years of age both are quickly carried below to the cabin where means of resuscitation are quickly applied by our captain which soon have the eagerly desired for result as soon as the intense excitement of the last few moments is over i return to my post at the wheel and am awfully astonished when as i cast my gaze to windward to see how it fared with the disabled ship to find that no trace of her is to be seen i immediately proceed below and acquaint the captain with the fact that the vessel has gone from our sight leaving his patience in the hands of mr jule and nealance he follows me on to the deck when after an intense and earnest look in the direction the disabled vessel had been he turns to me and says it is all up with her haul in all those life boys and lines and keep her off again south one half west as soon as the rescued man comes to his senses we will get to know all about it the captain then proceeded below leaving me to carry out his instructions the forestay sail was hoisted up and obedient to the pressure thus brought to bear on her forward the Emont fell off on her course and was soon racing away like a wild stag before the pursuing hounds half an hour had scarcely gone by since we first sighted the disabled vessel yet in that short space of time we had been witnesses of one of the most heroic deeds on record a deed remembered by many who lived or sailed in these far-off eastern lands and often spoken of by those who upheld the grand nobility of man irrespective of creed race or colour to watch that noble hero plunge from the derelict into the seething foaming and bottomless abyss was a sight to be remembered for ever some talented artist should have been there to place upon his canvas such a deed of heroic daring as we had just been witnesses of that it might have been handed down to future generations to immortalize the now possibly forgotten hero who swam through that seething mass of water to save his master's child in the midst of such a tempest as we watched him make his way towards us now on the top of the crested wave then down in the hollow and hidden for the moment from our gaze it was a picture itself to watch the eager faces of our hardened crew as in breathless silence they watched the swimmer and no doubt for this once in their lives they offered up an inward prayer to the all-seeing one above to help this brave man in his peril when the rescued man had been safely landed on the deck the intense strain of the past few moments fell off from our crew who now relieved themselves by shaking one another by the hands as if they had been personally engaged in that fight with the furious watery elements and remarking to each other by george he is a splendid fellow good luck to him for ever says another one while here and there some others who had felt so sympathetically intense in their wistfulness for the swimmer's safety had perforce to turn their heads while they gulped down the risen lump in their throats 
so affected were they in this sudden transition from almost the extremity of despair to the exuberance of thankful joyfulness the sun had crossed the meridian before there was any sensible lull in the howling of the tempest or a break in the heavily laden canopy above the wind had likewise backed somewhat to the westward showing us we had succeeded in scudding across the front track of the typhoon a very hazardous proceeding which can only be accomplished by the swiftest of vessels when i am relieved by mr nealance at noon he gives me all the information about our rescued waifs he has been able to glean which was as follows the man himself was steward on board the united states ship thalia of baltimore bound from singapore to nishuang with a cargo of ironwood spars which you know are mostly used for junks masts they encountered some hard weather beating up and she sprung a leak somewhere about her stern post where they could not get at it to stop it there was nothing for it but pump 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 the crew got very disheartened and two days before we came across them the dutch second mate and all hands deserted during the night in one of the boats leaving the captain chief mate steward and captain's wife and child on board to perish with the water-logged vessel the typhoon was beginning when the cowardly lot left in the boat so that they have met their fate by this time when we came up to them the thalia was nearly full of water and had not much longer to live they had no boat left and in such weather a raft was of no use both the captain and his wife were very ill of fever when the trouble began and had not recovered from its effects when the typhoon came on they were quite reconciled to their fate as was also the chief officer who refused to leave them and they thanked and blessed me says the virginian for endeavouring to save their only child the man whom we had so providentially rescued was a virginian man of colour born in the united states and though then a free man had in his early days been a slave in the household of the captain's parents he was a noble specimen of manhood standing nearly six feet two inches in his stockings and measuring forty-five inches round the chest from what i saw of him afterwards he seemed to me a man of the most affectionate feelings towards his fellow-men either white or black and always willing to use his great strength in helping his weaker brethren that he had loved and respected his late captain and his wife was very evident from the watchful care and tenderness he bestowed upon their orphan child daniel jackson was the name of this courageous seaman who had so successfully battled with the wild sea waves in the rescue of his master's child and the child's name was mary seward a bright fair child who has possibly grown up to womanhood and may have the pleasure of reading in these pages a rather too meagre account of her gallant rescue a few hours in time a few miles in distance and what a change comes over the scene could the ill-fated thalia have been by any possibility detained at her loading port for a couple of days such a scene as we had witnessed had never occurred and yet it is possible that her commander in his hurry to get along was only too eager to hurry onward to his then unknown fate so it is with all humankind rush on rush on is the ever constant cry while none of us know what the rushing on will entail upon us chapter eleven attacked by lorcas when i turned in after luncheon i left the eamont still scudding madly on through the drifts and the foam under her forestay sail flying through or rather over the water like some hunted thing endowed with life-given motion as i came on deck in the dog watch to relieve the chief officer to his dinner what was my surprise to find the eamont once more with her topsail set and the crew busy preparing to set the double reefed mainsail what a change in the weather a run of fifty miles had made the sky was again clear of the heavy mass of aqueous vapour in which we had been enveloped throughout the former portion of this ever-to-be-remembered day 
and we were again sailing along over a bright blue sea in our usual serene and exhilarating manner before midnight all our reefs were out and the wind had again veered back to its usual normal position at this time of year observations of the heavenly bodies were taken during the night to determine our position and at four o'clock in the morning watch the course is set that will lead us through the channels we intend to take in passing through the saddle islands at ten o'clock or four bells in the forenoon watch land is reported ahead and i immediately report the same to the commander who follows me up on to the deck as soon as the captain has made the land properly out the eamont is headed straight for the channel which is well known to our commander when we get close to the entrance of the channel all hands are piped to quarters the guns are all uncovered and the shot taken out the charges are also withdrawn then the guns are carefully sponged out and reloaded the small arms are likewise brought on deck and stacked around the mainmast as soon as we are all in perfect readiness for repelling any obstruction we may meet the men are dismissed to their quarters and we wait in patience the further progress of events the wind is blowing a fresh gale and increases as we enter the channel which is none of the widest being only two to three miles in some places and rather intricate should we have to haul our wind we keep in mid-channel so that we may have room to manoeuvre either side we may be faced by any foe suddenly popping down upon us from out of the many creeks around us as we pass the fort where we had the action on our upward trip we look for some signs of life but are unable to make out anything with the slightest evidence that man is anywhere about nor are there any junks in the small creek under the fort on the hill not till we are through the channel do we see any signs of life upon the ocean wave or the land then as we come out in the open we are able to make out some few lorchas to the right and the left of us carefully guarding the two channels we avoided coming through the captain looking at me and mr nealance who are standing by his side says mm, i think we have done them this time yes sir said nealance they'll have to be pretty smart to get alongside of us now but i'm hanged if they are not going to try it so they are by jove says the captain how they are clapping on their muslin but i doubt if they will get within reach of our big guns unless the wind falls a bit which it may possibly do now we are out of the narrow channel call mr jewel on deck says the captain to me and at the same time tell jackson to stop down below and amuse the girl should he hear any firing and on no account to come back on deck for the little thing has not got over her awful fright and loss of her parents yet i dive down below and after calling mr jewel explain to jackson the state of affairs at the same time bidding him to be under no apprehension as we are more than a match for the lorchas either fighting or sailing coming on deck after delivering my messages i find the position slightly altered for two of the lorchas on the starboard hand are making as if they would almost cross our bow but they are the only ones that seem to have the slightest chance in point of sailing with us mr nealance has manned the big gun and is training it on to the headmost lorcha when she shall get within range mr anderson says the captain get your forward gun ready and try for the top hamper of that headmost lorcha mr jewel i hear the captain say as i go forward to my gun tell nealance to put a length of chain shot into that big gun it is a capital thing for breaking their rigging if it doesn't bring the spars down before the lorcha is within range we are ready with both guns waiting for the order to fire nearer and nearer come the lorchas evidently bent on their own discomfiture for it is quite clear to us they have not the faintest shadow of a chance to cross our bows at the rate we are travelling our guns are trained nearly right on the starboard beam when we get the order to fire and the lorchas are about two hundred and fifty yards away fire shouts the captain and we let drive both guns right into the first lorcha 
when the smoke has cleared away we have the pleasure of seeing the lorca's mainmast and mainsail fall over her side thus cutting short her career of obstruction for a time while at the same time to add to our special gratification the second lorca which was coming up close on to the heels of the first not possibly expecting such a sudden termination of her consort's career runs slap into the now dismasted lorca before she can get out of the way and so brings down her own masts and yards with the suddenness of the crash that has also favourably for us put an end to the career of lorca the second we fire no more but proceed on our way and soon the lorcas are all out of sight astern at ten o'clock that same night we came to anchor at Wusung, close to our receiving ship the watch is set after the Eamont has been securely moored and her sails furled and we retire to sleep and possibly to dream of shipwreck as well as of fighting lorcas chapter twelve shanghai again nealance and i visit ah chung in the city the following morning our treasure is transhipped to the receiving ship there to await the arrival of the next schooner bound down to hong kong which will be a nice plum should she fall into the hands of the pirates in the environs of that port she having to call at all the downward ports collect the treasure from the firm's receiving ships and carry it on to the head office at that great emporium of the chinese trade our treasure having thus been disposed of we weigh our anchor and make the best of our way up the river to shanghai according to special instructions received from on board our receiving ship with a flowing tide and a slashing breeze of a fair wind we are not long in making our way up the river and before the sun has set in the golden west the eamont is again moored with two anchors nearly abreast of h b m consulate at shanghai half of our crew are allowed liberty to go on shore amongst whom are the blue jackets who emancipated themselves out of h m s service and who are now going over to mr bob allen's to stay till we are ready for sea again they have been very useful to us in the training of our crew but as they have not yet grown out of recognition by altering their whiskers or otherwise they rather dread the ordeal of a visit from any of their former officers therefore captain gulliver has permitted them to retire for a time to allen's safe retreat the officers of her britannic majesty's ships on the station were very often delighted to come on board these opium clippers and spend a pleasant evening the more so that the table was much better than any of the hotels that were then in existence in that far-off eastern land our japanese ambassadors take their departure for the shore in company with our commander and in about an hour after the captain has left the american consul arrives on board and carries away our rescued child and her saviour to more femininely hospitable quarters on shore after dinner mr nealance and i after providing ourselves with a loaded revolver and some ammunition take our departure for the shore also to knock up old acquaintances and have a look round at things in general we have not been on shore ten minutes when i am accosted by a boy whom i recollect to have seen about the house of ah cheng in his pigeon english way of talking he informed me that his master was very wishful to see me and also that he had a pass that would pass me through the city gates what do you say nealance i asked my fellow-officer will you come and see my ancient friend i don't mind if i do replies nealance but will his pass permit two of us you can have the pass i reply and i will get in without one i have a password i got from ward that will let me in anywhere almost except where there are tartars come along then says nealance and let us have a look at this grave conspirator ah shung following our guide we soon arrived at the gates of the city where we had no trouble about being admitted 
the difficulty might happen in getting out again for they were rather curious people to deal with in those days and had no great liking for us barbarians of the west as we were styled by them in their chronicles of that date passing along through the narrow streets of the city in the wake of our guide we safely arrived at the mansion in which my friend ah shung resided for the present it was not the same mansion in which i had the pleasure of residing with him on a former occasion but one of much greater pretension and seemingly by his surroundings he had made a big jump up in the social scale arrived at the entrance porch of this imposing mansion our guide motions for us to stop while he goes and announces our presence there we have not long to wait before we are admitted into the mansion and ushered into a room on the ground floor where we are scarcely seated when ah shung himself comes bustling into the room robed and decked out in the very pink of chinese fashion how you do missy anderson says ah shung and before i can reply i am taken aback by the rather lugubrious expression that radiates his countenance when he first claps eyes on mr nealance missy nealance says ah shung and in the same breath nealance says woo ah shung and then both burst out into a simultaneous roar of laughter which i am compelled to join before it is concluded as soon as they can speak any way coherently i find out that nealance and ah shung had known each other for several years in fact wu ah shung had once been in the service of the opium company as a comprador but being of an ambitious turn of mind had one day attempted to rise superior to his superiors and for this unpardonable error he had to seek for pastures new whereon to feed his flock when did you leave amoy ah shung asks nealance one year and a half ago says ah shung made it too hot for you i suppose says nealance no no says ah shung me only want e take e some gun some powdery and shoot a leady way up country two tie say no and come want e catchy me i jump e in lorca and come e up ning pu i go up river and sell e all my things make e plenty dollars and messy anderson help e me to get away from ningpo all right then i come here what are you going to be up to next asked nealance i think e go japan perhaps by ambi replies ah shung have e something to drink now ask ah shung to which we both reply in the affirmative as we know that he generally has the best of liquor wherever he gets it from a bottle of sparkling moselle is produced of which we are invited to partake as he kindly informs us in real chinese style that his house and all that it contains is entirely at our service after we have pledged each other to our mutual satisfaction ah shung tells us that he has got another gentleman upstairs whom mr nealance knows and asks if we would care to go up and visit him frank careero here in this house says nealance yes says our host he much e like e stop here better than english hotel all right says nealance we will go up and see him our host accordingly led the way upstairs to the room wherein his other guest was located following ah shung we enter the room and are introduced in proper form to mr careero by our host mr careero receives us very graciously and asks us to be seated he looks pretty hard at nealance and then says i think you and i have met before yes replies nealance we have met in hong kong at the oriental several times ah yes now i recollect says mr careero and adds as if he knew nealance and his profession when did you arrive a little before sundown replies nealance but we lay at wusung all last night did you transship all the treasure asks careero yes all of it replies nealance it don't seem as if they were going to send us down yet a while no i doubt if you will be in hong kong before june or july mr careero informs us do you know where we are going next asks mr nealance well yes replies careero but i would rather tell your captain first however you are going east and i am going with you are you expecting captain gulliver to-night asks mr nealance 
yes i have been expecting him for some time in fact when you came upstairs i thought it was your captain and some japanese friends of his replies mr careero well in that case says nealance as we too may be de trop we will shift our camp what say you anderson i am quite agreeable anyway i reply and as you say we would be very much de trop but it would have saved me another journey here if the captain had only arrived and he had been satisfied that my ah shung was the same ah shung as his you may rest satisfied on that point replies both mr careero and nealance he is the same party and a very useful party when you can keep him running straight having drank a parting glass with mr careero we wished him good-night and took our way downstairs where we found our friend ah shung in the act of receiving our captain and another european as well as the two japanese who had come from nishuang with us hello anderson says the captain is this your ah shung yes sir i replied not a bad fellow is he again says the captain addressing me but you must watch him ah eh, ah shung says the captain now looking at our host and giving him a playful dig in the ribs ah yes me plenty good says ah shung only come too muchy bad fellow no likey me cause me makey some time litty muchy dollar all right ah shung says the captain there are many worse men than you not caught yet then as he turns to nealance and i again he says sorry i can't invite you to the confab upstairs but i dare say i will be telling you all about it to-morrow at lunch for i won't be off to breakfast mind you don't disturb any of the peaceable inhabitants of this respectable city as you find your way to the gate for it is scarcely safe for only two of you we are all right says nealance and anderson has a magic password a real open sesame well good night gentlemen says the captain and be careful for good men are scarce at present good night having been said to all we took leave of our host ah shung and found our way out into the narrow lanes of the city after some intricate and perplexing lane navigation we finally found our way to the gate which was quickly opened for our exit when i had whispered a certain magical word into the ear of the official in charge of the guard having got safely outside of the city wall i asked mr nealance if he knew who this frank careero was oh yes i knew him a little replies nealance but i imagine our firm in hong kong have a good deal to do with whatever business he may now have in hand he is a fellow that knows nearly every language under the sun and i suppose he is useful to them in opening up new trade connections and such like enterprises what countryman is he i asked portuguese very likely native born that is macao born you know and if i mistake not he was educated in some of their jesuit colleges very likely for the priesthood but i would think he has found the world better to his liking than the church for people say he lives at a fast rate as if money were no object replies mr nealance what did he mean when he said we were going east i asked japan i suppose replies nealance there has been a lot of talk lately about getting the japs to open their ports to the world at large and that will make a big stir here for it is said to be a very rich country and our people i suppose want to be there to get some of the plums before the outside world get in and snap them up and so adds mr nealance careero will be going over to palaver the japs into allowing us barbarians of the west to settle amongst them and teach them all the benefits accruing from the civilization of the western world it is now nearly midnight so we find a sampan and proceed on board the eamont then after a few minutes talk and a smoke with mr jule we turn in to our cabins and are soon far away in dreamland the Eamont is safely watched over by armed sentries, and Bob Allen himself, unless he had the password, would meet with a warm reception should he attempt any of his man-stealing enterprises. End of Section 4 Section 5 of Among Typhoons and Pirate Craft by Lindsay Anderson. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section five, chapters thirteen through fifteen. Chapter thirteen about Wu An Chung. By the time eight bells are struck the following morning, the Emont is once more looking her best. Her decks, as usual, are as white as driven snow, her guns are glistening in the rays of the sun. So brightly are they polished that one has no need of a looking-glass to reflect the image of his person when in their vicinity, and I have actually seen, not once, but several times, some of our men perform their tonsorial functions by their aid. Her outside has not been neglected, and it is also shining with the gloss of a new coating of black paint. After breakfast, a few hours are given up to gun and small arm drill, so that our men won't get out of practice. Then, when Captain Gulliver comes off to luncheon, Mr. Jewell, having given a good report of his men, those who have not been on shore, are supplied with dollars and allowed the usual twenty-four hours to get rid of it, a consummation in most cases easily and expeditiously attained. The portion of the crew who had been on shore the previous night take the places of those now going on leave, so that at no time is the Emont left without a careful watch. As soon as we sit down to luncheon, the captain begins the conversation by asking Nealance how we came to be with Careero. "'I did not know,' replied Nealance. "'He was in the city. Anderson and I simply went to call on Wu An Chung to see if there was anything stirring up country at all. Did Careero tell you where we were bound to? asked the captain. Not exactly, sir, replies Nealance. He said we were going east, but that might mean to California or anywhere. You did not think so, I'll be bound, says the captain, with a broad smile on his face. No, sir, replies Nealance. I had an idea it was not so far away, perhaps Japan it is japan says the captain and we leave the day after to-morrow at noon so i hope you have your store list ready for me this afternoon to take on shore with me make them out for three months and replenish the magazine wu ah chung and you seem to be great chums anderson says the captain to me have you ever been up the river with him he also asks not up this river, sir, I replied, but I helped him up Ningpo River with one of his ventures, for which he seems to be very grateful. I should think so, says the captain, when he made a quarter of a million tails out of the transaction. I had no idea he had made so much, I say, for his lorca did not seem so very large, although it was well loaded with arms and ammunition. He just got up to Lu Chow in the nick of time, says the captain, when the parties had plenty of silver and no ammunition, and they doubly paid him to get him to try and come back again, and I don't believe he will ever attempt it. Some of their spies or agents are after him now, and he is putting them off with promises till I suppose he will land on board here with Careero and go to eastern lands with us to save his life for if he don't fulfill some of his promises soon, some one will split on him, and we will have the pleasure of seeing Ah Chung's head sticking on the wall at the entrance gates, the rest of his body being absent. I hope not, Nealance and I both remarked at the same time, for he is not a bad fellow as Chinamen go, Nealance further remarks, a sentiment I assent to with a nod. Oh, I don't want to see him done for, says the captain. He is a useful being in many ways, but, confound him, he don't know which side to stick to when there are dollars about and his life in no danger. I believe he must be one of the lost tribes of the Jews. That is very possible, says Mr. Jewell, for the Jews go back to Abraham, and Ishmael came after Abraham, so that he may be an Ishmaelite, and it is well known that the Ishmaelites travelled as far east as they could get. "'You Scotchmen are death on pedigree tracing,' says the captain. "'What do you say to Mr. Jewell's theory, Anderson?' "'Oh, I believe in it thoroughly,' I reply, "'for in all my dealings with humankind in eastern lands, "'from the Red Sea to the Yellow, "'they all have a natural propensity to do the Gentiles "'out of all they can. 
we'll see what you think of the japs in a few days says the captain to mr jewell while he includes me in the observation by a smiling nod and perhaps we will be able to find a pedigree for them as well as find out how they got over there as the captain concludes this last remark a note is placed in his hand by the steward which he immediately opens and reads when he has perused the note he rises from the table and says mr jewell man the gig immediately i must away on shore do you want to come on shore to-night mr jewell now asks the captain as he prepares to depart no sir replies mr jewell very well then says the captain let nealance and anderson come on shore after an early dinner and meet me at ah ching's at seven o'clock mr jewell adds the captain as he goes over the side into the gig you had better go to the ship chandler this afternoon about the stores and order everything to be on board to-morrow by two o'clock good-bye he says as the boat shoves off tell any callers i am gone to the consulate don't forget your revolvers nealance to-night our gig is a crack specimen of a captain's turnout pulled by six oars and in a few minutes we see the captain land at the wharf and enter the gates of h b m s consulate when the gig returns mr jewell and i proceed for the shore to see what we can knock up in the shape of suitable stores in those days it was always considered best for two or three to be together and armed if possible so as i was the junior or odd officer my trips to the shore were pretty frequent we had a walk around the so-called english and french town outside the city walls in our hunt after requisite materials there was only one english storekeeper about the place and we had perforce to put up with the goods he had and be thankful what we saw of the chinese stores in and around english and french towns was not of an alluring kind and as it was not safe to purchase anything in the city if you would keep clear of being poisoned we were reduced to the condition of hobson therefore it was either the one english storekeeper or nothing when we did find this one english store we were agreeably surprised by finding in the person of the storekeeper one of our countrymen from the land of cakes by the name of mackenzie his calf ground was scarcely twenty miles beyond either that of mr jewell or your servant the writer of these pages two hours of pleasant recallings were spent by us in mackenzie's store as we endeavoured to recall to each other the various well-known peculiarities that environed our calf ground in stern and wild caledonia having finished our store business we returned to the emont in time for an early dinner shortly after six p m nealance and i took our departure for the shore in our own hired sampan it not being very desirable to leave any ship's boats near the wharf after dark when we landed we arranged with our boatman a private signal to be used on our return and engaged him for the night or at any rate till we should again arrive at the wharf it is quite dark when we leave the wharf and wend our way citywards we find our way to the main gates and have no difficulty in entering the city the chinese guards having a great deal of outward respect for us barbarians however much they may hate us inwardly having so recently traversed the city on our former visit to the residence of ah ching we have very little trouble in finding its whereabouts knocking at the entrance gate of the mansion we are beckoned into the interior by our guide of the previous night who as soon as he has admitted us closes the door and securely bars it so that no other person shall get ingress till such time as he is ready to admit them as soon as our guide has secured the door to his satisfaction he motions for us to follow him and takes his way upstairs to the room above where the night previous we had been introduced to mr careero as we follow our leader nealance says to me something is wrong here anderson i wonder if they have caught ah shung i hope not poor devil i replied for if they have we have seen the last of him our guide gives a peculiar knock at the door which is immediately opened and we are agreeably surprised to find that our forebodings have been misplaced for there sits ah ching at the head of a well-furnished dinner-table almost up to the best european style 
on one side of the table sits our worthy captain and mr careero and on the other are seated our two japs and a gorgeously attired chinaman having as much the resemblance of ah cheng as to make one believe him to be his twin brother the dinner is apparently over although the dishes have not been removed and the gentlemen are deep in some grave discussion as we enter they do not cease their discussion as we enter for the very good reason no doubt that they are conversing in a language that is quite unknown to either mr nealance or i the captain is evidently as ignorant of the language as we are for as soon as we had uncovered and made our salaams all around he rose from the table and came towards where we were standing as if he had no interest in the subject matter under discussion have a glass of wine gentlemen says the captain and as soon as they have done their confab we will proceed to do our share in the business anything gone wrong sir asked nealance as we fill our glasses with our chung's moselle rather says the captain in reply to nealance's query some of ah cheng's friends have put the two tie on to him and we will have to smuggle him through the gates to-night or to-morrow will be the end of him i suppose you are both willing to lend us a hand to get the beggar off asked the captain oh yes sir we both reply we have got all his cash out of the city this afternoon says the captain and i have thought of a plan by which we will get him out and on board the eamont with very little trouble i may as well tell you my plan at once proceeds the captain he is just about the height of careero so i am going to clap a pair of whiskers and a moustache on to him then put him into a suit of careero's toggery and make a barbarian of him that other chinaman that looks so like him is one of our shroffs who will come to the gate with us and personate ah cheng as if he were seeing a portuguese friend away for i am afraid disguise him as we will we could never turn him into anything like an englishman what do you think of my plan the captain asks when he had finished his relation of it it will do all right replies nealance if they don't look too closely at him at the city gate well if they look too closely says the captain we must make a little diversion for them to take their attention away from him and that is where you two will be useful one of you will go ahead of us about fifteen or twenty yards and when they open the gate for you you will linger curiously in the gateway keeping it open till we come up and it will be curious if we cannot shove him through a lot of sleepy guards without having recourse to our revolvers which would be rather serious under the circumstances another thing i want to impress upon you adds the captain is that we don't do any shooting only for our own protection for i don't think he is worth risking a good man's life for careero wants him of course in this new business but not even for him are we going to kill any of the guards in order to get him away you know what i mean we will smuggle him through if we can but there is to be no shooting inside the walls of the city if he is caught on this side of the walls careero must buy the guards off if he can if not he must meet his fate as many a better man has done before him chapter fourteen we smuggle ah cheng out of the city to the readers who have not had the pleasure of visiting the cities of the far-famed celestial empire it is necessary that i should inform them that all the incorporated towns throughout this vast empire were surrounded by a strong and solidly built wall of stone and brick somewhere about forty feet in height and nearly the same number of feet in breadth at the top while the base possibly occupied the space of nearly fifty feet the city of shanghai within the walls was similar in appearance to other eastern cities especially in the narrowness of its streets but there was a marked difference in the style of architecture for they had generally adopted the conical system of roofing so common in our western lands instead of the flat roofs that obtained to so great an extent from egypt to bengal at the time i am writing of every vacant spot within the walls was fully occupied with the habitations of all sorts and conditions and consequently there was an enormous number of the people who not finding room to live in the city were living in floating houses on the river which flowed around nearly one-third of the city wall 
the reader will now see by this short description of the city that it was not merely a gate through which we had to pass our worthy friend ah cheng but that we had to get him through an entrance way which was nearly sixty feet in length by possibly twelve feet in width with a guard-house on either side of the inner end of this our only way of egress from the city shortly after the captain had ended his conversation with nealance and i the two japs took their departure being accompanied to the gate by the shroff who so much resembled our host in appearance after the departure of the japs we joined the others at the table and discussed again the means we were to take to liberate ah cheng out of his difficulty no better plan presenting itself than that which the captain had already promulgated to nealance and i it was decided to at once begin operations by metamorphosing our host from an enlightened celestial to as good an approximation of a western barbarian as we possibly could under the circumstances mr careero provided him with a suit of the latest fashion in tweeds then as soon as he had got himself inside of these the captain proceeded to decorate his mongolian visage with the newest style of the dundery whiskers a heavy moustache was securely fastened upon his upper lip but when the captain in a bit of humour attempted to cut off his tail there was very near being an end to all the proceedings you will have to let me cut your tail off ah chung says the captain cut he taily off says ah chung in great consternation yes says the captain it will have to come off or you won't be half a white man i stop ee here then says ah chung sitting down in a helplessly stricken state the loss of his head was seemingly a lesser evil than the loss of his tail mr careero now came to the rescue by suggesting that the tail could be conveniently coiled away inside one of his soft felt hats a suggestion soon put in practice which had the means of dispelling the mournful lugubriousness from the visage of ah chung and after a bottle or two of moselle had been quaffed he was as brave as any barbarian amongst us when the shroff returns from seeing the japs to their abode he manages to get rid of ah chung's domestics for the night by generously advancing them sufficient cash to permit them having the unutterable enjoyment of a night in an opium restaurant we take our departure from the house about eleven o'clock and take our way towards the gates carefully piloted by our shroff who is well acquainted with all the intricate lanes and streets of this peculiarly laid-out city we walk in threes and twos wherever the lanes will permit of so many walking together till we come within sight of the gates then i walk sharply some twenty yards or so in advance and on reaching the gate i knock and having given my wardian password the gate is opened and the one soldier who is awake conducts me to the outer gate where i accidentally trip my foot and fall my full length right in the gateway the guard having left the inner gate open while he conducted me through by the time i have got to my feet and given myself a pull together the rest of the party are upon us who bidding good-night to the shroff in a careless pigeon english manner pass through the gate along with me and are safely beyond the walls of the city the guard might have been made of wood instead of being a breathing living mass of humanity for all the notice he took of any of us and if there were any other guards there of greater intelligence they were possibly spending their time in a more agreeable employment to themselves than watching the city gates at such an hour of the night well i'm blowed says the captain after we got some little distance away from the gates this is about the tamest adventure i have had for some time he might have walked through himself in his own original attire possibly he might assents careero to this ejaculation of the captain's but if i am not mistaken that shroff of yours has had something to do with the absence of the other fellows on guard most likely he treated them to a well-prepared smoke when he came to see the japs through the gate if so it will save us any further annoyance for the guards will have to hide the fact of us passing through to save their own heads and no doubt they will find a method of silencing their comrade who so kindly permitted us to pass 
all's well that ends well says the captain and then turning to nealance and i he asks have you got a boat handy yes sir replies nealance there should be one waiting not far from the consulate when we have passed mackenzie's store nealance blows a significant call with his whistle which soon brings our sampan to the steps on the river bank and in less than a quarter of an hour we are all safely on board the Eamont. the sampan is dismissed with an ample douceur which actually satisfies him then after a short desultory conversation over the evening's proceedings largely supplemented with much flowery rhetorical thanks from ah cheng we retire to our cabins for the night chapter fifteen we sail from shanghai for nagasaki early the following morning nealance and i proceed up the river in two of our boats and having found the lorcha on board of which ah cheng's goods and chattels had been placed we receive his possessions into our boats and convey them on board of the Eamont. mr careero joined us in the saloon at breakfast not so ah cheng for he had again transformed himself into a celestial and preferred messing with his own countrymen the schroffs mr jewel says the captain when we have finished our breakfast are all your men on board all but those blue jackets at allen's replies mr jewel ah yes by the by we must not forget them says the captain well you can send nealance over for them about one o'clock in a sampan for i don't want the ship's boats out to-day at all we will leave with the first of the ebb about two o'clock so have her unmoored and ready say about half past one for we will trip and leave as soon as i come on board and don't allow any chinese visitors on board however high may be their rank after he had finished his instructions to the chief officer he turned to me saying anderson i want you on shore with me so get ready quick and bring a satchel with you for the dispatches i am soon ready for the shore and am in the sampan before the captain or careero have got there a few strokes of his sculling oar and the sampan man has landed us at the steps close to h b m consulate the captain and careero enter the consulate while i acting on the captain's instructions make my way to mackenzie's and threaten him with all sorts of penalties if the Eamont's stores are not on board in half an hour mackenzie and his men thus put on their metal proceed to dispatch our stores with the greatest alacrity and in a little over half an hour i have the gratification of seeing the last of them deposited in the sampan that is to convey them off to the Eamont. wishing my compatriot good-bye i take my way to the consulate and am immediately dispatched by the captain to the city in company with one of our schroffs to hunt up our two japanese and bring them to the consulate when we arrive at the gateway in the city wall we are taken into the guard-house and the schroff who accompanies me is severely cross-questioned as to his knowledge of the previous night's proceedings he knows nothing whatever about it therefore he is very well able to prove an alibi and as there is no one there who could have seen me i allow him to plead an alibi for me as well we are allowed to proceed on our errand but are closely watched to see whether we go near ah cheng's late residence or not luckily for us our way does not lay in that direction or possibly we would have found ourselves in durance vile in less than no time and may have been the recipients of some of their peculiarly swift and ending methods of justice as exercised by the mandarins of that time the schroff finds his way through this most intricate of cities to the shop of one of its principal merchants where we find our two japanese who have been joined by several of their own countrymen the schroff interprets my message to the japs who instantly make ready for departure many low bending genuflections are performed as our japs take leave of their friends and this rich and powerful chop who to prevent us meeting with any unpleasantness on our return sends several of his own retainers with us to see us safely without the walls of the city 
thus accompanied by the retainers of this all-powerful chop who wielded the influence of a rothschild we arrive safely at h b m consulate where are found the captain and mr careero anxiously awaiting our arrival a short consultation was now held between h m consul the japs and careero scarcely a word of which is understood by the captain or me at the end of their conference they all seem mutually satisfied with each other and after partaking of some light refreshments with h b m council a very pleasant though somewhat grotesque leave-taking ceremony is performed then we take our departure from the consulate and make for the sampan the sampan is lying at the steps in care of the consulate police for she is pretty well filled up with dispatches and various cases in which i suppose there would be found the sinews of this commercial treaty warfare when we have taken our places in the sampan in order to proceed on board the Emont, the captain says to me did you have any trouble in the city when you went for the japs not much trouble sir i reply but they have evidently missed something from the city for they had a good quarter of an hour's jaw tackling at the shroff did they get anything out of him do you think asked the captain no sir i reply for if he did know anything he acted the part of the flabbergasted one to perfection and they let us go but took care to send two or three celestials after us for our protection the mandarin has sent an official to the consulate to make inquiries says the captain and we advised him to go and examine the lorchas by the time they have examined the lorchas we will be a good way from here and when we come back the rebels may have shanghai and another kind of mandarin be in authority we are now alongside the Emont, and passengers dispatches and specie are soon taken on board and the sampan dismissed for the shore all hands on board mr jewel asks the captain as he steps on deck and is received at the gangway by the chief officer yes sir replies mr jewel very good says the captain then we'll get under way at once heave her a short stay peak and set your topsail and topgallant sail by that time i will have got my sea rig on plenty of able and willing hands are soon making the capstan fly round at a pace that would astonish some of the old hand spikesmen while at the same time another portion of the crew under nealance were sheeting home and setting the topsail and topgallant sail as well as casting loose all the canvas that composed the plain sailing attire of the Emont. the captain is soon on deck again attired in his rough and ready all round weather suit and as he makes a signal by waving his hand to mr jewel the anchor is weighed the Emont turns her head away down stream and as soon as she is fairly round all sail is clapped on her and away she flies down the river on her errand of peaceful negotiation to a strange and hitherto unknown country the wind is not actually fair and in our favour still with the help of a long leg and a short as tacking is denominated by most seafaring men we made splendid way down the river and before ten o'clock that night we were anchored within hailing distance of our receiving ship end of section five section six of among typhoons and pirate craft by lindsay anderson this librivox recording is in the public domain section six chapters sixteen through eighteen chapter sixteen piratical lorchas and their tactics the following morning various visits were made to and from the receiving ship and many cases of value were brought from thence to the Emont we do not break ground that day for the reason that captain gulliver was anxious to pass the saddle islands in daylight if possible because he had good reason to suspect from information received through various sources that not a few of the pirate lorchas were on the lookout for us the captain of the receiving ship had likewise informed our captain that some of these free traders had been observed cruising about outside seemingly in wait for something more valuable than a trading junk 
the principal topic of conversation at dinner to-day was of course the pirate lorcas and how to evade them that we were more than a match for any two of them at a fair fight even in a calm goes without saying it was when they got near enough to throw their abominable stink-pots on board and suffocate you that there was the greatest danger and so long as there was plenty of wind and sea-room we could outmanoeuvre a dozen of them how did you get your information asks our captain addressing the captain of the receiving ship while we were at dinner from some of the long-tailed celestials that come to purchase opium replies the captain of the receiving ship and it is possible that some of these fellows you set fire to last trip are amongst them likely enough says our captain some of your purchases are in league with the pirates i have not the least doubt about it replies the captain of the receiving ship when you take into consideration that it was from some of them i got the information that you had been skirmishing with them over there when they came on board to buy opium they have a long talky talky with the schroffs and they have so many different ways of imparting information to each other that it would puzzle old harry himself to find them out then the schroffs when they tell you anything it is after the pilong has gone away i have never seen them or heard of them telling any of these bits of information when the rascal was within reach what do you think would come of the schroff that split on any of them asks mr careero i suppose replies our captain a way would be found to settle his account by some of the pilong's friends just so says careero there would be no safety for him in the celestial empire and never will be till they have some different kind of government in their seaport towns the schroff who gave any information would have to exile himself from the land of his birth for ever why don't these two chinese gunboats go outside a little oftener asks our captain of the captain of the receiving ship for a very good reason at this time of the year at any rate replies the captain of the receiving ship for although they are pretty well armed their engines are not up to much and the lorchas can easily get away from them at the change of the monsoon and often in the light winds of the southwest monsoon they do good service as can be seen up the river by the number of fresh heads stuck up on the city walls when they return from a cruise have you ever been attacked on the receiving ship asks our captain twice since i have been in command replies the receiving ship captain and each time we beat them off with heavy loss in fact our guns carry so much farther than theirs that we were able to riddle them without their getting within range of us and i doubt very much if they will ever try it on again there is no danger of them catching you by surprise at any time says our captain not the slightest replies the captain of the receiving ship we are always on the watch and no armed men are allowed on board one chief officer attends to the cargo business and the other chief officer does nothing but attend to the fighting crew who are always at stations in various commanding positions all over the ship there is no relaxation from this duty night or day and when opium or treasure is being handled a strongly armed guard is placed round the hatchway and from thence right to the gangway we leave nothing to chance and are therefore able to sleep at peace although living in the midst of a chinaman's greatest temptation mexican dollars and opium what time do we leave in the morning captain gulliver asked mr careero four o'clock sharp replies the captain then we will have the whole day before us to circumvent these lorchas outside if there are any of them there i expect from the look of the weather at present that we will have plenty of wind to-morrow so you need not be anxious about what may happen when we get outside i will guarantee to land you in japan this side of four days mr anderson get the gig ready to take captain barrett on board the receiving ship says the captain ay ay sir i reply as i depart from the table in order to fulfil the captain's behest 
in a few minutes captain barrett comes on deck and after he has bade his friends good-bye he takes his place in the gig with me and is soon landed on board the receiving ship before leaving the gig captain barrett said i am sorry i can't ask you on board mr anderson to see our fighting deck but it would never do for me to break one of my own rules which is that no one is allowed up the side of our ship but myself between sunset and sunrise any other time when you are here and the sun is shining i will be very pleased to see you on board thank you very much i reply i will avail myself of your invitation the first time i have a chance having returned to the Eamont, i saw to the hoisting of the gig and then rejoined my messmates who are just having the parting glass preparatory to seeking some needed repose to fortify them for the coming day chapter seventeen we outmanoeuvre the pirate lorcas at four the next morning we weigh anchor and proceed under easy sail towards woosung bar we have careful leadsmen in both chains who call out the depth of water at every minute as we sail along through the intricate channels that lead towards the bar before the sun has made his appearance in the eastern sky we are over the bar and now under a heavy press of sail are making our way towards the saddle islands which we have to pass through on our way to nagasaki when the surroundings are fully exposed to our gaze by the light of advancing day we are enabled to make out several lorca looking craft lazily tacking about over towards the rising sun and right in the track of the course we are steering towards the open yellow sea the wind is blowing pretty fresh from the northward and as the eamont tears through the water she slings the water about everywhere sometimes sending the spray as high as the topgallant yard when a sea has kissed her cheek in the act of breaking as we spin along the water captain gulliver keeps intently watching the various manoeuvres of the suspicious-looking craft to the eastward of us which we are fast approaching what do you think of them nealance i ask of my messmate after we have had a good look at them i suppose they are the lorcas the captain of the receiving ship spoke about last night he replies you can tell by their dodging about there in that style that they are up to no good but what they expect to do with us in this breeze is a puzzle to me for they have not the ghost of a chance i don't know about that says mr jewell who has been listening to nealance and i if they get us jammed into some corner amongst the islands we'll have a pretty hard time to get out of their clutches if this breeze keeps on said nealance they'll have a poor chance of cornering us anywhere and i expect the captain will find a way of getting to windward of them before the sun is over the foreyard mr careero is the only one of our passengers who has appeared on deck this morning as yet and he like the captain is intently watching the motions of the lorcas to the eastward and northward of us there are about a dozen of them some are leading to the eastward and some to the westward while others of them are wearing round and round as if endeavouring to keep at a certain position according to some already devised arrangement mr jewell calls out the captain from the quarter-deck sir replies mr jewell as he proceeds aft your guns are all ready asks the captain yes sir replies mr jewell ball or grape asks the captain all round shot sir answers mr jewell very good says captain gulliver then we will have some long-range practice with the big gun and the forecastle gun when we get a little nearer for if these lorcas don't close their ranks we will pass right through them and at the rate we are travelling one shot is all we will get mr jewell shouts the captain when the chief officer had got as far as the midship gun don't uncover any of the guns yet keep them perfectly dry till we require them i will give you warning enough when to be ready and in the meantime you can pipe the hands to grog for there will be no breakfast for any one till we are at the other side of the lorcas 
from time immemorial or at any rate since the days that wine or spirits were introduced amongst the nations of this earth a glass of real good liquor has always had a very wonderfully cheering and inspiriting effect on the genus homo at large but how much more so on the mariners who have far away from home and friends toiled and fought to enrich and ennoble their fatherland as well as to extend the benefits of its enlightenment to all the nations under the sun the glass of cheering liquor although costing but little as a money's worth has often been of an incomparable value not only in cheering the mariner on to highest deeds of daring do or in cementing friendships but it has also been the means when hospitably and generously bestowed of chasing away the bitterness from the heart of an enemy and transforming him the enemy into a warm-hearted and ever-loving bosom friend if you wish to raise a pleasant smile on board of any ship be the crew ever so dissatisfied just call out grog ho in a substantial meaning tone of voice then see with what an electric-like shock the faces of all around are now lit up with smiles pleasant and deep as they march aft to the saloon door to receive their heart-warming glass of good old jamaica the men having had this cheering solace administered to them are sent to stations to be in readiness for whatever may occur the captain careero mr jule nealance and i are all aft on the weather side of the quarter-deck eagerly scanning the various movements of what is now pretty certain the enemy in the shape of eleven lorchas all told lo look there exclaims the captain those fellows away to the eastward are tacking back so they are to the westward sir says mr jule they're going to make for these four that have been wearing round and round ahead of us to keep in our track and i was going to dash through to windward of them had the others kept their reach says captain gulliver nealance says the captain you have charge of the sails can you put your hand on that drag sail we use dragging down the rivers and bring it here under ten minutes yes sir replies nealance in less time than that as he proceeds to carry out the captain's order look here mr jule says the captain as soon as that sail is aft put it over the stern and we will hang the emont back as much as we can then when all the lorchas get close together to pounce down on us we will slip the port drag ropes of the sail wear short round and haul out to the northward in less than the ten minutes the emont is in rain struggling to get away from the heavy drag that is holding her almost as if she were at anchor she is going rather fast yet says the captain lower away your mainsail and gaff topsail as if they had carried away the mainsail and gaff topsail come down with a run and the emont is now motionless the lorchas thinking we are in a dilemma of some sort make all sail they can irrespective of any line and come down on us almost in a compact body the easternmost and the westernmost having by this time come close to those in the centre down they come like so many wild vultures after their prey the headmost lorchas firing their bow guns as they advance although none of their missiles come within the range of our vision when they have got within half a mile of us the captain gives voice again saying hard aport your helm let go the drag lines haul in your drag sail on the starboard and waist there and be handy these orders are almost as rapidly executed as they are spoken even the drag sail is got on board by the time the emont has got the wind on her starboard quarter hoist away your mainsail and gaff topsail shouts the captain and get your head sheets over brace her sharp up mr jule is the next order of the captain and as soon as this order is executed i take time to have a squint at the enemy they are all in the act of tacking and standing on the same tack as us but we have gained a decided advantage over them in the matter of position for although they are still some half a mile to windward of us we have only one of them bearing forward of our starboard beam and if she is not one of the fleetest she will soon be like the rest a good deal more abaft the beam than she now is forward of it 
the next five or six minutes are spent by us on board the Eamont in a kind of breathless suspense, watching and waiting to see whether our ruse has been effectual or not, which will depend on our being able to outdistance the two headmost lorchas. One of them is on the starboard bow, less than four points, and the other is nearly right abeam, the rest of the lorchas being pretty well on the starboard quarter, and apparently dropping into line astern of us. "'We are making on them,' says the captain, after this five or six minutes' silent survey. "'Yes, sir,' replies Mr. Jewell from the binnacle. "'We have made half a point on them by the bearing of the compass.' Nealance and Anderson, shouts the captain, man your pivot gun and pitch into that headmost lorca. Starboard a bit, Mr. Jewell, I hear the captain say as I leave the quarter deck, and at the same time I hear a discharge of artillery, which on looking round I find has come from the headmost lorca, who has kept away as if to cross our bow. We are not long in opening fire upon this lorca, and make good practice, for the action of keeping the Eamont off the wind a little has brought the lorca right on our beam, a point of great advantage to us. For about a quarter of an hour we keep up this running fight, and although we are evidently a little faster than the lorca, we have not got sufficiently far ahead to be able to haul our wind and cross her bows put a fathom of chain-shot in that big gun nealance and fire right into her mainsail i heard the captain shout then taking up his trumpet he calls out to me try for her steering gear on top of her poop anderson both shots are soon on their path of destruction and when the smoke clears away we have the gratification of seeing that the lorca's mainsail has come to grief and also that she is flying up in the wind as if her rudder had lost somewhat of its controlling power haul in your main sheet shouts the captain keep her up to the wind but mind don't shake a cloth let her have all she will this is all performed faster than I can write it, and when I have time to look around, after trimming the head-sheets, the lorca is right in our wake and fast dropping astern. Some of the other lorcas have gone upon the other tack in order to intercept us, if they can, as we make for the channel through the islands. We have run somewhat to the westward of its entrance while engaged in our running fight. "'Cover up the guns and stand about,' shouts the captain. In a moment we are also standing away in the same direction as the lorcas, but this time we have a clear weather gauge of them. After reaching on this tack for half an hour, we again tack to the northwestward, on which tack we let her go for about twenty minutes, then round she comes again with her head to the eastward, and with a slightly flowing sheet she is given her head, then away she bounds through the channel like a veritable racehorse and soon, very soon, the discomfited lorcas are hidden from our view. The guns are well secured for the deep-water sea, the watch is set, and all hands proceed to enjoy a well-earned breakfast. Chapter 18 We Sail for Nagasaki and Land Our Passengers in the Dark The sun has little more than crossed the meridian when we emerge from the channel out into the open sea. A course is then set that will take us to the entrance of Nagasaki, and as the wind is slightly free, a topmast and lower studding sail are clapped on to the Eamont to further increase her speed. The wind is from the northward, and our course is nearly east by north, so that every rag on the Eamont has a chance of pulling to its utmost. There is more sea on out there than there it was inside of the islands, and although it is very grand and exhilarating to be dashing over the high-crested waves at the rate of fifteen knots an hour, still it is anything but a dry and comfortable position for those who have the watch on deck. You might almost say you were under water all the time of your watch on deck, for she went along so fast that she left no interval between the succeeding waves wherein you could draw your breath. The canvas was on her, and she had to bear it, but there was one good thing in our favour, everything about the gear and sails was of the very best, and there was not the slightest danger of capsizing her, for the iron kentledge in her bottom hold was secured as firmly as any rock. 
for nearly three days was the Emont driven along in the foregoing style without anything happening to interfere with our run across the yellow sea then as we neared the coast of japan the wind gradually subsided till we were left with little more than a five knot breeze at noon on the third day out from wusung we were but ten miles off the entrance to the harbour of nagasaki and as it was not deemed prudent to enter the harbour in the daylight for certain reasons that appertained principally to our japanese passengers and mr careero the emont was hove to with her head off shore to await the setting of the sun as we lay dodging with our head off shore the opportunity of having a few hours gun drill is acted upon by our commander so as to have all our fighting gear in proper order should the inhabitants prove hostile to our proceedings the sun having gone to his rest in the west as poets are so fond of saying the emont was again turned with her head in the direction of the harbour we had need of all our canvas for as the daylight vanished and the darkness took its place the wind nearly died out altogether so much so that it was nearly midnight when we were within the headlands that formed the entrance into this magnificent and most capacious harbour within the headlands there was not the faintest breath of wind nothing but a dead calm stillness and the surface of the waters forming this lake-like harbour shone so resplendently in the clear darkness of the moonless night that the emont and her surroundings could be seen on either side reflected as in a looking-glass the sails having thus lost their power of propulsion the sweeps are run out of the gun ports and while one watch takes in and furls all the sails the other watch quietly pulls the emont along to the desired anchorage pointed out by one of our japanese passengers we do not let the anchor go with a rush as is usual but quietly walk back the capstan till sufficient chain is out for the emont to ride in safety the emont having been thus quietly brought to anchor the crew are dismissed to their quarters sufficient men being left on deck for harbour watch as well as to man the gig if necessary as soon as our duties permit mr jewel nealance and i are requested to join the captain in the saloon here we find mr careero and the two japs in consultation with the captain the subject being their conveyance to the shore without attracting the observation of any of the inhabitants look here nealance says the captain i want you and anderson to take the small dinghy and pull quietly to the shore then land and take a look up and down near that house you will see standing by itself to the right of the lower portion of the town if there is no one about come back and let us know and we will be ready to accompany you back in the gig very good sir replies nealance but before we go on deck he returns and asks shall we go armed yes of course replies the captain but mind no shooting unless for your own protection with the aid of the gig's crew who are waiting on deck we soon have the light dinghy in the water without making as much noise as would startle the gentlest of sleepers we take a paddle each and in silence paddle our way to the beach it is only about a quarter of a mile from the emont to the beach and we do not require a great many strokes of our paddles before the keel of the dinghy is rubbing on the shingle as soon as the dinghy is as far up the beach as she can be got with the aid of the paddles we both take to the water and seizing hold of the dinghy's gunwale we pull her still higher up the beach so that she may lie there in safety till we return we then proceed in the direction of the house indicated by the captain and walk round the walls by which it is enclosed then we walk about one hundred yards to the right and left and finding no obstruction or any signs of human or animal life we return to our dinghy and find our way back on board the emont when we arrive back on board and deliver our very satisfactory report we receive instructions from the captain to place the gig in the water in the same noiseless manner as we had done with the dinghy 
in a very few minutes the gig is at the accommodation ladder in readiness for those who are bound for the shore the oars are well muffled with flannel and the men are cautioned about silently dipping their oars in the water two or three portmanteaus are passed into the gig as well as several small cases and dispatch boxes then mr careero and the two japanese take their places with nealance and i in the stern sheets and as soon as all are seated we cast off and proceed for the shore this time we pull right in the direction of the farthest end of the house by the direction of one of the japs and both nealance and i are rather taken aback when we find that he safely pilots the gig up some narrow channel to within a few yards of the back wall of the house as there is nothing or no one to disturb us in our night's work the boat is left in charge of the coxswain after each one of us passengers officers and crew have possessed themselves of some portion of the baggage to carry up to the residence we do not proceed to the front entrance of the mansion to find an entrance one of the japs having guided us to a side entrance in the eastern wall of which he likewise possessed the key as soon as we are all within the enclosure the gate is securely fastened and we are then led by the japanese to the back entrance into this mansion which is seemingly a well-known habitation to our passengers when we enter the house all the baggage is taken and stored into a room by itself then we are led into another room at the back of the house the window of which looks out upon the waters and therefore safe from the observation of any one in the city a lamp is ready on the table and as soon as i have found a match one of the japs requests me to light up our surroundings while we have been busy lighting up this room and stowing away the baggage one of our japanese has been on a tour through the other parts of the building and we are no little surprised to see him enter the room bringing two more of his countrymen with him they had evidently been sleeping on the premises but we had done our work so silently as never to disturb them and they seemed to be scarcely awake from their astonishment yet many salaams were gone through and our good wishes are interpreted to them by careero one of them departs for a minute or two and returns with an elegant tray on which are glasses and bottles the distinctive marks on the bottles proclaiming them to be something other than japanese production the gig's crew are given a dollar and a glass of three-star brandy each then dismissed to the boat nealance and i have perforce to drink to the health and safety of each of our passengers and their friends then as a parting glass we all hobnob with our glasses full of sparkling moselle and drink to the success of the great work at hand the opening up of japan to european trade and commerce salaams and good nights having been said and done in elegant style nealance and i take our departure and proceed to the gig escorted by the japanese passenger who seemed to know the most of the present surroundings arriving on board the Emont, we narrate to the captain and mr jewel an account of our proceedings especially the more than kind manner of the japs towards us then as soon as the gig is again in its place we wish each other good night and retire to our cabins end of section six section seven of among typhoons and pirate craft by lindsay anderson this librivox recording is in the public domain section seven chapters nineteen through twenty one chapter nineteen the japanese attempt to put us out of the harbor as i look on the japanese of to-day and the wonderful advance they have made in most everything appertaining to european manners customs trades and professions i can scarcely credit that they are the same race of people with whom we had to deal no farther back than thirty-two years ago 
they have now a magnificent fleet of war vessels and a fast increasing mercantile marine manned and sailed exclusively by people of their own nation the reader who sees them as they are now will scarcely be able to accept as a fact my relation of the scene that met our gaze shortly after daylight on the first morning of our arrival in the harbour of nagasaki mr jewell as was usual had kept the morning watch so that he could see to the proper carrying out of the morning's work cleaning and polishing the decks bulwarks and guns being always a duty of paramount importance and always carried on under the direct personal supervision of either a first lieutenant or a chief officer who is in love with his ship and wishes to please his superior officers shortly after six o'clock in this morning watch mr jewell sends a quartermaster to call nealance and i and requesting our presence on the deck anxious to know his reason for calling us and whether any danger is at hand we soon get inside of our clothing and reach the deck where we find the captain mr jewell and i suppose the whole ship's company having a serious time of it for one and all of them are nearly ready to burst in their endeavour to suppress their laughter so as not to offend the susceptibilities of the japanese who are at present carrying out some important operation under our bows as both nealance and i look at the captain and mr jewell with questioning eyes the captain says to us go forward and look over the bows yourselves we pass along forward to the bows then take a look over and like the others we cannot help smiling at the childlike ignorance that is being displayed before our amused gaze the Eamont is riding with her port bower anchor and about thirty fathoms of cable chain yet here as we look over the bows of the Eamont, we see nearly one hundred and fifty small boats pulling lustily away all fastened to a rope which is attached to the bobstay of the Eamont, and their endeavour is presumably to tow us out to sea when we have had a look at them we walk aft and join the captain and mr jewell who have now subsided into a quiet smiling watchfulness of the proceedings of these somewhat peculiar people boatswain calls out mr jewell call your hands from forward and proceed with your cleaning ay ay sir replies the boatswain and soon the fore end of the eamont is entirely deserted the men having been purposely placed as far from the bows as possible do you think they will be able to move our anchor asks mr jewell of the captain i don't think so replies the captain still you may let a quartermaster drop his lead over and watch the lead is accordingly dropped over the side aft till it reaches the bottom but it shows no sign that they are at all able with the power they have at hand to move the eamont from her position after watching them towing away for some considerable time our captain begins to have some feeling akin to compassion on the people so uselessly and ignorantly employed anderson says the captain addressing me step down to the after cabin and bring ah shung and one of the shroffs on deck and we will see if he can talk to them in a few minutes i return to the deck accompanied by ah shung and a shroff to whom the captain explains what he wishes them to do we then proceed forward and ah shung beckons in a significant manner to an official of rank in one of the nearest boats and intimates to him our desire to have a parley this official after taking counsel with several of his colleagues comes close under the bow with his boat then ah shung at the instigation of the captain explains to him the utter futility of attempting to move the eamont while she is held fast to the surface of the earth by so powerful a chain as is pointed out to him by ah shung as it hangs from the hawse-pipe downwards but now that close to the vessel's planking that any one ignorant of shipping might easily be excused for not knowing that the vessel was being held in her position by that curious piece of wrought iron 
as soon as ah shing has succeeded in making this official understand the nature of the case the rowers in the boats are ordered to desist and after another parley with his colleagues the boats are called off and ordered away from the scene of their ludicrous operations five boats remain near the eamont after the order has been given to cast off four of these boats being stationed at advantageous positions not far from the eamont by this official who seems to be in charge of the undertaking one boat was placed on each quarter and on each bow at a distance of four fathoms from the eamont then after he had thus placed an effectual watch on our proceedings this official of rank took his departure for the shore the effect of this startling though ludicrous incident having at length subsided we are now able with our telescopes to survey the magnificent scene around us the morning is beautiful and the air is full of the balmy ozone that is found to prevail in the vicinity of the orange grove we are encompassed by high hills on every side the city itself which we can plainly see at the head of this huge basin of lake-like water is built in terraces one above another and reaches to some considerable extent up the hill on which it is so picturesquely situated from what we can see of the city we take it to be of some considerable size and importance the houses seem fairly well and regularly built and the roads as well as the streets seem to have been formed after some symmetrical plan as they rose one above another that would really have done honour to the architects of any of our show cities in europe the enormous basin of water which formed this landlocked harbour was not unlike a miniature milford haven or a lawson and it was capable of holding within its natural surroundings the combined fleets of many maritime nations at the northern extremity of the harbour and close in under the city at its western extremity we can see much to our surprise a man-of-war looking vessel somewhat similar to the dispatch boats of those days which were often a cross between a gunboat and a sloop of war she was bark rigged or rather a jackass bark for her topmast and topgallant masts were all in one piece and as she had a funnel we were left to suppose that she had steam engines within her for her propulsion she was flying the japanese national ensign at her gaff end the round globe in it was probably an emblem of the idea which was held so long in that country that they were the only nation on this habitable globe one or two junks are lying not far off from this man-of-war and with ourselves the imposing array of the mercantile fleet in the harbour of nagasaki is complete in little more than one generation taking from infancy to manhood as our standard the whole scene has changed as if it were by the magician's wand so rapid has been the progress of this wonderful nation on the bosom of this gigantic harbour you will now find a multitude of steamers and other vessels bearing the flags of all nations carrying on a trade with this lately new-born nation that would do credit to any of our great trade emporiums in europe and place several of our once foremost nations and their commercial trading cities far far away in the background of the world's general commercial work not a bad-looking place observes the captain to us as we stand around him on the quarter-deck admiring the scene the way the city is built on that hill to the left says mr jewel reminds me very much of what i have read of the hanging gardens of babylon they just look like one terrace over another and on that hill to the right the same formation has been carried out by the designers that steamer inside there has very much the appearance of a man-of-war says the captain and i am rather surprised they did not send her to tow us out of the harbour instead of attempting it with these rowing boats she would be rather a tough nut for us to crack if she were to show fight observes the captain and i suppose when our japanese friend anchored us here it was to keep us as far away from each other as possible eight bells sir reports the quartermaster to mr jewel 
strike the bell and break your flags says mr jule to the quartermaster and in a moment the Eamont is gaily decorated with bunting from stem to stern, in order to do honour to those in authority as well as to propitiate them in our favour. Now to breakfast, gentlemen, says the captain, and we will discuss the best way of getting communication with the shore. CHAPTER Twenty: THE JAPANESE OFFICIALS IN THE BOATS COME ON BOARD TO LUNCHEON after assembling at the breakfast table the first quarter of an hour passes off in the usual conversationless manner each one being seemingly bent on satisfying the cravings of the inner man previous to starting any topic that would necessitate the employment of his brain power after the first and second courses have been disposed of the captain at length begins the discussion of our present situation the japs don't seem to want anything to do with us says the captain taking all three officers in at a glance mr jule as chief officer having the priority of reply assents in an affirmative manner to this observation of the captain these japs again says the captain from what we have seen of them this morning don't seem to know much about ships and it is possible they are as little acquainted with the many tactics that are employed in working the commercial world that lies outside of their dominion my instructions from headquarters are to facilitate the endeavours of careero and the japanese who are in league with him to get an open trade with the country if they watch us says nealance as they are doing now how are we to get on shore and do anything we have not spent many hours here yet replies the captain and it is for us to find out some method of satisfying them that we don't intend to interfere with the statute laws of the country as i had taken no part in the conversation except that of listener leaving my superiors to reply the captain turns his glance towards me and asks what do you think of the situation anderson i should like to know i reply where they got that three-masted bark-rigged steam gunboat from if they are a new people and have had no dealings with european nations you have not been reading history lately mr anderson replies the captain or you would know that the dutch have had some kind of a landing here for trading purposes but they have never got beyond that and i may as well tell you that the gunboat-looking vessel in there is a present from them to the powers that be but fortunately for us and perhaps for the dutchmen too there are no people here capable of working her this slice of information from the captain about the man-of-war brought forth a rather choking sensation of laughter from us his officers for we had no idea till then that he had been posted up with all the various wrinkles that were vitally necessary for the accomplishment of the purpose then in view no offence gentlemen says the captain as we look rather apologetically after our burst of laughter at his admission about the gunboat but you know i cannot really tell you everything for some of it may never come to pass is careero all right where he is asked nealance the devil of fear of him replies the captain he always turns up right side uppermost he will swim where any of us would sink but all the same some of you three will have to meet him to-night if we don't hear from him during the day can you swim anderson asked the captain yes sir i reply good swimmer again queries the captain i have often swum from kowloon to hong kong with my clothes towing from my neck dressed on the beach witnessed the drilling of the troops and then swum back again i reply you will do and nealance i know is like a fish in the water is the comment of the captain as we rise from the breakfast table then he adds as we go up the companion perhaps you will get a chance of a bath to-night yet after we had another studied gaze at our surroundings the captain finding we are severely left alone instructs mr jule to make a general quarter day of it for the amusement of the japanese who are so carefully watching us in their boats 
the hands are piped to quarters a certain amount of big gun drill is carried out then we have some single stick practice and wind up with some revolver firing at targets fixed on the taffrail the japanese in the boats look on at our practice with undisguised wonder and astonishment but make no attempt to leave the position that had been allotted to them by the official who had placed them there in the morning when our people have been dismissed from drill the captain requests ah shing to come on deck looky here ah shing says the captain when that worthy had come within speaking distance i want ee some of these japanese officers in the boats to come on board here and have a look see we'll give ee some chow chow some winey some beer and have ee a litty talky talky ah ching smiles an assenting reply to the captain and proceeds to carry out the foregoing suggestions by getting into conversation with the officials in the boat on the starboard quarter which is the one nearest to him after ten minutes of ah shing's persuasive eloquence the officials in this boat get their men to haul in the anchor then as soon as they have let go of the bottom they pull round to each of the other boats and hold a short parley with them this conference having been favourably decided they come alongside our accommodation ladder where ah shing and the captain are in waiting to receive them on board the two officials after instructing their boatmen to take up their former position at anchor come up the ladder and are received on deck in a style befitting officials of the highest rank a table is soon improvised by the stewards on the skylight and an elaborate luncheon speedily finds its place on the snow-white tablecloth ah sheng proves himself an apt interpreter as well as a master of ceremonies and in a very short time we have the whole of the officials from the four boats sitting at the table the japanese of to-day are to be seen in various cities of the world generally attired in the prevailing fashions which are for the time being the costume of the period these officials were not so attired but wore the clothing that had been in use amongst them for a period of time possibly extending back to their first progenitors all of them were similarly attired in a grey cloth robe not unlike the modern dressing-gown of the aesthetic in our own land only without its very much embroidering their heads were partially shaved in the front of the forehead as if they wished to show some intellectuality by producing a kind of high and noble forehead which even in our own land is considered somewhat of a recommendation to certain offices as witness the many bald-headed deacons churchwardens and vestrymen the hair on the back and sides of the head was allowed to grow to some length the whole being gathered at the end into a kind of queue that laid over the shaved portion of the cranium a strong belt or girdle round the waist confined the robe closely to the person while suspended from this waist belt each official carried two swords one on each side which were made of splendid steel equal in quality to the finest damascus ah ching having persuaded them to accept of our hospitality we were soon all seated at the luncheon-table they ate sparingly of our food whether from want of appetite or suspiciousness of its quality was difficult to determine but there was little doubt of their appreciation of the liquids as they held up their empty wine-glasses to be replenished with sparkling moselle a sort of desultory conversation was kept up during luncheon by the aid of ah shing but all that we could make out of it was that certain of their countrymen were very much against our being allowed to land on their territory as to our present guests before they left our hospitable table they expressed through ah shing their great desire to see us established in their midst for ever a good deal of time was spent over this luncheon probably to good purpose for before the officials again took their places in their boats we had become sufficiently friendly to be allowed to handle their swords as well as to test them with the peculiar test of cutting through a doubled-up silk handkerchief 
when the boats came alongside to receive these officials after luncheon a large quantity of biscuits and beef was passed into each boat for the refection of the boatsmen a benefaction which was very much appreciated by them to judge by their manner of receiving it chapter twenty one nealance and i visit the shore after dark by swimming our official guests having taken up their various positions of observation around the Emont, we likewise proceed about our various duties incident to life on board ship. Nothing transpires in the course of the afternoon to disturb our enforced calm tranquillity. From what Ah Shing was able to discover of the intentions of these set to watch us, we were not to be permitted to land anywhere in the harbour till such time as the governor or chief officer of state had given his sanction and even this great condescension was very doubtful of attainment during the course of the afternoon the captain invites mr jewel nealance and i to a conference in the saloon to discuss and arrange for some means of placing ourselves in communication with mr careero the captain having told us of his anxiety to know how careero was getting on mr jewel asked don't you think we could land at careero's without being seen from the town and i dare say a dollar or two to these officials in the boats would make them blind to what we are doing as far as landing is concerned replies the captain we could very soon do that as we have plenty of force to protect ourselves but landing without their permission might bring on such a fanatical furor as to necessitate the giving up of this business altogether as for dollars they could have them and welcome but i doubt very much if you could get any of them to accept a single coin from you they are strictly forbidden to exchange money or have any dealings with us so it would be a question of life and death to any one of them found in possession of a mexican dollar as we cannot use the boats strikes in nealance the only other thing i can see is to use the water without the boats as soon as it is dark enough i don't mind trying to fetch careero it is not much of a swim the getting into the house if it happens to be watched will be the worst part of the difficulty and as you might need some help i suggest i go along with you the captain seemed much pleased at our offer and as no other method more feasible could be thought of it was finally decided to adopt mr nealance's plan of opening up communication with our friends it was springtime and although the water was not so genial perhaps as it was in summer still it was not much colder than our own sea-coast water in the bathing season a light suit of clothing done up in a small parcel and covered with a piece of oiled silk from the medicine chest is soon ready for each of us then we wait and watch for the coming darkness and a favourable opportunity when the watchers in the boats may be off their guard after eight bells has been struck and the usual stir of relieving the watch has again subsided we take a searching look at the watchers in the boats and finding that they have made themselves comfortable for the night by stretching themselves out in the bottoms of their boats we proceed to carry out our expedition to the shore a boat's ladder is lowered down from the taffrail to the water's edge then as soon as we have stripped we secure our light parcels on the back of our necks bid good night to the captain and mr jewel and quietly slip down the rope ladder dropping into the water as noiseless as any denizens of the deep we strike out slowly and cautiously till we get some little way from the ship so as to float as deep as possible and not attract any attention from the guard boats when we have got a safe distance from the Emont and her guardians we strike out boldly in the direction of the mansion endeavouring if possible to follow the route the japanese had taken on the previous night we do not speak much to each other but reserve our wind to aid our exertions in cutting our way through the water we are not successful in finding the channel for in about twenty minutes time from leaving the ship nealance comes to a standstill saying we are in shallow water 
there was no doubt about that for as i let my feet sink from their horizontal position on hearing him speak they come to the ground with astonishing quickness and i find there are scarcely three feet of water on this portion of the beach don't rise up anderson for a minute says nealance till we have a look at our surroundings for i fancy i saw something like a man moving along the shore there a man where i ask there don't you see him now says nealance yes i can see him plain enough confound him and he is right in our path to the house i reply keep low and we will soon see if he is on watch or not says nealance for several minutes we remain in our crouching attitude in the water watching the proceedings of this personage who has arrested our career so unexpectedly he seems as if he were stationed there for some purpose says nealance no doubt of it he has not moved half a dozen paces from where we first spotted him i remark what do you think shall we go back or swim out a bit and land farther to the eastward asks nealance we can't go back without a harder try so let us start off for i am getting slightly cramped in this position i reply off we go then says nealance and we started swimming out into deep water again then as soon as we had got out of our depth we headed along shore to the eastward we keep right on in this direction for nearly half an hour or at any rate till we get a quarter of a mile to the right of the residence wherein our friends are located we then draw in towards the shore and seeing no signs of any one to interfere with us we make our way out of the water as soon as we touch bottom about ten or fifteen yards from the water's edge we perceive some few clusters of brushwood and as soon as we gain their cover we proceed to attire ourselves in the garments we had brought with us while proceeding with our open-air toilette we keep a sharp lookout towards careero's mansion in order to discover if there are any persons on watch this side of it as soon as our attire is completed we proceed towards the house keeping amongst the brushwood wherever possible so as to hide our proceedings from any watchers that may be on the lookout evidently the watchers have been placed on that side of the mansion which lies next to the emont for we arrive at the side gate without meeting with any hindrance we have found the gate which is securely fastened and we have no key how to get in without making a noise is the next question we have to solve so after looking round and surveying the position from the side we were on not deeming it prudent to show ourselves out from the shelter and cover of this side wall we came to the conclusion that there was nothing for it but scaling the wall just where we were you are the lightest anderson says nealance so get on my shoulders and i will give you a hoist up what about yourself i ask i'll be all right here until you get some one to open the gate replies nealance at any rate as soon as you are over i will lie flat down out of sight and if you find no one there you will surely find some way of getting back all right then here goes i say as i climb up on to nealance's shoulders when he has stretched himself to his full length i fail to reach the top of the wall by six inches i want six inches more i tell him and ask can you give me a jerk up look out then he replies but don't miss your hold and come down on top of me for it won't do to cripple either of us is there any broken glass on it asks nealance before he proceeds with my jerk glass no these people are not civilized enough for that yet i reply very good now then look out says nealance as he heaves himself up with a jerk that sends me more than the required inches above the wall top i am able to make good my hold on the top of the wall and after a few wriggles i succeed in working my body upwards and after a short glance over the wall to see where i will drop i land myself at the other side perfectly sound in wind and limb i soon find the door by which we entered the mansion the previous night 
and finding it open i take the liberty of entering the vestibule and there making a slight demonstration which has the desired effect for in a moment mr careero and several japanese appear upon the scene where have you sprung from asked careero in great astonishment from the Emont and nealance is at the gate waiting to come in i reply careero explains to the japs the position of nealance and in a very short space of time he is released from his anxious position and brought in to the mansion we are conducted by careero to his own room where nealance fully details the whole occurrences that have transpired on board the Emont in the course of the day how have you two managed to get here if they won't allow a boat to come on shore queries careero we swam ashore and then dressed on the beach about a quarter of a mile from here replies nealance rather risky is it not says careero for there are some japs watching the Emont between here and the settlement we did not come that side replies nealance for as soon as we saw the fellows on watch we made tracks to the eastward you were not afraid of sharks seemingly says careero i don't think there can be any here replies nealance they don't generally come into landlocked waters do you intend swimming back again queries careero yes sir replies nealance we promise to be back before one o'clock in the morning and if we are not there the captain will be coming on shore with an armed party to look for us you will have to go then says careero for we cannot risk having any disturbance as yet help yourselves to something to drink while i go and have a talk with the japs says careero as he leaves the room seems as if there were some negotiations going on at which we are not to be present says nealance as soon as we are left alone rather i ejaculate in reply and it seems to me there are a good many more japs here to-night than there were last night i hope we shall be allowed to land and have a look at their city before we leave says nealance so do i i reply and musingly add to that reply if you are game i don't see why we could not act the japanese for a night and have a walk round their important township a agreed says nealance adding i don't imagine careero would leave us in the lurch even if we did get into a hobble no i am sure not for i rather think we are useful to him and he seems to be deeply interested in getting this country opened out i reply our conversation comes to a close by the entrance of the gentleman we have been discussing the very very old adage about absent personages again proving true in this instance i hope you have enjoyed yourselves during my absence says careero but the fact of the matter is i have got some of the friendly japs here to-night as well as some of those who are fanatically dead against us and these i suppose will want their price however i have got permission for the captain to come on shore and visit me here to-morrow on the ground of my ill health don't laugh for i have told them we have no other doctor but the captain i have explained all in this letter he goes on to say to us and i suppose you will be able to carry it off to the captain without letting the sharks get a hold of it have another drop of brandy to keep the cold out and i will see you out of the gate three half-glasses of pale brandy are soon put out of sight then following our leader in a very short space of time we find ourselves on the outer side of the walls that enclose this solitary mansion end of section seven Section 8 of Among Typhoons and Pirate Craft by Lindsay Anderson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 8, Chapters 22 through 24. Chapter 22 We Make a Daylight Visit to the Shore. Good night, Nealance. Good night, Anderson. Try and keep my letter dry, and be careful how you get back on board if you have any bother come back here immediately and i will stand the racket 
so says careero as we shake his hand and take our way back to the brushwood to undress and prepare for our watery travel back to the Emont. the first clump of bushes we come across are utilized as a dressing-room for the purpose of disrobing ourselves as soon as we have got our suit of clothes tied up in pieces of oilcloth we leave the cover of the brushwood and betake ourselves to the water like a pair of veritable water dogs the pair of us being as much at home in the water as on land we were not long in fetching the emont after we had got away from the beach there were no sharks in the harbour that night neither were there on watch any emissaries of the old aristocracy of this country who were the enemies of progress or else they could easily have made short work of us had they been so minded or been imbued with the crafty intelligence that obtains amongst the monarchical aristocracy of christian nations swimming noiselessly up to the rope ladder hanging over the taffrail of the emont and then climbing up in the same noiseless manner we are eagerly welcomed back by the captain and mr jule who have been waiting anxiously for our return not a word quietly ejaculates the captain till you have rubbed yourselves dry and got inside of another suit of clothes forgetting for the moment that we were attired in adam's suit couldn't have a better suit on than we have for the night's work says nealance with a laugh which is fully endorsed by the captain and mr jule although the suit approved by nealance is probably the best for an aquatic journey neither of us were very loath to go to our cabins and put in practice the injunctions of the captain regarding our apparel before proceeding to his cabin nealance opens his oil silk covered parcel and delivers to the captain mr careero's important letter having got inside of another suit of clothing we take our way to the saloon where the captain and mr jule are waiting to hear an account of our night's work nealance relates to them all our proceedings and then the captain tells us somewhat of the contents of the communication we had brought him from mr careero which amounts to little more than permission for him to proceed on shore in the character of a medico our conference is short and the good-night cup is swallowed and we are all glad to retire to our cabins and court the repose that is necessary to restore the energies of our craniums to their proper equilibrium after the usual morning's work of cleaning polishing and brightening comes to a close the emont as on the previous day is gaily arrayed with bunting from stem to stern the four japanese boats are still lying at anchor on our quarters and bows carefully watching all our proceedings the one high official who seemed to be in authority over them on the previous day had shortly after sunrise come off and made a tour of inspection as well as spent some little time in conversation with the officials in the boats ah shing at the request of the captain tries his persuasive powers of oratory on this high official in order to induce him to come on board but all his efforts are in vain he is not to be seduced from his fealty to the party whose interests he is commissioned to look after as soon as breakfast is over one of our cutters is put in the water and brought to the gangway ladder a picked crew of ten of our best men armed with revolvers are chosen to man the cutter nealance taking the place of coxswain and i the position of bowman the captain ah shing and one of the shroffs have taken their places in the stern sheets we shove off from the side of the emont and pull away in the direction of mr careero's residence the officials in the guard boats take no notice of us and we reach the shore without interference on their part but as soon as we get to the landing we are confronted by several japs dressed and armed in a similar manner to the officials in the watching boats who intimate to the captain through our interpreter ah shing that only four persons are to be allowed to land very good says the captain in reply to ah shing's interpreted communication nealance you remain in charge of the boat and anderson will come along with me and ah shing and the shroff having some knowledge of the house and its surroundings i accordingly lead the way 
as soon as we have passed from the cutter to terra firma and acting on the captain's instructions instead of leading our party to the side gate where i had previously found ingress i take the way round to the front entrance the residents in the mansion had no doubt been well aware of our approach for when we arrive at the principal entrance we are met on the threshold by careero our two japanese passengers and several other distinguished and imposing-looking japanese salaams and genuflections innumerable are performed as the captain is introduced all round much the same performance having to be gone through over the introduction of ah shing while a lesser degree of courtesy is extended towards the shroff and i who bring up the rear entering the mansion the captain and ah shing are conducted to the private apartments occupied by careero where his state of health is no doubt adequately diagnosed while at the same time some more important matters are discussed the schroff and i are left on duty in an anteroom adjoining there to await the orders of our superiors careero's conference with the captain and ah shing having been concluded they take their way to another apartment where the japanese are assembled a lengthy conference is carried on there and my companion the schroff is called in no doubt to act as secretary or otherwise the sun has crossed the foreyard before the conference comes to a close and we are ready to take our departure before taking our departure the captain and careero urgently endeavour to persuade some of the principal japs to go off and lunch on board the eamont but to no purpose seemingly they all have a dread of being seen in our company outside the stone walls of the mansion unsuccessful in getting any of the japs to accompany us on board the captain takes his leave in much the same formal manner as when he entered the mansion and then accompanied by the schroff and i takes his way to the boat leaving ah sheng to assist careero in the work he has in hand chapter twenty three the captain suggests a visit to nagasaki we arrive back on board the eamont without being interfered with in the slightest degree so that the opposition to our landing and having free intercourse with the people cannot be of a very aggressive nature when the captain reaches the deck i hear him say to mr jule don't hoist the boat up let her lie at the boom till after lunch as soon as we are seated at the luncheon table and the first pangs of the inward man satisfied the captain proceeds to narrate for our delectation the substance of the forenoon's conference with the japs and careero as far as i can make out says the captain after his narration of the conference has come to a close we will simply have to make an effort ourselves by going on shore on some errand and see whether they will allow us into their city or not for these fellows might keep on talking for ever now again says the captain i have told careero that we are in need of fresh beef and he and i have come to the conclusion that it will be a very good opportunity to go on shore and buy some beef or failing that a live bullock which can soon be made into beef when we get him on board what do you think of the plan asked the captain very good indeed is our assenting reply well then resumes the captain mr nealance you and anderson will go on shore with the same armed boat's crew and land at the main landing which i will point out to you when we go on deck and then you will take half the boat's crew up the town with you leaving the coxswain in charge of the boat to wait some distance off the landing till you return when you have landed in the city you must just look round till you come across a butcher's shop or a live animal that will make beef don't do anything to hurt the feelings of the inhabitants and pay well for anything you take i will give you plenty of dollars and if they won't take the money lay it down close to where you have taken your goods from if the natives object to our proceedings we are to take what we can lay our hands on whether or not i presume says nealance with a laugh as he winks at me that will depend upon the amount of force they bring to bear upon you to enforce their objections says the captain adding i will leave you to judge of that for yourselves 
but i may as well tell you you are not to quarrel with them willingly but rather to sheer off if there should be any organized force brought to bear against you by any official-looking personages like those fellows in the boats how are we going to explain to them what we require asked nealance the schroff will go with you and although he don't understand much of their language still his chinee may be nearer the mark of their understanding than your english replies the captain you see again says the captain those japs that careero is in tow with keep on telling him that we will not be allowed to enter the city for the purpose of trading and also that the people are dead against us and will neither take our money nor will they supply us with anything so to test the truth of their allegations you are going to try and purchase some article we are very much in need of as i take it none of you are too fond of salt provisions all right sir says nealance i think we will manage to palaver them into supplying us with the necessary article if we have plenty of dollars for i have never seen the genus homo yet whose eyes would not glisten or his mouth water over a pile of mexicans especially in eastern lands that is no doubt all very well with indians and chinamen says the captain but these people seem to be a different race altogether from any we have had dealings with before so be very wary and polite for their swords are sharp and as each man carries two of these weapons he is like a double-armed man but whether they are clever in the use of their weapons or not i don't know yet the captain having thus carefully put us on our guard regarding our duty to the inhabitants ordered the schroff to take with him one hundred of the newest and brightest mexican dollars he had in his possession and accompany us into the boat as soon as nealance and i have got our fighting harness on and supplied ourselves with a goodly amount of revolver ammunition we take our way on deck and instruct the boatswain to pipe the cutter to the gangway with the same armed boat's crew to man her as were in her during our forenoon visit to the shore while the boat is being got ready the captain comes on deck and points out the particular place where we are to land which is near the eastern end of the bight which forms a kind of inner harbour at the northern end of this large and capacious roadstead or inner gulf be wary is the last injunction we receive from the captain as we go over the side and take our places in the boat where the cashier or schroff is already seated looking as miserable as if he were going to an execution nealance and i as well as our boat's crew are still in the rosy realms of bright and hopeful youth and as far as our faces can be read as a token of what may be passing within you would imagine we were bound away on some pleasant picnicking expedition instead of being about to land as unwelcome intruders amongst a people who had succeeded i may say since the world began in keeping themselves secluded from the whole world around them always excepting the one or two favoured hollanders who however had never got any farther than a mere look at the city not having been endowed with the persevering and encroaching intelligence that generally accompanies the landing of a british subject on any portion of the terra firma that constitutes the world had any of our countrymen been on such a friendly footing with the japs as to be able to get them to accept of a present of a yacht that country would have been as much anglicized at the time i am writing of as it is now for they have proved themselves a very apt nation in the adoption of all the benefits that accrue from advanced civilization whether they are a happier people for discarding the ignorance and innocence which obtained amongst them when we forced ourselves upon them is a question they can best answer for themselves but there is this to be said for them as a nation they have rapidly and for the most part willingly adopted the manners and customs of the dominant races and thus unlike other aboriginal races they have not been improved from off the face of the earth to make way for those whom our philosophers term the fittest and who alone have the right to survive 
only a few days ago in this year one thousand eight hundred and ninety one of the christian era i was taking a ramble round the docks of this the greatest maritime city in the world when to my great wonderment i came across a large number of japanese seamen who had just been landed from one of the many steamers that regularly ply between that fast advancing nation and this country officers and men were all dressed in the most approved style of naval uniform similar to that which is worn in our own royal navy with very slight exception and which would be quite unnoticeable to the eyes of any landsman their dress and appearance and possibly their intelligence gave them the look of man of war's men but it seemed to me as i stood and watched them for a few minutes that there was a great want of the stamina and robustness that usually distinguishes our own naval men and the thought readily suggested itself to me that possibly the japanese authorities sent all their most diminutive people to sea and kept those of larger stature such as i had often seen in the days i am writing of to protect as soldiers their now much more important nation chapter twenty four we visit nagasaki town be wary is the last injunction that proceeds from the lips of our commander as we shove off from the side of the emont and take our way for the first time towards the principal landing place in the harbour of nagasaki ten minutes smart pulling and our cutter is run alongside the bottom step of the landing in the most approved style that obtains amongst well-trained coxswains the landing is a fairly well-built structure of hard stone having some twelve or fourteen steps somewhere about fifteen feet lengthways by nine inches in depth and one foot in breadth leading up to a gate-like archway through which we have to pass in order to enter the city when we arrive at this landing we find it well guarded with stout-looking formidable japs arrayed in a similar garb to that of the officials who had been so carefully watching us from their guard boats since our arrival in the harbour those officials on duty at the landing were armed with two swords in like manner to those already mentioned and here is also in the guard boats firearms of any sort were either still unknown to them or under prohibition for none were visible to our keen and searching glance we do not linger to gaze upon these sturdy-looking warriors but taking in the situation at a glance nealance and i followed up by four of our men jump from the cutter to the landing and take our way up the steps the boat at the same time pushing off from the landing and taking up a position some few yards off nealance and i taking the lead walk up the steps followed by our men passing through the ranks of these soldiers if such they were in a most solemn and determined manner i think we are rather surprised when we meet with no hindrance to our proceedings but are only looked at by these guardians of the landing in a curiously blended inspection of sternness and stoical indifference we raise our caps to two of the officials at the archway who are by their appearance and richness of attire of some higher rank than the others but they take no notice of our salute and only give us a stare of austere indifference their looks don't hurt us much and we are not prevented from proceeding on our errand by the austerity of their manner in receiving strangers up through the city lanes and streets we take our way no one interferes with us neither do any of the inhabitants take much more interest in us than a momentary stare of a very slightest wonderment their habitations are for the most part built of stone and as the window-glass is seemingly unknown to them or perhaps highly taxed as it once was in our own land we are able to see the interior of their dwellings almost whether we will or not after wandering through the streets for some time we come across a shop where we see cigars exposed for sale and attempt to make a purchase we had left the shroff behind in the boat with the bag of dollars till such time as we could spot what we were in search of therefore we had some difficulty in getting this japanese cigar merchant to understand us 
i have often observed that our british seamen when on any foreign station throughout the civilized world or the uncivilized have but one appellation for any of the genus homo whom they may come in contact with so my dear reader you will not be astonished when i tell you that mr nealance began his first conversation in japan by addressing this shopman by the universal title of johnny johnny says mr nealance addressing this japanese shopman and at the same time holding up before his gaze a couple of shining mexican dollars me wanchi cigari for smoky and as he finishes his request he points to the article required the japanese shopman shakes his head in the negative and waves the open palm of his hand across his chest in that peculiar style mankind in general adopt when they wish to be rid of any one or to close any conversation nealance won't understand him however and therefore doubles the amount of dollars but all to no purpose he still shakes his head and hands as if he would like to be rid of us passing on to a street higher up we come across another dealer in the fragrant weed with whom we endeavor to make a trade you try him this time anderson says nealance johnny says i in my suavest tone of voice while at the same time i also hold up a couple of mexican dollars want ye smoky then i imitate with my hand and mouth the motion we perform as we inhale the inspiration of the fragrant weed this shopman has an eye to business and is seemingly inclined to trade he takes the dollars out of my hand to look at them and as he does so i lift the box of cigars from the stand in the glassless window while this japanese shopman is satisfying himself as to the genuineness of the mexican dollars nealance takes up another box and lays down two dollars also which are taken up by the shopman as he is in the act of placing his four dollars into his purse two japanese official-looking personages are noticed coming along the street both armed in the usual two-sorted manner as soon as this shopman spies these officials of the two swords coming in our direction he pushes the four dollars back into my hand and motions for us to take our departure from his door he will not allow us to return the cigars and as he is seemingly in great trepidation at the advent on the scene of these two officials we take our departure along the street much to his evident relief these two officials pass us by with the same indifferent stare as all the others have done and we see them stand and question the shopman anent his dealings with us there is no chance of us getting back to remunerate the shopman for they take their stand close to his premises and we are perforce compelled to walk away in some other direction as we walk along the streets we come to what seems a hall or public building with many openings in its walls in the shape of windows and like all the other buildings an entire absence of glass or any kind of screen our visit being one of exploration we do not hesitate to avail ourselves of a look within the interior of this public building from out of and into which we observe numerous inhabitants of both sexes coming and going and all alike arrayed in the scantiest of attire looking through the screenless windows into the interior of this building we find to our amazement that it is the public bathing-place of the inhabitants and here before our very eyes we see men and women in their nudest innocence disporting themselves in this miniature lake of water with all the joyousness born of paradisical innocence the bathers took but little notice of us and were in no way abashed at our wondering stare of absorbment the scene had come across our vision so unexpectedly and was withal so much different from our close separation of the sexes under such circumstances that we may be excused for the rapt absorbment of our first gaze when we came to our senses after our astonished gaze on such a primeval scene we turn away blushing as if we had been caught stealing a glimpse at the veritable three graces when adorning themselves to join in the escort of the mythical bacchus 
did you ever see anything like that queries nealance never i replied i have read of some such scenes in books but in all my wanderings this is the first time i have seen such an exquisite scene of primitive innocence some of the women are as fair as our own countrywomen says nealance and none of them are really darker than the maidens of italy or andalusia what a scene for a painter to put upon his canvas i remark especially to lay before that portion of our civilized europe who cynically believe and hold forth to their fellows that the finality of innocence came to an end in the garden of eden we do not proceed any further into the city but take our way leisurely back in the direction of the landing-place all the time keeping a sharp lookout for anything in the shape of butcher meat when we get about halfway back to the landing we are rewarded by the sight of a nice young bullock standing in the courtyard of what might be a dairy so much has it the resemblance of one of those milk caravansaries that are to be found in our own large cities we walk up the courtyard and have a good survey of the bullock and find he is just the very animal we have been looking for all the afternoon we halloo a great deal and make as much noise as we decently can in order to bring some one out of the mansion in the courtyard of which we have found our animal but all to no purpose no one ventures forth that we can bargain with for the purchase of the animal so nealance turns to me and says anderson if you will take a couple of hands down to the boat and bring that shroff and the money up here i will watch here and see that no one removes the bullock till you come back all right i reply as i set off with my men to the landing-place we have no difficulty in finding it for here at any rate the streets and lanes are mostly in straight lines and parallels the guards take no heed of me as i walk to the bottom of the steps and after getting into the boat induce the shroff by means of some forcible eloquence to adjourn to the shore and bring the bag of dollars with him however unwilling the shroff may have been to pass through the lines of guards at the landing-place i had no sooner got him through the archway and rejoined my two men than all the ancient bravery of his race returned to him and he was now quite capable of encountering the direst enemy of the human race when we got back to the courtyard where i had left nealance we found him and his two men still watching by the animal have you seen any one yet i asked of nealance not a living creature is the reply of nealance then he says to the shroff here mr shroff see if you can't talky talky some japanese and that dory so can bring men out sell bullock the shroff walks up to the door and makes some talk in japanese mixed with pidgin english and chinee but his efforts like ours are in vain no one comes forth to sell the bullock or in any manner interest themselves in our proceedings how much do you think the animal is worth anderson asked nealance five ten or fifteen dollars over in china i reply but what is it worth here in this new country where they will not take money nor buy nor sell i don't know well we are going to take him on board at any rate to make him into fresh beef and if i leave five and twenty dollars in the yard for him he will be well paid for so said mr nealance and of course i entirely concurred with this arrangement cast him adrift from the wall and lead him away to the boat says nealance to our men while at the same time he places the sum of twenty-five dollars in bright new mexicans on the ground close to where the bullock was tied to the wall as soon as we proceed to lead our captive away out of the yard the first approach to human life in the mansion makes its appearance in the doorway in the shape of a young and lovely maiden fair to look upon as a summer's dream and possibly verging on the teen that poets have so often dubbed as sweet she was dressed in the mantle our first mother wore in the garden of eden if we are to believe the many artists who have delineated on their canvas through all the ages the slender raiment that was necessary for the female adornment in those antediluvian days this young lady of japan looked on at our proceedings without showing by her countenance the least sign of astonishment 
and as nealance and i turned out of the courtyard in rear of our men we raised our hats and salaamed in our most gracious style but this fair maid of japan made no responsive obeisance to our polite attentions down through the streets of nagasaki we proceed with our bullock in tow most of the inhabitants as we passed along took just sufficient time for a look then passed on as unconcerned as possible and so without any hindrance we arrived at the landing-place where we walked the bullock down the steps and into the water when the boat came alongside the bullock was made fast to the stern ring-bolt then we all took our places in the boat and put off for the emont the soldiers on guard looking on all the time but saying nothing only just leaving us very very severely alone a quarter of an hour brings us back on board the emont the bullock is hoisted on board and in half an hour's time legs and shoulders of prime fresh beef are seen hanging to the rack of the galley the boat is hoisted in and as it is close on dinner time when we get back the captain reserves the relation of our adventures till we are seated at the dinner table end of section eight Section 9 of Among Typhoons and Pirate Craft by Lindsay Anderson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 9, Chapters 25 through 27. Chapter 25 Another Visit After Dark to Careeros. Now then, gentlemen, says the captain, addressing Nealance and I at the dinner table after the second course had been disposed of let us hear an account of your afternoon proceedings i allow nealance the right of precedence and accordingly he fires away in his most logical and graphic style coming to the episode of the cigars mr jule remarks it's a grand country this and a fine place for bargains especially when they won't take your money from you well you can have a trip on shore to-morrow to accustom the inhabitants to our visits says the captain to mr jule and while you are there you can bring back the twenty-five dollars left on the ground for the bullock if you can find them i am afraid there will be little chance of the dollars i remark for i expect that fair young damsel was not long in picking them up when our backs were fairly turned not a doubt of it says the captain and i'll warrant in less than three months they will be as keen after the dollars as any chinaman when nealance comes to describe the scene we beheld at the place we took to be the public baths the captain looks at mr jule to see if he is taking in our tale then with an incredulous wink at nealance and i he says there that will do now nealance i know you can stretch a bit on occasions but i did not think you could imagine either mr jule or your commander as going to take that in nealance and i stick to the truth of our assertions which has the effect of making the captain ask of us if the mikado had not been treating us to some delusive wine now anderson says the captain addressing me is not nealance trying to draw on our imagination when he tells us of men and women fair as italians or spaniards all swimming about in a bath together no sir i reply it is bona fide truth and you can easily prove it by going and seeing for yourself the people don't seem to care anything about you looking at them for they took no notice of us and then besides that you can't help seeing them in their houses in the same fashionable attire unless you keep your eyes shut as you go along how is that queries the captain they have not learned what eve discovered when she ate the forbidden fruit therefore they have no need of window glass or screens to hide themselves replies nealance i suppose we must believe you says the captain but mr jule you and i will have to get on shore and have a glimpse of this primeval innocence before the light of civilization comes to them and they get their eyes opened to the knowledge that came to the human race by eating of the tree of knowledge 
i should like very much to see their ways of living says mr jule for they seem different from any of the new peoples i have come across if we could only talk to them we might find out that they were more civilized in a better sense than we are having only the knowledge of the good that was in the tree only got half of it you mean laughingly suggests the captain well they will soon get the other half now if this treaty they are making with the outside world comes to be an accomplished fact is the dinghy ready mr jewel asks the captain can have her at the gangway in five minutes replies mr jewel let her be brought there as quietly as possible says the captain and nealance and anderson will pull me ashore to careero's mr jewel takes his departure to the deck and nealance and i proceed to our cabin to make ready for the shore when we reach the deck the dinghy is at the ladder and we step down and take the places of the two men who have brought her there as soon as the captain has taken his place in the stern sheets we shove off and pull easily away in the direction of careero's watching the while for any action that might be taken by any of the boats that are so carefully watching the Emot. the same indifference to our proceedings is observed by the officials in the boats as was shown to us by all the officials we met during our visit to the city in the afternoon we are left severely alone and so arrive at the careero mansion without any interference from watchers on the sea or on the land we secure the dinghy to some brushwood and then follow the captain at his request to the mansion we are received at the vestibule by careero and several japs who have evidently been on the lookout for our coming after many salaams we all take our way to the inner room and nealance has again to describe the proceedings of our afternoon's visit to the shore which is duly interpreted to the japs by ah shing and careero i thought as much i hear careero say to the captain the men who have a stake in the country are about equally divided for throwing it open in fact the throwing open party are in the majority i believe and of course all the officials take their cue from the party they expect to predominate i suppose there is no reason why i should not make a visit to the city and see for myself some of the wondrous institutions of this new country says the captain by way of a feeler to careero none that i am aware of replies careero and i would willingly go with you only i have so much to do teaching the obstinate party or at any rate the members who influence that section of the inhabitants who are brought here about all the great advantages that will come to them in opening up their country to outside trade especially the british have you ever been in the city careero asked the captain i have been farther than the city laughingly replies careero but i was so like a jap at the time no one took the slightest notice of me except my own especial friends i suppose you are all ready for sea asked careero of the captain at any moment you like replies the captain how long will it take you to run over to shanghai or ningpo and be back here again stopping possibly a couple of days at either place asks careero ten days replies the captain after thinking the subject over for five minutes very good says careero now i will have a talk with the japs and i will be able to tell you when you will sail careero ah shing and the japs now resolve themselves into a committee of discussion in a language that is quite unintelligible to us sea rovers although by the frequent looks that are extended towards the captain nealance and i we are seemingly forming a part of their interesting disquisition not being able to assist in the deliberations through our ignorance of their language we console ourselves for this grievous loss of utility by endeavouring to kill the time in the agreeable enjoyment of special havanas and sparkling moselle which the captain orders for our special behoof like all deliberations this also gradually drew to an end and as the speakers finished what they had to say they like other great and mighty speakers felt a dryness in their throats that drew them towards our side table as a needle is drawn towards the attracting magnet as soon as the discussion is closed careero takes his place beside the captain and i hear him say 
well captain i think you had better leave to-morrow night after dark as you will have to take two japs back with you who don't wish to be seen leaving the country all right replies the captain dark or daylight is all the same to us when will the japs be ready to be smuggled on board asks the captain oh, nine or ten o'clock to-morrow night replies careero then we will say good night and be off to our quarters to put in some sleep for the coming night says the captain as we rise from the table careero comes to the door with us after we have salaamed to the japs and before he says good night he says to the captain are you still of the same mind about going on shore oh yes replies the captain i must really go and have a look at this earthly paradise these two officers of mine have been telling me about well captain says careero don't ridicule them too much to let them see it and beware of the ladies with black teeth for these are already appropriated for life and a japanese sword is a sharp weapon good night captain good night all mind how you get back and have a boat here at eight to-morrow night please with this parting admonition we take our departure for the boat and careero retires within the mansion to rejoin his diplomatic coadjutors chapter twenty six a second visit to nagasaki where we find another bullock the captain nealance and i found our way to the dinghy with very little trouble and as the night was moonless and dark we succeeded in reaching the emont without being disturbed by any night watchers mr jewel received us at the gangway and one of our sentries quietly moved the dinghy astern for the night after the captain had issued his instructions for the coming day to mr jewel he wished us all good night and retired to his cabin then as soon as we had related to our brother officer the proceedings that had transpired on shore we also took our way to our cabins and retired to rest at breakfast the following morning the captain intimates to mr jewel and me his desire for us to accompany him on his visit to the shore therefore as soon as our morning meal is dispatched mr jewel passes over his executive duties into the hands of mr nealance and then proceeds to array himself in suitable shore-going attire the same cutter and crew as yesterday is brought to the gangway into which the captain mr jewel and i take our places and pulling with a real admiral-like stroke take our way towards the principal landing-place of the port the landing is guarded as on the previous day but no attempt is made to stop us as we leave the boat and pass through the lines of guards followed by four of the boat's crew we raise our hats to the officers of the guard in the archway in the usual saluting style as we pass them but receive no response of acknowledgment farther than a fixed stoical kind of stare the courteous manners of western civilization had seemingly not yet been imported into this far eastern land with my experience of the previous day still fresh in my mind i was of course appointed leader of our party by captain gulliver and told by him to take a similar route to that of yesterday in order to see if there were another bullock to be had or give mr jewel a chance to pick up the dollars we left in the courtyard as the price of our animal we found the courtyard in due course as we proceeded through the city but there were neither bullocks nor dollars to be seen anywhere about never mind now says the captain to me when i return to the gate of the courtyard and report my fruitless quest but look out for this place as we come down to the boat for we have perhaps called at the wrong time of day we accordingly wend our way farther into the city and experience the same kind of stoical nonchalant treatment as on the previous day no one interferes with us and we are allowed to look and gaze if so inclined on all the peculiarities of life as it is to be found in this hitherto unknown land we do not endeavour to make any purchases for we have a disagreeable feeling that we are being carefully watched by the two sorted officials although they contrive to keep at a respectable distance we have a look at the bass in order to appease the incredulity of the captain and mr jewel who turn away with the blushing faces of western innocence at the door of a buddhist-like temple 
we remain for a few minutes but the priests in their yellow robes look upon us with such forbidding aspect that we are fain to take our departure from the precincts of their sacred edifice here and there as we passed through the streets we could observe numbers of the fair sex whose teeth were stained to a beautiful brownish black and as most of these ladies had grown out of their teens we took this to be the symbol of wedlock that obtained in this country i had taken little notice of this peculiarity on the previous day for i had seen so many females in india whose teeth were stained a reddish brown consequent on chewing a betel nut that it seemed a matter of course that these ladies should likewise be fond of that dainty pastime the remarks of mr careero anent the ladies with black teeth had stimulated me to take a somewhat closer look at this peculiarity in feminine adornment and i could easily discern that this beautiful brown-black stain was produced by something superior to betel-nut or the mastication of any root i had ever seen in use amongst the natives of india there was no danger of mistaking another man's wife here or even a lady who was engaged as we were given to understand that the process of teeth japanning commenced as soon as they were engaged to the man of their choice this custom of japanning the betrothed one's teeth might well have been copied by many nations of the west for no doubt it would be the means of saving many a heartbreak as well as preventing many scandals which have of necessity broken up the homes and families of many who in a time of passionate forgetfulness have forgotten for the moment to whom they really belonged and to whom this conspicuous sign or symbol might have been sole salvation a walk through the streets of two hours duration is as much as the captain can stand so we retrace our steps towards the landing on being refused admission to the temple as we pass the courtyard where we took the bullock from on the preceding day we are rather agreeably surprised to find a somewhat similar animal secured to the wall in the like manner as on the previous afternoon how many dollars have you got mr jewel are the first words of the captain as soon as he spies the bullock twelve replies mr jewel and you anderson asks the captain of me ten sir i reply all right then says the captain here are another ten from me that makes thirty-two now anderson let us see how you buy cattle in this country i accordingly call up two of our men and desire them to cast the animal adrift then i lay down the thirty-two dollars and give a shout through the aperture in the wall of the house to apprise those within of our impudent robbery the bullock is taken down to the boat in charge of our men but although the captain mr jewel and i remain at the entrance of the courtyard some fifteen or twenty minutes no one comes from within to lift the money or make any sign that they are cognizant of what is taking place we are therefore reluctantly compelled to take our way down to the boat somewhat dissatisfied with the non-completion of the arcadian picture that had been vouchsafed for the gaze of nealance and i on the preceding day walking briskly down to the landing we come up with our men at the archway in time to pass them and the bullock through the two lines of guardians who watch our proceedings with stoical indifference as soon as we get our captive secured to the stern ring-bolt we push off from the landing and in a few brisk strokes of the oars we are once more alongside the emont the bullock is hoisted on board the boat is passed out to the boom end the hands are piped to dinner and we of the afterguard proceed to divest ourselves of our shore-going apparel before sitting down to lunch while lunch is being prepared the captain calls two of the shroffs on deck and intimates to them his desire for the company of the officials in the watching boats at luncheon the shroffs accordingly enter into conversation with the officials in the boats and tell them of the captain's polite request whereupon one of the boats lifts her moorings and makes the round of the other boats holding a short parley with each which ends in their acceptance of the captain's invitation one by one the boats come alongside and deposit the officials on board then take up their places as before to maintain their careful watch 
is there anything necessary on hand this afternoon mr jewel asked the captain no sir replies the chief officer we are ready for sea at a moment's notice very well says the captain then let the hands have this afternoon below as soon as they have turned that bullock into beef for we shall want them the most part of the night ay ay sir replies mr jewel as he proceeds forward to acquaint the boatswain with the captain's instructions we spend fully two hours over this exciting lunch and before the japs return to their boats we have cordially fraternized as well as sworn lifelong brotherhood if not in very intelligible language at any rate it has been well emphasized by signs and hobnobbings that ought to bring it home to the very densest of human arcadians as each boat comes alongside at the close of the repast to receive the officials a goodly quantity of provisions is deposited in each for the behoof of the boat's crew of rowers a bottle or two of the aqua vitae of holland being added thereto to give zest to their appetites an armed watch is then set on board the Emont, so that those who are in need of repose to prepare for the night's work may retire to their cabins and court the fair restorer of the mind and brain sweet and balmy sleep chapter twenty seven making wu ah ching pay up three bells sir i hear the quartermaster say at my door on which i jump up and make known to him that i am again in the realms of wakeful consciousness we do not take the proverbial half hour to dress for dinner in these days although our dinners are well worth the preparation of a table d'hote toilette we lived in such exciting times then every day of our lives bringing some new and sharp surprises that it was necessary for us to keep up the sharpest disciplinary vigilance of mind and body in order to keep pace with our surroundings and never be seen to lag in less than ten minutes mr jewel nealance and i are on deck our toilettes complete for dinner or for service whichever it might be we are soon joined by the captain who instructs nealance to select a boat's crew for the evening's enterprise and then consults with mr jewel the best way of slipping out of the harbour without drawing the attention of the watching boats so that they may imagine in the morning that we have been spirited away by some unknown development the coming night's work having been carefully planned out we then sit down to dinner to fortify the inward man which is sometimes a very necessary proceeding the neglect of which has often entailed the non-success of many well-planned enterprises nealance says the captain when the third course has made its appearance do you think you and anderson can bring these japs off in the dinghy yes sir replies nealance if they don't have too much luggage bring them without their luggage says the captain or at any rate with as little as they can do with for a matter of ten or eleven days is ah ching coming back asks nealance no fear replies the captain with a smile not for a year or two then he asks looking at nealance and i but what do you want to know for has he not redeemed his promise for getting him out of shanghai never a bit sir replies nealance speaking for us both well in that case you had better fix him to-night says the captain if you can we'll fix him right enough says nealance now that we have got your permission the night is dark and gloomy the wind is moderate and in the most favourable direction that could be desired for the success of the evening's enterprise punctually at eight p m nealance and i arrive at the residence of mr careero in the dinghy quite up to time says careero as he comes to the door to receive us and we are all ready for you one moment please says nealance to careero i would like a word with you in private this way then please says careero as he leads us towards an anteroom as soon as we are safe within the room and clear of ah ching's intrusion nealance explains for the benefit of careero our intention regarding wu ah ching in order to get him to prove his gratitude in some more solid manner than empty forms and phrases of eternal friendship careero is scarcely able to restrain his laughter as nealance propounds his scheme but being of a liberal turn of mind himself 
as was well known not only to us but to many of our countrymen who were then located in the far east in quest of that article which is found so necessary to make up the happiness of human life money i suppose you will want my assistance queries careero if you please answers nealance you can help us by only appearing helpless in the matter very good says careero now i will send for him and i dare say you will get from his fears what you would never get out of him through any feeling of gratitude for he dearly loves the dollars in the course of a few minutes ah ching is ushered into the room and when he recognizes who we are that are waiting specially for him he comes forward in his usual bland and childlike manner to greet us nealance whom i allow to take the lead receives the advances of ah ching in his most dignified and solemn style which has the effect of bringing our chinese friend to a halt as it were and causes him to look with an expression of inquiry into the faces of careero and myself as if in search of an answer to the peculiar form of his reception by nealance he has scarcely time for more than a look at our solemn visages when nealance opens the ball by saying i have the captain's instructions to bring you back on board of the eamont ah ching so the sooner you pack up your traps and come along the sooner we will be able to leave the harbour me go backy shanghai says ah ching in evident consternation his countenance having at the same time changed from its usual yellow to a pale and almost death-like hue i no want ye go back me stoppy here with messy careero and he looks at careero as if he wished him to back up his assertion but no reassuring glance is seen on the calm stolid face of careero it is of no use appealing to careero says nealance he cannot help you and let me tell you if you are not ready in half an hour i will bring the men up from the boat and carry you down i have the captain's instructions to fetch you and you know our style of doing business well enough what for captain wants me go back queries ah shing in almost tearful tone the captain very much afraid replies nealance he get plenty trouble with the tootai of shanghai for taking you away so he want she takee you back to the tootai suppose have too much bother missy careero you can no helpy me queries ah shing with his most appealing glance and very despairing tone i can't do anything replies careero then in an aside to ah shing he whispers in his ear try some dollars perhaps the captain like dollars all same you ah shing's face clears a little at this but not much the loss of his dollars is seemingly a very sore point with him however he bows to the inevitable after a minute of deep thought and then asks nealance suppose i give captain some dollars he no wanty taking me back perhaps not suppose you give plenty to make good kumsha for the tootai replies nealance how muchy you thinky captain would like asks ah shing i dare say the matter of five thousand dollars replies nealance would settle the whole affair five thousand dollar ejaculates ah shing in heart-rending tones me no got five thousand dollar all one piece nealance shrugs his shoulders and smiles incredulously as he says oh come come now ah shing we all know a little better than that and if your head is not worth more than five thousand dollars to you it is worth a good deal more than that to the two tie so make up your mind at once for there is no time to lose anderson says nealance when he finishes the last argument go down and call the men up from the boat uh, no no shouts ah shing as he clutches hold of my arm i give ye the dollars you letty me speak ye missy careero one little minute all right says nealance only be sharp ah ching and careero hold a whispered conversation in the farthest corner of the room for some five or ten minutes and as far as we can make out by their facial expressions and gestures ah shing is endeavouring to inveigle careero into paying the money for his release careero proves more obdurate than ah shing has bargained for and he reluctantly comes back to nealance to see if he cannot again palaver him over with some slippery promise 
Ushing's face has again changed its expression, and he now puts on an appearance of sweet and innocent blandness, as he asks Nealance, "'Captain takey bill on chop at Shanghai?' "'No, no bill,' replies Nealance. "'Hard dollars, so be quick, for we know well enough you have plenty of them.' Nealance now takes his watch from his pocket, and laying it on the table, says to Ah Ching, "'You see the time there, 8.25.' if the dollars are not here in five minutes anderson calls them up to do their duty seeing no hope of any help coming from careero ah ching leaves the room in a very dejected manner and soon after returns with one of the many boxes of specie which we had landed for him since our arrival cast down and woebegone can scarcely denote the abject condition of our rich miserly and somewhat slippery acquaintance so much so that i can scarcely restrain myself from bursting out into a fit of uncontrollable laughter how much is in the box asks nealance five thousand dollars whines ah shing with quivering lips we must get the lid off and have a look at them says nealance although he knows well enough by the look of the box that it is all right the lid is soon taken off and the different piles counted then nealance assuming a gracious and benevolent manner looks first at me then at ah ching and says well ah ching as you have been pretty generous considering what kind of a man you are you shall have half the box back again and i will try and make it all right with the captain ah ching does not look so much relieved at this offer of nealance as one would have supposed for he shakes his head and says me no carry suppose you make ye all right with the tutai at shanghai all right says nealance as he empties the box of half its contents on to the table and turning to me says carry that lot down to the boat anderson there is enough there for you and me and mr jewel i acquiesce in the arrangements made by nealance on our behalf and carry the box down to the boat then having safely deposited it in the stern sheets i betake myself back to the mansion meeting ah ching in the vestibule i am pleased to see that he is now in the best of humour and apparently in a more friendly mood than he has been since leaving shanghai the revulsion of feeling from that of great dread at the idea of being taken to shanghai to the now satisfactory assurance of perfect safety had indeed provided a wonderful necromancer for his generosity now was seemingly unbounded nothing would please him but that i should accept five hundred of the dollars returned him as a proof of his great regard for me i had perforce to accept of them or else explain the whole of our proceedings so out of this curious dilemma i chose the course most approved of by the world in general he had been no less generous with nealance who had felt himself in a fix whether to accept of his now generous offer or not till careero put his word in by saying take it mr nealance he will never miss it and by the time you come back he will have got over it this little business with ah ching having been thus satisfactorily concluded the real business of the night was forthwith proceeded with nealance and i conveyed the luggage of the japanese down to the dinghy and stowed it away so as to make carrying room for our two passengers then we returned for the dispatch bags and took our leave of careero ah ching and the other inmates of the mansion the two japs who were to accompany us having likewise got through their parting salaams take their departure with us and in a quarter of an hour we have landed them on board the eamont without being observed by any of their countrymen who have been keeping such a strict watch on our proceedings End of section nine. Section 10 of Among Typhoons and Pirate Craft by Lindsay Anderson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 10, Chapters 28 through 30. Chapter 28 From Nagasaki to Wusung. More Pirates. 
the japs and their baggage having been got on board the dinghy is quietly passed along and hoisted on board in a very noiseless manner all hands are called on deck in the same silent mode and the work of unmooring the ship is carefully proceeded with we do not lift our anchor but having unshackled the cable at the forty five the chain is noiselessly walked back on the capstan till the rope that is attached to the unshackled end is in the hawse pipe a buoy rope is then attached to the end link just long enough to keep the buoy about one fathom under the surface of the water when the end of the cable is at the bottom the buoy is lowered into the water and then the end of the cable is lowered to the bottom just as the eamont begins to forge ahead under the pressure of a small awning which had purposely been left hanging up to dry with our night glasses we in vain search for any signs of life or movement in the watching boats but as far as we can make out they are all evidently fast asleep the end of the line attached to the cable slips out of the hawse pipe with prearranged noiselessness the end being lowered into the water by means of a piece of marlin slowly and silently we take our way out of the harbour in order to surprise the inhabitants who had made such a desperate effort to force us out of the place on the first morning of our appearance there a quarter of a mile away from the anchorage we have left and the topsail is set then as we gradually increase our distance from the port sail after sail is spread upon the eamont till she is once more clad in her usual full plain sail by midnight we are clear of the harbour and gradually drawing out from the land into the strength of the monsoon the watches are set and those whose turn it is to seek repose retire below and leave the eamont in the care of mr nealance and his watch when a duty again calls me to the deck i find the eamont in her usual wet and treacherous mood that is if one had a care to keep himself dry and comfortable we are now in the full strength of the monsoon the wind is a point abaft the beam and we have as much of it as she can sit in the water with carrying all plain sail as well as topmast and lower studding sails she is dancing over the white crested waves like a very thing of life and beauty but you have to watch the ever spattering showers of spray for the eamont is no respecter of places or persons and keeps on slinging the water about in every conceivable direction the quarter-deck receiving as goodly a share as the forecastle or the waist passing lightly over the small annoyance of an occasional ducking from the silvery spray there is nothing in this life more enjoyable or exhilarating to the senses than to have the pleasure of bounding over and through the ever glistening waves on board a fast and well-found craft that is propelled by sails alone for in a craft propelled by mechanical agency none of these feelings can be engendered we carry this breeze for nearly forty-eight hours then as we near the coast of china the breeze gradually abates till our speed is reduced from fourteen and fifteen knots an hour to that of eight nine or ten at the most and the latter only when it hauled somewhat more towards the beam we take a more southerly channel than usual when we approach towards wusung in order to avoid if possible coming into conflict with any of the piratical junks who infest the environs of the saddle islands our precautions are however of little avail for some of the piratical fraternity have for some reason or other seen fit to change their cruising ground and when we are within a possible six hours of completing our passage we are met by three large and powerful-looking junks evidently from their movements bent upon our capture or destruction it is early in the forenoon of the fourth day since leaving japan that we descry on our weather-bow these three hostile junks when we first observe them they're heading in a northwest direction close hauled on the starboard tack and seemingly working their way to the northward the breeze has freshened considerably as the day advanced and at the time when we sight the junks we are going along at the rate of twelve knots an hour we of course keep on our course not knowing the character of the junks when they first come into the range of our vision 
but in less than a quarter of an hour we are soon made aware of their hostile intentions by seeing them put their helms up and wear round till they bring the wind on their port quarters then running on a course at a right angle to that which we are steadily pursuing all hands are piped to quarters on board the Eamont. the guns which have been carefully sponged and reloaded the previous afternoon are cast loose and prepared for action the magazine is opened and the small arms are stacked in the racks for instant use while at the same time each man is supplied with a good amount of rifle and revolver ammunition a short and stirring address is made by the captain to the assembled ship's company who are afterwards regaled with a glass of their favourite beverage and dismissed to their stations mr nealance calls out the captain after he has watched the manoeuvring of the junks for some little time get that drag silk laid across the taffrail as soon as you can and have it ready to drop over aye aye sir replies nealance as he dives below with half a dozen of his men to fetch that most important piece of canvas on deck in five minutes time nealance has got the drag cell in readiness and only awaits the orders of the captain to let it fall into the water and bring the eamont to a standstill i am on the forecastle head standing by my long eighteen pound carronade waiting in readiness for the order to fire but the captain makes no sign although we are fast approaching the hostile junks the junks are carrying on all the canvas they can press and are keeping at right angles to our course as if they were afraid we might slip past them reserve your fire the captain shouts till the junks are on the port bow then slap it into them fast and hot mr jewell and i train our guns to port and the men at the port broadside guns stand with trigger line in hand waiting for the coming moment let go your drag so i heard the captain shout to nealance when the three junks are almost within two hundred yards of us brace sharp up and flatten in all is the next order which is executed ere the sound has died out of his voice cut away your drag sail shouts the captain both sides of it and let it go keep her close to the wind my man says the captain to the man at the wheel but clean full don't shake her fire away now my lads let them have it hot and strong shouts the captain in loud stentorian tones the whole three junks are on our port bow they having carried on calculating on the rate of speed we were travelling at and of course not knowing or imagining that the eamont had almost stood still for nearly ten minutes fire away we did and with tolerably good result if one could take the yells and screams of rage that came from the baffled enemy who had never been able to get a shot to bear upon us so eager had they been to get to close quarters and throw some of their suffocating stink pots on board not only the screams of rage and pain but in the dismasting of two of the junks there was good evidence that our shot had not been wasted although three shots from each gun were all that we had time for so fast was the eamont careering away to the northwest under the altered conditions well done my lads i hear the captain shout from the quarter-deck now cease firing run in your guns and make all secure again he continues when the eamont has passed out of the range of her antagonists as soon as the guns are secured mr jewell nealance and i lead all hands aft to the mainmast and we give three times three as lusty cheers for the captain as ever rang across the ocean for to him and his drag sail manoeuvre our success in the encounter was mainly due beautifully done wasn't it bill i hear the men saying one to the other how pretty he walked the eamont into windward of him says another and many more were the eulogistic expressions that fell from the lips of our crew ere the sun set on that eventful day pipe the hands to grog mr jewell says the captain and then set the watch for i think we will fetch Wu soong now without any more bother the captain's health is drunk and the men are dismissed to their quarters the eamont is again kept on her course for her destination and the yards well trimmed to the breeze the junks are nearly out of sight astern making the best of their temerity and no doubt storing up much vengeance in their hearts to spend upon us the next time we foregather on the ocean 
our japanese passengers are very profuse in their acknowledgment of our prowess for possibly they had never seen such a sight before and it would be grand news for them to relate amongst their friends when they returned at five o'clock that afternoon we cross the bar at wusung and ere the sun has sunk behind the western hills the Emont is once more at anchor under the powerful battery of her receiving ship the sails are furled the booms swung out and the boarding nettings triced up the better to keep off the many thieves and others who infest the different ports of the celestial empire the captain's gig is put into the water and he takes his departure for the receiving ship after which mr jewel nealance and i with our two japs sit down and enjoy once more a comfortable dinner for when the Emont was driving through the foam-crested waters it took all your time to hold on to the dish in hand without paying too much attention to those adjuncts of civilized life forks knives and spoons chapter twenty nine to ningpo through the battle of Shinai what do you think of our skirmish to-day asks mr jule of nealance and me as we sit at dinner splendid says nealance that water sail just took in all their calculations they were right across our bow before they knew where they were and then as the fools wore round to bring them in line with us they gave us a nice chance to rake them fore and aft ours was a splendid bit of seamanship i remark and theirs was a huge blunder but i wonder the captain did not stop and sink them especially after two of them were dismasted against orders says mr jule we are only allowed to protect ourselves and we are not supposed to do the work of the royal and imperial navies time is another thing the captain has to consider remarks nealance as well as what might happen to us should a stray shot knock some of our spars away there would be no quarter for any of us should we get disabled and fall into their clutches so it is just as well to keep them out of range we destroyed those other junks on our way up to nishuang i remark in support of my suggestion for the destruction of the junks true enough says nealance but i don't think we would have boarded them had the captain not been sure that they were deserted he may have had permission to tackle them or he may have expected a richer prize than they turned out to be wheels within wheels i remark at which we all burst out laughing much to the amusement of the japs who are dining with us and taking lessons in the etiquette of the western dinner-table by the by says mr jule neither of you have told me how you managed to get ah ching to disgorge simple enough replies nealance i threatened to bring him on board to the captain so that he should be delivered up to the tutai of shanghai to clear us from having any hand in assisting him to escape <laughs> was he much frightened asked mr jule rather replies nealance especially when i told him what an awful pity it would be to see that noble-looking head of his stuck up in a box on the city walls i think the picture i drew in imagination about his head being cut off to decorate the city walls made him think his head of more value to his body than the possession of a few paltry dollars that was the lecture i gave him again says nealance when you went down to the boat with the box half full of dollars anderson and that brought us in another thousand when he came to understand the great dangers we had saved him from you are a cool hand nealance says mr jule at getting round a chinaman i don't know so much about that remarks nealance i have generally come off second best when i have been doing a trade with them and this lift from ah ching will not make up for the half i have lost in dealing with his countrymen what do you say about it anderson asks nealance like yourself i reply i have been bit several times with them for they are very cute at a bargain on the other hand i have met some of them who were as honourable as any white man but then they were chinamen who had left the celestial empire and been brought up under the influence of western barbarians and generally prided themselves on their european style of mannerism it is not much loss to ai ching remarks nealance and he will have it out of the first barbarian he comes across or out of those simple japanese as he teaches them how to finance and trade on the new model 
we are on the point of rising from the table when our actions are accelerated by hearing the quartermaster on watch call down the companion the captain will be at the gangway in a minute mr jule as we had not expected him back till the morning we hurriedly make our way on deck and are only just in time to meet the captain as he lands on the deck had your dinners gentlemen asked the captain yes sir replies mr jule and the men have finished their suppers too i suppose queries the captain of mr jule yes sir replies our chief officer hoist the gig up and heave short while i go and have a snack and away goes the captain to the saloon leaving us all wondering what next we are to be up to for we had all been so sure of getting to shanghai on the morrow before the middle of the day nealance attends to the hoisting in of the captain's gig and mr jule and i look after the heaving in of the cable paul the capstan says mr jule when sufficient cable has been hove in then he wins his way aft to report to the captain who has made his appearance on the quarter-deck having finished his snack of inward nourishment nealance and i are now beckoned aft to the quarter-deck where the captain informs us that the rebels are threatening the city of ningpo and orders have come down from shanghai for us to go and assist any of the citizens who are wishful to leave the beleaguered city now we will get under way says the captain after he has given us the foregoing information and if we have anything of a clear night at all we should get to chinyai by daylight the work of getting under way goes rapidly on and in a quarter of an hour's time we are carefully taking our way over the bar again the night is dark but clear and on the whole it is a good night for making out any distant objects therefore the captain elects to proceed by way of the inner route as it being so much the shortest will save a good many hours sailing getting safely over the bar a course is shaped to take us inside of twang so island the eamont is allowed to go at an easy pace so that we can pick our way in safety and hands with sharp-set eyes are planted on the lookout to watch for dangers seen or unseen and more especially for junks that might attempt to bar our way two officers remain on watch at a time during the night and the utmost vigilance is practised so that we may thread our way through this most intricate passage without coming to grief nothing of any moment happens during the course of the night more than the trimming of the yards and the altering of the course as we wend our way through and between wusung and chinai when the night gives place to welcome day the entrance to chinai can be plainly seen some twelve or fourteen miles away bearing about two points on our starboard bow the eamont under the orders of the captain is kept dead away for the entrance all her flying kites are set and every yard brace and sheet is trimmed down to catch and make the most of the favourable and refreshing breeze an early breakfast is dispatched fore and aft then all hands are piped to stations as we approach the entrance to ningpo river guns are run in and carefully examined to see that all are in fighting order ammunition is distributed and the small arms stacked in readiness around the mainmasts more than usual care is taken to have everything in readiness the captain having been warned that the rebels might try and oppose our passage up the river as we draw in towards chinai the sound of cannonading can be distinctly heard and as we get nearer the crack crack of musketry skirmishing can likewise be made out before we enter the narrows nealance and i by order of the captain pass round the deck and place a rifle for each man within easy reach of his arm while at the same time he attends to the working of his gun that a battle is going on in the vicinity of chinai is only but too evident for as we approach the city volley firing and cannonading sound in our ears with a very real distinctness anderson says the captain to me you are well acquainted with the river are you not oh, tolerably well sir i reply you had better remain aft here then says the captain and attend to the steering nealance you can give an eye to that forward gun should we get into action aye aye sir replies nealance i don't think there is much danger of that gun being well served for that fellow Boudin that is captain of it is every inch a gunner are you acquainted with any of the army standards anderson queries the captain of me 
yes sir i reply i know the imperial well enough but i am not sure about the rebels keep a lookout then for the imperials and we will keep towards their side of the river if possible says the captain as we get within gunshot of the city we run the largest british ensign we have on board up at the main topmast head and another somewhat less in size is floated from the main gaff end the breeze has freshened with the rising sun and we have now as we pass the city of shinai a slashing twelve knot breeze somewhere about four points on the port quarter the river is narrow here and both sides can be seen with ease without the aid of glasses on the left bank of the river i can make out the long narrow yellow standard of the imperialists with its long winding dragon therefore we haul the emont over towards that side of the river as the flood tide is with us we fly past the town of chennai like a flash of lightning then as we enter the narrow portion of the river we are treated with a fusillade from the right bank the sound of which is deafening but its effect on our progress is invisible their shot falls far short of us and the one or two heavy guns they have in position must have been sighted for a shot at some celestial object for the balls go whistling over our mastheads and find their way into the camp of the imperialists our starboard guns are discharged right into the rebel camp for such we take them to be that have dared to fire upon the british ensign but with what result we cannot make out as the emont flies past at such rapid pace that new batteries and platoons of fighting men keep opening into view at every moment we have a still narrower portion of the river to run the gauntlet of so for the most part we reserve our fire till we come to this particular place then as we get into this channel we give it to them on the right bank of the river hot and strong here the rebels are attempting to force the passage of the river by means of rafts boats and all banner of things floatable the scene through which we now pass defies description and the rebels are so intent on forcing their way across that we only receive from them the passing consideration of the balls that are fired into the imperial camp the butchery that was going on around us as we passed through this narrowest portion of the river was something awful here were a few rebels on a catamaran of hasty and indifferent construction another few of them in sampans and another water vehicles and all attempting to gain a footing on the left bank of the river spears and knives seemed to be the principal weapons in use amongst the rebels only a few of the officers having anything in the shape of firearms the imperialists were mowing them down with a galling musketry fire at less than a hundred paces while at the same time down at the water's edge and even in the water itself desperate hand-to-hand -hand encounters were plainly visible to us as we raced through the channel drowning men were stabbing drowning men in their ferocious endeavors to annihilate each other and it is beside the mark when i say that they were the most ferocious specimens of the human form divine it had ever been my lot to witness engaged in sanguinary warfare it has often been remarked in my hearing by some of those engaged on the imperial side that this day's battle was one of the bloodiest in the annals of the taiping rebellion we pass unscathed through this mad scene of butchery except for a few spent shot that have landed against our sides and bulwarks and left their mark behind then as we steadily pursue our way up the river towards ningpo the cannonading and noise of battle gradually decrease till distance shuts out the very sound and sight of the battle and the upper reaches look so pleasurable and inviting in their garb of fragrant foliage that one could almost imagine the last hour that has passed to be but a phantasm emanating out of a fever-maddened brain did you ever see such infernal devils says the captain to me as we glide past the infuriated savages and witness them plunging their daggers up to the hilt in their antagonists throats their chests or their sides anywhere at all where they can strike home with their right hand 
while with their left hand they either clutch their enemy and endeavor to force him under the water or else endeavor to ward off the fatal stab from their own body no quarter given or taken there sir i reply very little of that says the captain with a grim smile for prisoners are considered a nuisance and are generally got rid of in a summary manner i hope the imperialists will gain the day i remark how so queries the captain well if the rebels succeed in capturing chinai they will be able to block the entrance and we will have a tight job of it to get out again i reply can't help it says the captain we will have to get out of it somehow and my orders are to return immediately or at least as soon as we have succeeded in getting those people out of the city that we have come to assist has there been any other craft sent round here i ask oh, yes replies the captain i expect to see the zephyr coming down every minute and you may be sure there will be a lot of lorchas making as many dollars as they can assisting the inhabitants to clear out but very likely they are waiting the result of this morning's battle i think we are pretty well out of the melee now says the captain about half an hour after we have passed through the opposing armies tell mr jewel i wish to see him mr jewel says the captain you can pipe to grog and then let the men retire from stations but keep them handy in case of any surprise very good sir replies the chief officer then ere he proceeds to carry out the captain's orders he cannot forbear saying an awful waste of human life down there sir pointing over the stern of the eamont yes mr jewel says the captain with a smile much like what we read about of the old bare-legged savages in ancient britain in the good old days the men are piped to grog and released from the tension that holds one in a kind of fixture when at stations the welcome time of relaxation is further enhanced by the permission to enjoy the solace of that ever fragrant and mind-clearing weed tobacco chapter thirty rescuing fugitive celestials from ningpo we arrive off the city of ningpo somewhere about two in the afternoon and we are scarcely come to an anchor before we are surrounded with sampans which are all crammed with men women and children who are wildly clamoring for permission to come on board we run the boarding nettings up and are also careful to leave no ropes over the side whereby any of them can come up the side till such time as we have made some arrangements for the accommodation of such a vast number of people the zephyr is lying not far off and she is apparently crowded with people as are also a goodly number of lorchas that are lying between us and the city walls captain hauser of the zephyr pays us a visit as soon as we have come to anchor and a consultation is held between him and our captain as to the advisability of our sailing in convoy an arrangement that meets with the cordial approval of our commander the two captains having settled upon their plan of action our captain instructs nealance and me to get ready to accompany him on shore a cutter is placed in the water and manned with an armed crew of our hardiest men nealance and i take our places in the stern sheets where we are soon joined by our captain and captain hawser then putting off from the eamont we pull quickly for the shore as near to the main entrance gate as we can conveniently land half the boat's crew remain in charge of the boat and the other half follow us into the city to make as respectable a show of force as we can under the circumstances one of our shroffs has likewise accompanied us and as he knows the city better than any of us he pilots us through the many intricate streets till we arrive at the two ties or governor of the city for the time being the city looks depopulated of all its trading community and there are none of its usual bustling and thriving looking mercantile people to be seen the city walls are crowded with imperialist troops of some kind or another and the gates are well guarded by a curious motley crowd of nondescript celestials in the garb of fighting men some are armed with old muskets a few have minier rifles a few more are in possession of gingals lashed on to bamboos and requiring the aid of half a dozen men to work them but the most part of them are only armed with the ugly knives daggers and short swords that are so common in the far east 
the two captains are granted an interview with the tutai the shroff accompanying them as interpreter nealance and i remaining in the vestibule of the tutai's mansion with our men to guard against any surprise the interview lasts about half an hour then we are rejoined by the captain and the shroffs and betake ourselves back to the boat on the way down to the boat captain gulliver explains to nealance and i the result of the interview as well as the necessity there is for holding any intercourse with the tutai at all when the people have left the city and are clamouring to get on board the eamont for protection the fact of the matter is the captain says to nealance and i the tutai had refused to allow kwang li one of the head chops in the city and i dare say the richest to leave the city and i had instructions to threaten him with the bombardment of his city walls either by us or the british fleet if he did not restore him to liberty and allow him to proceed to shanghai either in the eamont or in any of his own lorchas how is it settled asked nealance if he is not alongside the eamont by five o'clock we will waken them up and make a hole in their walls for the rebels to get in replies the captain but i rather think he will be off by that time for the two tie seems a bit of a muff and i should not be surprised to hear of him running out of one end of the city as the rebels come in at the other leaving the landing we pull off to the zephyr in order to put her commander on board and as time is pressing we hurry back to the eamont to arrange about taking as many of the fugitive inhabitants on board as possible the zephyr we could see was crowded with them fore and aft but whether she had any under deck we could not make out we have some difficulty in making our way to the latter through the numerous sampans that are waiting permission to land the fugitives on board when we have got on board the boat is hoisted in out of the way then the captain holds a parley with us officers about the number we are to allow on board it being simply an impossibility to provide room for half the number who are clamouring alongside a strong guard is stationed at the gangway the hatches are taken off and a roughly constructed passageway made down on to the platform or floor of the hold everything being in order a sampan is allowed alongside to deposit its passengers one at a time upon the accommodation ladder mr jewell takes his station at the bottom of the ladder and receives or rejects the intending fugitive according to the amount of silver he is able to produce either in bars or mexican dollars a good many are rejected in the first half hour but as our accommodation gets smaller and the price of admission if i may so term it gets much larger very few of them are found to reject the terms of the chief officer the captain who has been watching the filling up of the hold and other available spaces at length orders a stop to the proceedings the ladder is hoisted up and the boarding nettings triced down to the rail so as not to allow of any more coming on board we have scarcely moving room as it is and we will have some trouble in working ship when we start on our return to shanghai the clamouring of the fugitives in the sampans whom we are unable to accommodate is something terrible to look at despair seems to have taken hold on many of them and they can scarcely be restrained from attempting to climb up the sides on the poles and oars belonging to the boats some hold out bags of dollars and others attempt to induce the captain to relent by offering bars of pure white silver poor frightened spiritless beings they cannot be made to see that it is impossible for us to pack any more into the space we have at command without endangering the lives of those we have already taken on board the captain stations the shroffs at each side to communicate to the hapless wretches the reason of our inability to succour any more and at the same time to advise them to seek for shelter on board the junks or lorchas but they seem to have as great a dread of the lorchas as of the expected rebels in the midst of this clamour kwang li and his family arrive alongside and are speedily brought on board a signal is made to the zephyr and then we begin to heave away on the capstan 
the captain's intention being to endeavour to pass out of the river under cloud of the darkness of this moonless night as already arranged between him and the captain of the zephyr the tide is just on the turn from flood to ebb and if the wind only holds so that we can lead down the river without much tacking we may get past chennai before we meet the next turn of the tide when discussing the matter with us his officers the captain after telling us of the arrangement made with the captain of the zephyr remarks it is a big risk but there is no help for it we must keep a bright lookout so that we don't take the ground anywhere near the opposing armies if they are still in the same position anyhow i believe myself both sides will be that much cut up with their day's work that they will be too lazy to get up and look at us so that if we can only keep afloat and this good working breeze hangs on we will be well out of it before midnight what do you think gentlemen asked the captain when he has finished his explanation it is the best plan i think replies mr jewel first class says nealance in reply to which i add ditto pipe the hands to grog mr jewel says the captain as for us we will take a snack when we can get it for we will all have to remain on deck till we have passed the rubicon which for us is to-night the town or village of chinai while the zephyr which is going to take the lead is getting under way we get as many of our fugitive celestials put below in the hold as we consider necessary for the working of the vessel till we get out of the river then we station sufficient of our men on guard at the hatchways to keep them in order everything being now somewhat shipshape and the zephyr under way our anchor is tripped and we sail on in the wake of our consort followed by the unavailing clamouring shouts of those who are left behind the night is all that could be desired for our purpose for it is opaquely dark that is it is very dark for landsmen but to a trained seaman it is what is termed a good night for distinguishing objects that have no apparent background such as the sails of a ship or a balloon therefore we are able to distinguish our consort's every movement by keeping our glasses bearing upon her snow-white sails by ten o'clock we have fetched down close to the narrow channel where the fighting was so brisk in the forenoon having only had to make two short tacks no lights are allowed on either vessel excepting the one covered light in the binnacle keenest eyesight is the best light for such a night and for such an enterprise before entering the narrows we see the zephyr make a short tack to windward in order that she may not be hampered with a shy wind in the most critical part of the passage so therefore as soon as we attain the same position we also make a board to windward to keep the emont well in hand as we glide silently through the narrows as soon as we see the zephyr away on the original tack we prepare to follow suit and very soon the emont is following on the heels of her consort at a pace that would gladden a yachtsman's heart and in such a noiseless manner that the rustling of a silk handkerchief might be easily heard wind and tide in our favour we rush through this narrow channel with accelerated speed and it would take a smart marksman indeed to hit us unless by the merest haphazard chance we observe several watch-fires on both banks of the river but we are unable to distinguish anything in the shape of the human form divine either on sentry or watching by the bivouac fire safely through the narrows without arousing the attention of either army to our proceedings we sail rapidly on till we again see our consort heave in stays about a mile above chennai we again follow suit and fetch over to the weather shore this time for our last tack to windward for when we are once more round on the original tack we are able to give her a point and keep out of range of any guns that may be in position at chennai whether in the hands of friends or foes the town as we pass it is buried in darkness there is not the faintest show of a light to be distinguished after passing chennai we are dismissed from stations the watch is set and the high-strung tension of silent expectation which we have been under for the last six hours drops away from our brain with evident relief to our minds and bodies 
the wind is in such a direction as to enable us to lay a straight course for wusong bar it is not fresh but quite enough to force the eamont through the water at the rate of ten and eleven knots an hour although on a taut bowline we are sheltered somewhat by the numerous islands lying to windward of our tack which keeps the water as smooth almost as a sheet of glass the zephyr has somehow the heels of us for do what we can we are never able to come up with her and before daylight beams upon the water we are very near losing sight of her altogether our eamont was no doubt as finely lined and mottled as the zephyr but being of somewhat stronger build it was in real heavy weather that she brought out her sailing powers to most advantage the eamont was built in the isle of wight by those celebrated yacht builders messrs white who are still carrying on the business and with great success no expense had been spared in her construction therefore as good a craft as teakwood and mahogany could be formed and modelled into by the most excellent designers had been turned out from the yard of that long-standing yacht-building firm whose name is known the world over for the speed and excellence of the many yachts and other vessels that have been constructed by them the zephyr had been built in baltimore u s a and had been originally intended for a slaver she was built of american oak and elm and beautiful in construction but her timbers being of a somewhat more supple kind of wood than the mahogany frames of the eamont she was able to walk away from us when the weather approached anywhere towards the moderate and the sea was smooth as soon however as the wind increased to a gale with a corresponding rising of the sea then would the eamont show her staying powers and i have seen her under such circumstances sail right dead to windward of the zephyr and leave her out of sight astern in a matter of twelve hours when daylight at length makes its appearance on the surrounding scene the zephyr is seen to be nearly eight miles ahead of us close hauled like ourselves and carrying on every stitch of canvas that can be brought to bear upon her End of section 10. Section 11 of Among Typhoons and Pirate Craft by Lindsay Anderson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 11, Chapters 31 through 33. Chapter 31 shanghai again and bob allen mr jewell and i have the morning watch the rather intricate navigation of this inner passage necessitating the presence on deck of two officers in each watch as soon as we have distinctly made out the distance between us and the zephyr i am sent below to inform the captain of the present position of the two vessels eight miles ahead did you say anderson queries the captain when i make my report to him about that sir or more i reply that will never do you know exclaims the captain just tell mr jewell to put every stitch of our canvas in soak let the other work stand over for a bit and be sharp about getting the canvas soaked ay ay sir i reply as i take my way up to the quarter-deck and make my report to the chief officer the force pump is manned and the hose led up to the main cross trees then a perfect deluge of water is showered upon the gaff topsail and mainsail a couple of gant lines are rove through tall blocks made fast on the top gallant yard and bucket after bucket of water finds its way aloft wherewith to deluge the canvas on the fore part of the vessel the captain makes his appearance on the quarter-deck to take a look at the zephyr and see if he cannot do something to improve our speed we are too much by the head says the captain to mr jewell send two or three hands down below to move our passengers as far aft as they can be got the deck passengers are likewise conducted aft and made to squat down on the quarter-deck on the weather side so as to be clear of the falling water 
the water is kept in a continual pour upon the sails and after an hour has passed under this new order of things we note with satisfaction that we are gradually and surely decreasing the distance between us and our consort we cross the bar within a quarter of an hour of the zephyr and are little more than half a mile astern of her when we arrive off the receiving ship the zephyr keeps on up the river without stopping but we having left our two japanese passengers on board the receiving ship lie to and send a boat to bring them on board half an hour is nearly lost over this proceeding so as soon as we have filled away again the water is again brought into requisition as a means of accelerating our speed until we get within a mile or two of shanghai we are not long in arriving after the zephyr considering the start she had of us and the long wait we had at the receiving ship for they have scarcely finished furling their sails when we drop our anchor a little way astern of them both vessels are immediately surrounded with a clamouring crowd of sampans which have been waiting to disembark our fugitive celestials from ningpo sampans and lighters of every description are freely allowed to come alongside for we are glad to be eased of the responsibility of looking after the heterogeneous mass of human beings we have brought round from the beleaguered city two hours are nearly consumed over their disembarkation then all hands are turned to to wash and cleanse the hold and remove all the stains and filth that are the usual concomitants of this style of passengers before the sun goes down the Eamont is once more like herself and having been well disinfected we are able to breathe with confidence the air that now pervades her interior both forward and aft boarding nettings are triced up as is usual in port the booms are swung out and after mr jule is satisfied with the general appearance of the Eamont within and without one watch is allowed on shore on leave and a sufficiency of bright mexican dollars allowed them wherewith to enjoy themselves in the manner most fitting to themselves the captain and the japs went on shore almost as soon as we came to anchor and as he left word that he would stay on shore for the night mr jule nealance and i adjourned to dinner when the hands have been dismissed and an armed watch set during the evening we are visited by some of the officers of the zephyr and a pleasant evening soon passes away as we recount our various adventures one of these officers hailed from the land of cakes so that we had many pleasant reminiscences to talk over as we smoked and paraded the quarter-deck curiously enough the exigencies of the service precluded me from again meeting this brither scott in the far east yet so small a place is this world after all that i had the pleasure one day only a few years ago of knocking up against this countryman of mine when in command of a large new steamer going out to india on the third day after our arrival in shanghai the captain who has been staying on shore the most of the time sends off word to mr jule to get the Eamont ready for sea the following day at noon in a manner as far as the vessel and her equipment is concerned we are always ready for sea our magazine is always kept well stocked with fighting material and it is generally the larder only that requires replenishing when the order comes to proceed to sea mackenzie's store receives a visit that afternoon as also various chinese chops that deal in eatables and mr robert allen's boarding-house is not forgotten for we also call upon him and prevail upon him not to detain any of our now well-trained crew bob is all smiles and gaiety when we make our descent upon his quarters at the other side of the river and nothing will please him but standing drinks all round nealance and i spend an hour or two listening to bob as he recounts to us many of his adventures on the river in pursuit of his necessary though perhaps nefarious trade in those days there were so many inducements to young seamen of a roving disposition to quit their half-starved deep-water vessels and try their luck on the lorchas that traded up the river that captains of vessels were of necessity forced to recognize and be civil to bob allen or else go to sea with a half-manned vessel 
bob may have been the genius that introduced shanghaiings still there is this to be said for him he was liberal in his treatment of his boarders both in their food and money matters and he was no less honourable in his transactions with captains who acted in a like honourable manner towards himself and if once he promised to find a crew for any vessel you may be sure that a crew would arrive on board that vessel at the stated time from whence brought was best known to bob and the men themselves i suppose you will be coming back here again asks bob of nealance and me when we rise to take our leave oh yes replies nealance we'll be back in two or three weeks come over and have a look at us when you come back says bob for i have got a big order for arms to run up the river and as i cannot go myself there would be a good chance for you two to make a pile of dollars our time in port has been so short lately i remark that there is no time to make a run even if we had leave look here says bob you two fellows and one or two yokels with little or no gumption that i can pick up could run a lorca up and down in three days easily and then look at the pile of dollars or bar silver to be had for such a little job we may have a fortnight or three weeks when we come back says nealance i suppose it will all depend on whether we finish this japanese business this trip or not well good night both says bob and think over my offer all right says nealance and don't forget to have all our liberty men off by eight to-morrow morning never fear says bob but what they'll be there for your fellows are as good as gold to me seeing they spend most of their money here good night bob we finally say as we take our leave but bob has taken such an interest in nealance and me that he walks down to the boat with us talking all the way about this venture of his running up the river with a supply of arms and ammunition most probably for the rebel army as the taipings were termed but to many of us out there then it was very difficult to define which was the rebel army and which was the army of law and order we managed to get away from bob eventually without committing ourselves to any distinct arrangement although he tries his most persuasive powers to get some sort of binding promise from us that we would share in his speculation on our return we make our way back on board the Emont, and after a smoke and a chat with mr jule to whom we recount all our doings while we have been on shore we are glad to turn into our cabins and seek the solacing rest that is necessary to prepare us for the work of the coming day chapter thirty two shanghai to nagasaki with dispatches our liberty men punctually arrive on board at their stated time as also all our fresh supplies of larder stores and other necessities the work of preparing for sea goes forward and at ten o'clock in the forenoon i am dispatched with the captain's gig for the purpose of bringing off the dispatches and mails as also the captain himself and our passengers as soon as they have completed their business on shore seamen as a rule were always a source of anxiety to a commander in those days therefore the captain's first question to me when i meet him on shore is just what i expected are all hands on board mr anderson queries the captain yes sir i reply with a smile as i see his face relieved of its anxious expression oh, i'm glad of that says the captain for i hear numerous complaints of desertions and was rather afraid bob allen might have tried to seduce some of our fellows and sell them to a higher bidder such fabulous sums are being offered for runs to england and any amount of men to man the lorcas besides the promises of plenty of loot they have turned up all right enough this time i say but if bob had not been convinced by nealance and me that we were coming straight back i doubt very much if we would not have been minus a few of them this morning as it is bob is quite content to leave them with us so long as they spend the greater part of their dollars in his house i see says the captain with a smile if i had not allowed them a good share of liberty and plenty of dollars bob would have found a way of getting money out of them in some other manner that's it sir i reply but as the men seem pleased enough with the conditions and always turn up at the proper time to relieve one another we are better off than always having a new crowd to lick into shape 
oh yes says the captain i am perfectly satisfied with the liberty granted by mr jewel and although our crew is comprised of a curious mixture of the devil-may-care sailor of all nations they are on the whole not a bad lot now we have got them into some kind of order may i ask where we are bound this time sir i say of the captain nagasaki of course replies the captain and this time we have the completed treaty so that we will be able to go where we like this time as well as buy and sell anything we have a mind to we have also got the american treaty dispatches which are to be delivered to the commodore in command of the paddle-wheel sloop of war mississippi bring a couple of hands to the consulate with you says the captain and we will go and see if they have got the dispatches ready followed by our two men we take our way to the british consulate where after waiting some little time we are given the dispatch boxes and various other parcels to carry down to the boat i myself accompanying such valuable articles to the boat and remaining there till joined by the commander the captain and the two japs follow closely on our heels then we shove off and are soon landed on board the eamont heave short mr jewel says the captain after he has saluted his officers while i go and get on my sea-going togs round goes the capstan and home comes the topsail sheets at the same time topgallant sheets next find their way home on the topsail yard the yards are braced by and as the captain appears on the quarter-deck in his hard weather suit he signals with his hand to mr jewel to heave up so again round goes the capstan which has been stopped at a short stay peak and as the anchor leaves its bed in the bottom of the river the eamont gracefully swings round under the influence of her backed headsails till she is round with her head down the river then all sail is rapidly spread upon her we exchange signals with the zephyr on passing and lower our ensign to one chinese gunboat that is lying here for the protection of the commercial interests of this fast increasing trading community this chinese gunboat was a sight to behold and as for her utility the many encounters we had with the piratical lorchas not far from wusung demonstrated the uselessness of attempting to suppress the everyday piracies that were then the rule by such an obsolete old paddle-wheel steamboat that had been running on some american river till she had become almost worthless and unseaworthy any of our schooners could have easily destroyed her and i doubt very much if the pirates whom she sometimes captured were not frightened into submission by imbibing the idea that there was something of the supernatural about her as they witnessed her bearing down upon them and at the same time emitting from her bowels vast volumes of smoke and flame like a very demon of the sea and a sight they had not yet got to know much about a smart breeze all the way down the river brings us to an anchor before sunset in our usual anchoring ground under the guns of our receiving ship at wusung the sails are furled and everything made safe for the night then we proceed to dinner where we are joined by the captain of the receiving ship who again informs our captain that he had better be upon his guard for he has heard that some of the lorchas are bent on our extermination this warning makes no sensible effect on our spirits nor does it affect our appetites to judge by the amount of good food and wine that is stowed away beneath our vests and although the main topic of conversation that evening was reminiscences of various sea fights i don't suppose any of us slept one whit less soundly than at any other time at daylight the following morning the cutter is put in the water and various trips take place between us and the receiving ship as we transport to the eamont the various cases that go to make up our cargo having got all our merchandise on board by ten o'clock we weigh our anchor and proceed to sea trusting to the long-tried prowess of our commander and our own dogged never-say-die disposition we are not troubled with any qualms as to the result should we meet any of the lorchas spoken of by the captain of the receiving ship although the year has advanced a bit since we sailed for nishwang the monsoon has abated but little and we find quite a sufficiency of wind for a good whole sail breeze 
we take a different track this time in order to avoid having any collision with the piratical lorchas not from any fear of them however but only because we are carrying very important dispatches which are expected to be delivered without delay and the chance of losing a spar by a chance shot from a lorcha is of all things to be avoided on this important passage after crossing the bar the eamont is headed so as to pass south of the saddle islands a decision the captain had come to on the assumption that if the lorchas had got any information they would be on the watch for us to the northward they no doubt imagining that we would take that weatherly route in order to keep as much to windward as we could before starting to cross the monsoon the assumption the captain based his decision on proved to be perfectly correct for when we are half-way between the bar and the south saddle islands we descry away on our port quarter a small fleet of lorchas making all the sail they can in a vain endeavour to get between us and the channel ahead steadily we pursue our course neither altering tack nor sheet not even applying the water help to our canvas so sure are we that we can outstrip the lorchas with ease although some of them are getting up their curious shaped topsails in their futile attempt to cut us off the chase is kept up till we close in on the island but they never get within the range of our long guns and as we sweep round the island into the channel we shut our baffled pursuers from our gaze altogether the channel is clear and seemingly deserted for we neither see lorchas on the water nor anything human on the land swiftly and smoothly we glide through the channel the waters of which are as smooth as a sheet of ice but as soon as we reach the eastern end the eamont once more begins to show her agility in leaping the troubled waters of the monsoon disturbed sea and as is her usual style in heavy weather when she cannot get over the waves she makes a graceful obeisance to neptune and glides or rather rushes under the crested wave to gain its other side while at the same time she rather unmercifully causes huge volumes of the salt sea spray to be showered upon her decks and all around much to the inconvenience of those who are only comfortable when perfectly dry and warm we and the eamont are accustomed to wetting and take but little heed of it no more than having a good shake at ourselves somewhat after the fashion of a retriever or newfoundland dog when he comes out of the water when the course is set for nagasaki a good pull is taken on all the weather braces the topmast studding sail is set the wind not allowing of any more flying kites at present the sea watch is then set and we again return to our normal state of regular routine that obtains with us when at sea which in weather such as we now experience consists in solely attending to the trimming of the sails and making the most of any favourable opportunity for pushing ahead that may present itself when the wind has a tendency to lull we immediately lace the bonnets on to the sails in order to intercept every portion of wind force and use it to our advantage should the wind increase to any great extent the bonnets are taken off for the time and the watch on deck are set to stand by all halyards tacks and sheets for although all our sails and gear are of the stoutest and best that are manufactured we neglect no precaution that prudence may suggest to save our spars three days of a fresh though somewhat unsteady monsoon brings us again within sight of the high land at the western extremity of japan we make the land shortly after the sun has crossed the meridian and as the wind has taken off a good deal as we approach the coast darkness sets in ere we enter the gulf which forms the harbour of nagasaki chapter thirty three arrive at nagasaki and are caught in a trap entering the gulf under cover of the night we carefully pilot our way towards the inner harbour and endeavour to reach the anchorage without attracting the attention of any of the inhabitants in order to surprise them with our reappearance 
before we arrive at the anchorage we are enveloped in a heavy squall of wind and rain which effectually hides our arrival from any peering eyes that may be on the watch while at the same time the noise of the wind and the pouring of the heavy rain effectually drown any more than usual noise we make as we round to not far from the main landing and let go our anchor finding one anchor insufficient to bring her up with such short scope the second and the best bower anchor is also let go this second anchor succeeds in bringing the eamont up causing her to swing round with her head to the windward and it is only then that we feel the full force of the squall which is fast increasing into a heavy gale luckily most of our sails were furled as we leisurely groped our way up the gulf previous to the advent of the squall so that we are soon riding as snug as we can under the circumstances this is no ordinary squall i hear the captain saying to mr jewel as it first appeared but a downright hard blow we are going to have how is the glass sir queries mr jewel trending downwards if anything replies the captain and then adds we will keep sea watch to-night so that we can give her cable at any time it is good holding ground i believe so all we require is to let her have plenty scope of cable and she will ride like a duck all that night and the following day the gale keeps on with but little alteration in force or direction until it is near the time of sunset when a slight diminution in the force of the wind is distinctly felt and when the sun has actually disappeared from our portion of the heavens the wind although still blowing fresh has lost all its fierceness and now quietly subsides into a steady moderate gale we have had no communication with the shore yet for all our energies have been exerted in attending to the eamont throughout the gale and however important our dispatches may be the safety of the vessel is of paramount consequence to our commander although he is no doubt exceedingly anxious to land and communicate with careero when we regain the quarter-deck after dinner the weather seems inclined to improve still more and the captain noting this suggests to mr nealance and me the necessity of attempting to land our dispatches having expressed our willingness to make the attempt the captain instructs mr jewel to get his gig put in the water and manned then he requests nealance and me to attend him in his private cabin now gentlemen says the captain to us when we have entered his cabin i am going to entrust you with some papers of great importance which you will deliver to mr careero and to him only if you find it impossible to reach him to-night i expect you to return with the papers and not run any unnecessary risk that might lead to their loss very good sir replies nealance speaking for us both as you cannot land at careero's house says the captain the only other place is the main landing where we landed when we visited the city now are you quite sure you know the bearings of careero's house from there and that you can find your way there after you have landed yes i think so replies nealance all we have to do when we get through the gateway is to bear to the right and keep to the eastward on the outskirts of the dutch settlement till we reach open ground then the rest of the way is quite plain that is the very plan smilingly assents the captain but look here it is just possible that some emissaries of the party that are against the treaty may be on the watch to prevent you reaching careero's in that case you will return on board and we will think out some other plan of reaching him we might have waited till to-morrow continues the captain only we are so much behind time already and it might prejudice the treaty considerably were it delayed any longer will either of the two japs accompany us asked nealance no i am afraid not replies the captain you see it is this way with them they don't wish to be seen in the business by any of the priestly party till they have succeeded in a final settlement of the negotiations and it is also possible that if they were to land with you they might be seized and carried off into the interior by some of their opponents secure that packet inside your vest says the captain holding a large blue envelope towards nealance then turning towards me with another similar packet he says and here is one for you also anderson 
now away you go and good luck to you says the captain when we have closely buttoned our jackets and are ready to depart then adds as we leave his cabin don't forget your revolvers and you had better let the boat's crew carry side-arms as well leaving the captain in his cabin we proceed to our cabins and don our harness carefully filling our cartridge pouch with ammunition and reloading our revolvers when we reach the deck we find that mr jewel has got the gig ready and that he has put an armed crew into her therefore as soon as we arrive at the gangway we say good night to mr jewel and then find our way down into the boat shove off shouts nealance as soon as we have taken our seats and in a trice we are bounding away towards the landing as fast as six powerful oarsmen can propel in our captain's favourite whaleboat fashioned gig we have eight men in the gig with us so when we land at the steps four of the crew follow us on to the landing and the other four push off from the steps a little way and bring the boat to an anchor after mr nealance has satisfied himself regarding the safety of our boat we take our way in double file up the steps towards the archway through which we have to pass to gain the city or any portion of its environments as usual we find a goodly number of soldiers or what appear to be military standing on both sides of the gateway they make no attempt to stop us as we march on our way but after taking a severe scrutinizing look at us the officer in command of this guard tells off some half-dozen of his men to follow on with us not for our protection if the look on his face can be taken as an indication of his purpose but for the purpose of preventing our entrance into the city we have no desire to enter the city our way lies in an opposite direction but we have a great and overwhelming desire to be rid of our self-appointed escort this will never do says nealance to me when we are well assured the guard intend to stick to us no that it won't i reply but how are we to get rid of them i also ask of my comrade we will have to do them the first dark road we come to replies nealance the streets or roads we were then walking along were lit up with a kind of chinese lantern which although not giving much light except in their immediate vicinity served the purpose of defining the length of the streets but were useless as we found to our cost in pointing out to the stranger for his guidance any of the crossings from which he might care to take a departure or shape a course we purposely avoid taking the road that leads to careeros until we can get rid of our enforced escort street after street we traverse but find no way to evade our company and at length quite unexpectedly we find ourselves back at the boat landing we come to a halt to consider our position and what next to do our escort at the same time taking the opportunity of reporting to their officers our possibly to them peculiar proceedings what do you say anderson queries nealance if we strike out boldly along the road to careeros best thing we can do i reply if we mean to get there and if they follow us to the open we may be able to get rid of them amongst the brushwood without too much noise if they persist in escorting us thus far shoot them do you mean asked nealance not unless they will consent to be bound and gagged i reply what will you gag them with asked nealance whatever comes to hand their own sashes sword belts and cloaks but we will have to disarm them first and i am not sure if they will know enough about a revolver to be frightened at it so that we may have our work set if gunpowder be prohibited i reply come along then says nealance and we take our way this time along the road that leads round the outskirts of the monopolist settlement closely accompanied by our japanese escort it is a very great truth indeed and oft times it is exemplified in the affairs of human life that the best laid schemes that emanate from the human brain go as often wrong as the small and petty schemes of the most insignificant object endowed with animal life just so was it with us that night for a single turning to the left which was gently forced upon us by our escort seemingly to protect us from the danger of falling into the water the noise of which breaking on the beach we could distinctly hear 
but we soon found to our dismay that our safety had in no wise disturbed them for all their doings were only part of a preconcerted plan the road they have edged us into is like the streets in the settlement it is well hung with paper lanterns and looks of an interminable length as we look to the eastward between the glimmering lights and we console ourselves with the possibility that this long straight road may lead to the very outskirts of the place with every confidence that we have found the right track we put on a spurt to accelerate our march and if so be leave our escort behind our spurt alas for us comes to a very abrupt termination for without the slightest sign of any interruption or even a crossing traversing this lengthy-looking road first nealance and then i followed by two of our men who have not time to halt when we vanish are all precipitated into a pit that is full of all the most filthy slime and garbage which could possibly be imagined we cannot speak being partially choked and it is lucky for us that two of our men have escaped our peril and are able to assist us in clambering out of this horrible pit when we manage to regain the road we find our escort has departed and we are not allowed the satisfaction of even having a shot at them so suddenly have they disappeared from our view we waste no time standing near the scene of our discomfiture but as soon as we have all scrambled out we take to our heels and rush for the landing then when we get there we spring past the guards and dive right into the water to clear ourselves of the abominable filth the odor of which has for the time stopped our utterances as well as disconcerted any immediate action on our part our two men who escaped falling into the mess hail the boat which is speedily brought to the landing and after we have succeeded in cleansing ourselves we take our places in the boat and push off from the wharf to consider on our next move i suppose it won't do to take summary vengeance on these fellows although i would like to says nealance for we might get shooting the wrong parties and then i suppose it would be good-bye to the treaty the blame being put on us i suppose so i remark although it does seem hard to come away without doing something how is that paper in your breast asks nealance as he draws out his own from beneath his vest damp i reply but not torn only wants drying like me to be all right mine seems all right says nealance and as the sea has gone down a bit i move that we pull right round to careero's house and chance landing on the beach for i never like to say that i am beaten agreed say i another ducking more or less won't make much difference give way then my lads says nealance and then adds to cheer us up a bit the sooner we get there the sooner we will be within the reach of something to cheer our inward man end of part eleven section twelve of among typhoons and pirate craft by lindsay anderson this librivox recording is in the public domain section twelve chapters thirty four and thirty five chapter thirty four land in a gale at careero's pulling out from the wharf in the direction of the Emont till we are well to windward of the projecting extremity of this the eastern portion of the inner harbour we then bear off along the beach till we are abreast of careero's mansion as there is still a good bit of sea rolling on to the beach nealance unships the rudder and fixes a spare oar to the head of the stern post the better to steer the boat through the surf before we make the rush for the beach all being in readiness for beaching and every precaution taken to prevent our broaching too as also directions given to the boat's crew as to their jumping out as soon as we took the ground and dragging the boat well up the beach out of the surf we then get the boat round right before the sea and when nealance who is watching the waves as they pass gives the cheerful order of give way my lads give way with a will the boat starts off on top of the crested wave at a pace that almost takes our breath away 
we do not fetch the beach on the first wave nor on the second but as the third wave comes along and we feel ourselves rising out of the hollow between the second and third an extra spurt is put on by the men at the oars and before we have time to look round again we are landed on the beach in a heavy shower of glistening spray springing out of the boat is but the work of a moment then each of us clutching hold of the gunwale await the advent of the next wave and as soon as we feel the boat begin to lift we make a rush and before we come to a halt we land the boat well beyond the reach of any danger from the surf after this exciting practice in boating we take a few minutes pause to collect ourselves and restore our equilibrium then we make the best of our way towards careeros two men are left in charge of the boat the other six accompanying us not so much for protection as for some much-needed and well-earned refreshment there is no one astir or on the watch in the environs of careero's house therefore we do not trouble the side door but boldly march up to the front door and make known our presence by a knock that we ourselves can very audibly hear resounding through the interior of the dwelling we do not have long to wait on the outside for almost as soon as if some one had been waiting behind the door for our coming the door is thrown open and we are gladly welcomed into the house by careero ashing and several of their japanese confederates how do you do nealance how do you do anderson says careero as he shakes our hands and ashing looks as if he would like to perform the accolade come inside to my room and give us all the news says careero after the first burst of greeting is over just a moment please says nealance addressing careero i have got some men outside who are in need of some refreshment for we have had rather a rough time of it getting here bring them in by all means says careero and we will see what we can do for them our men are brought within and ushered into an anteroom where an ample supply of refreshments is quickly placed before them by order of careero and no doubt they do good justice to the viands and don't forget to relieve their mates who have been left in charge of the gig so that they too may have a share in the good things that are going nealance and i having thus seen to the comfort of our men follow mr careero to his own apartments where we also are regaled in a very sumptuous manner while at the same time we relate to him all that has transpired with us since leaving the emont when we tell him of the trap we were led into and the direful result attending our fall therein his indignation was highly inflamed and he sent for ah shing and the japanese who were in the house and commanded them to take a strict note of the proceedings so that those on guard at the landing when we landed there might be brought to a strict account for their nefarious conduct when the proper time came the japanese express much sympathy for us in their own peculiar fashion and through careero and ah shing as interpreters they promise that we shall have the fullest satisfaction and good solatium in kind as soon as the treaty has been promulgated and they are free to act we of course express ourselves highly satisfied at this arrangement and intimate to them or rather to careero that we are quite prepared to do and suffer a great deal more in their service a sentiment which seems to please them immoderately you will excuse me for half an hour says careero to nealance and i when our grievances have been arranged for while i retire with my friends and see what these dispatches are that you have brought for us careero and his confederates depart to another room and nealance and i are left with an ample sufficiency of good things wherewith to while away the half hour the wine cigars and other good things have such a cheering effect upon us that we are totally oblivious of the fact that we have been twice ducked in the water since we left the emont but then we were so accustomed to the water when at sea that it took little or no effect upon us the captain will be wondering what has become of us i remark when our friends retire from the room i dare say he will replies nealance but i don't think we could have been back yet had we been able to get here by the road pity we had not brought a rocket or some blue lights with us i remark then we could have signalled them that we had got here all right 
yes we might have done that assents nealance and the next time we are on an expedition like this we must arrange some kind of signal if only for the benefit of the captain and mr jewel themselves for if either of them were to go on shore in search of us and fall into such a like trap as we did to-night it would require a good-sized derrick and tackle to get them out again i should not like to be the one the captain fell upon i say with a smile for i doubt if such a one would ever see daylight again and mr jule himself is no light weight although he might be able to climb a little better than the captain although we laugh at the thought of our superiors coming to grief in search of us i can see that nealance who has sailed with them a much longer time than i feels a little restless on the subject and as if he would like to be moving i wish careero would wind up his confab ejaculates nealance and let us be off if it were not for thinking the captain may be sending after us i could make myself comfortable enough here for an hour or two yet and then the sea will have gone down considerably as well but there we cannot help it it is a case of kismet or que sera sera so let us make the best of our surroundings and drive dull care away and as he concludes he pours out two more glasses of careero sparkling moselle in which we pledge our host in his absence then light another of his havanas to while away the time with we do not forget to take a look into the anteroom where our men are being regaled and as we find them acting with prudence in regard to the drinkables we leave them to enjoy themselves careero and his coadjutors put in an appearance at last and we can see by their beaming countenances that our dispatches have given them much pleasure here is a note for captain gulliver says careero and i may as well tell you that you will be permitted to land and go where you like in the course of a few days and i have told the captain he can land with his two passengers when and where he likes to-morrow then he adds i suppose you are eager to be off and it is no use me asking you to stay till morning therefore we will have the parting glass with our japanese friends to initiate them into one of the important functions of western hospitality which they have yet to learn careero thus concludes with a beaming smile on the japanese then present who receive his complimentary notice when it is explained to them by ah sheng with a bland and smiling decorum good nights are said all round as we part from our host at the door then we follow our men to the boat and as the sea has subsided considerably we are able to launch our boat with little difficulty and soon thereafter we arrive on board the Eamont, just in time to allay the anxiety of our commander and save mr jule from an excursion to the shore chapter thirty five japan opened at last we relate our adventures of the night to the captain and mr jule and are complimented on the successful carrying out of our mission the captain vowing deepest vengeance on the japanese guards when the proper time came and had it not been for the delicate position of the present state of the negotiations i have no doubt we should have been ordered on shore to capture some of the guards and give them a taste of british justice as it was then past midnight it was thought better to sleep upon it rather than destroy the chance of successfully carrying out the treaty which was now so near its consummation our captain as a rule was a man of prompt action and his forbearance to-night was no doubt a sore pill for him to swallow that he felt the indignity that had been put upon us by the japanese guards is very certain and he bitterly felt the trammels that tied his hands and prevented us exacting our due reparation for their nefarious conduct perhaps it was just as well for the trading world at large and japan also that our commander was this time guided in his actions by the overwhelming importance of careero's negotiations for had we gone on shore that night and made retaliation on the japanese as it was usually our custom to do in china there would possibly have been an uprising of the japs who were in opposition to the treaty and the opening up of that country to trade and commerce would no doubt have been postponed for a considerable period 
calmer judgment prevailed and the captain came to the conclusion that we should bide our time so having come to this forbearing elucidation after much anxious thought we seek the aid of our couches in the hopes that balmy sleep may rub the rough edges from off our at present excited mood the following morning dawns upon us in perfect contrast to that of the preceding day for instead of the rain and blustering wind of the previous day we have the prospect of a day that reminds one of the bright and balmy days that are only to be found in tropical latitudes as on our last visit to this place we are again carefully watched four boats having been placed on guard in the same position as they occupied on the former occasion we take little heed of them and the usual routine of morning duty is proceeded with at eight bells we dress ship and otherwise make the Eamont look as importantly conspicuous as the occasion requires after breakfast the gig is brought to the gangway manned with eight of our most resolute seamen who are fully equipped for fighting should that necessity arise the captain having determined to put up with no more insults should the guards at the landing interfere with us but to exact a just reparation on the spot nealance and i in our full war costume accompany the captain on his visit to the shore when we arrive at the landing four men are left in charge of the boat and the other four follow on with us into the city we pass through the lines of guards taking no heed of them or their sulky looks we do not salute them as we always did on our previous visits but pass silently on at the same time keeping a sharp and watchful eye upon their every movement no attempt on the part of the guards is made to follow us therefore as soon as we pass through the archway we take the high road that leads round the outskirts of the settlement and make the best of our way towards careeros when we arrive there we find the whole place in a kind of jubilation many more japanese inhabitants are now assembled here than on any former occasion of our visits some of them are decked out in raiments of magnificent and gorgeous style as if they were men of high and mighty lineage which no doubt they were as it was well known then that many of the most intelligent natives of the old regime were in favour of the treaty although the matter of their former circumstances and connections forbade them taking any open part in its furtherance we are graciously received by all the assembled company and as soon as the captain is made aware of the circumstance that our two japs on board the eamont can land at the main landing without let or hindrance i am dispatched to bring them on shore and see to their safe conduct as far as careeros carrying a note written in japanese characters for the edification of our two japs i return with our men to the boat and proceed on board the eamont the two japs are radiant with smiles when they have digested the contents of the note and it does not take them very long to decorate and array their persons in raiment suitable for the occasion while i am waiting the decorating of the two japs mr jewel calls my attention to a vessel apparently a large steamer that is entering the harbour from the sea nearer and nearer approaches this steamer and before i leave the eamont for the shore we are able to make out the incoming vessel to be a paddle-wheeled steamer bark rigged and flying the united states ensign knowing we have some important dispatches for the united states commodore which are in the dispatch box taken to careeros this morning i make no delay in proceeding to the shore as soon as i have got my two japanese seated in the boat my two japs are severely scrutinized as we pass the guards at the landing but they march boldly past taking little heed of their countrymen or their antagonistic looks arriving at careero's mansion the two japanese receive a perfect ovation from their assembled countrymen and i can see the accolade being performed in such like manner as obtains with our continental brethren when meeting after long absence or after the performance of some more than ordinary heroic action the first salutation having subsided i am enabled to report to the captain the arrival at the harbour of the american war-vessel 
the captain acquaints careero who brings forth a long blue envelope with the large seal of the united states in wax which contains the final instructions to the commodore as well as the completed treaty of commerce and i am thereupon requested to proceed on board the sloop of war and deliver into the hands of the senior commanding officer these most important documents again i take my way to the landing followed by my four men and in the shortest of time possible i am received on board the united states sloop of war mississippi and deliver up to her commanding officer the important paper i have been entrusted to deliver into his hands when he has taken possession of the document he turns to one of his officers and says take care of this officer lieutenant grace till i read these dispatches lieutenant grace salutes his commander and replies in the usual nasal style which though not at all ungracious is still a peculiarity that has not been copied by any other of the anglo-saxon races will you kindly accompany me to the wardroom mr anderson says lieutenant grace after we have introduced ourselves to each other with pleasure i reply as i follow him below when we reach the wardroom i am introduced to all the officers present and after pledging them in a glass of wine that is old enough to have been the property of some more ancient nation i am requested to relate what i have learned about the japanese during our intercourse with them like our captain and mr jewel they scarcely credit my relation of the first visit nealance and i made to the city and although they receive it as true for the sake of politeness i can see that they think i am having a joke with them well gentlemen i say at the end of my narration you will soon see for yourselves for the dispatches i have brought on board are to sanction the opening of this portion of the country smart-looking craft that schooner of yours says one of the officers yes she is smart i reply slowly and i have no doubt we could sail round you when at your fullest speed say now officer says one of the other officers how many knots can you knock out of her fifteen and sixteen i reply if we have wind enough may i ask i say how much you steam at your best seven or eight replies one of them but we can sail faster under canvas with the wheels off i am taken round the main deck by lieutenant grace and shown all her fighting equipment as well as into the engine room and by the time i have had a good look through the u s sloop of war mississippi the commodore has finished the reading of his dispatches and with many thanks for my attention in waiting for his convenience i am commissioned to carry a letter back to careero's mansion the rest of the day is spent by nealance and me in attendance on our commander we are not invited to the consultations that are being held but our captain gives us what little information he is able to make out through careero or ashing careero ashing and several of the japanese make a visit on board u s sloop of war mississippi during the afternoon and hold a lengthy consultation with her commander the consequence of which is that early in the following day a large company of the american officers headed by their commander with a numerous body of their men amongst whom a brass band is very conspicuous take their way to the shore and as the band strikes up hail columbia the stars and stripes are hoisted up on a pole attached to a building placed at the disposal of the americans the same day at careero's we display the british ensign and for lack of music wherewith to salute the flag we fall back on the time-honoured three times three and one over and then moisten our parched throats by drinking to the success of the japanese nation which has this day opened its territory to a free communion with the civilized world we remain a week longer in nagasaki and share in all the festivities of that auspicious occasion we see much that astonishes us when we get nearer the people and on the whole we come to the conclusion that the share we have had in throwing this nation open to trade and commerce should take a little of the stigma from off the doings of the opium clippers end of section twelve End of Among Typhoons and Pirate Craft by Lindsay Anderson.